construction and infrastructure sector india and international perspective is being organized jointly by cii and proltimus consulting part 1 of this webinar had been conducted last week on 7th august while part 2 is being conducted today on behalf of cii and proltimus i would like to request mr gautam malik a senior industry expert with more than 30 year of experience in infrastructure sector and presently member of cii infrastructure subcommittee to give a welcome note to all over to you mr malik uh thank you very much uh, adar a very good morning to all of you and i'm delighted uh, to welcome you all to this very interesting subject in today's uh, scenario that is uh, claims and disputes and arbitration the construction and infrastructure sector with the indian and international perspective on behalf of cii and on my personal behalf i welcome you all to this informative webinar we have an extremely honest erudite and experienced panel of speakers to deliberate on this subject i take this opportunity to welcome shri nagendra nath sinha ias secretary ministry of rural development government of india i welcome honorable justice vibhu bhakru honorable judge of the high court at delhi i welcome honorable justice r banumati former judge of the supreme court of india and i will also welcome mr amarjit singh chandyo former additional solicitor general of india before starting the session i would like to share some thoughts that i had covid 19 as you all know has had a significant in some cases disastrous impact on virtually all aspects of business globally the construction industry is no exception with the number of countries declaring a state of emergency to fight the pandemic closing their borders and imposing travel restrictions on site construction activities had practically practically come to a standstill from shortages of materials due to disruption in the supply chain labor shortages workforce shortages prohibition on gathering of people construction is a labor intensive industry so practically the construction activities had come to a complete standstill the restrictions had a significant impact on all parties involved and obviously this led to severe financial consequences the legal remedies available to the parties to a construction contract to protect their rights and mitigate their losses in these unusual circumstances depend not only on the terms of their respective contracts but also on the governing law in question covid construction disputes and claims are time consuming and often and very often very costly hence fast tracking of disputes is very essential for ensuring the ease of business for the construction sector and the infrastructure sector obviously in this webinar today specialists specialists experts industry veterans across the globe will take stock of the situation and suggest measures to a more constructive 2021 will the intentions of working collaboratively in these difficult times survive the turn of the year or will the new normal go back to the old normal with claims escalating rapidly into full fledged disputes the webinar will deal with common causes of claims covid-19 related and others and take a closer look at how such claims and governed under the major international construction contract the different possibilities to avoid claims from evolving into disputes will also be explored with a focus on current specific challenges that the industry faces dispute resolution evidently remains a major topic as not only all disputes can be avoided proceedings are becoming increasingly virtual which also has its pros and cons because there is no physical contact 
The speakers today will not only discuss new evolutions and methods in litigation and arbitration, but will also elaborate on the recent trends on arbitration and litigation and how these can be resolved faster and in a better manner. This webinar today will cover what the new trends are in construction claims and disputes, as well as offer advice to industry professionals about how they can minimize problems resulting from these trends. I'm sure these deliberations will suggest many solutions, ways forward for the sector, the sector which contributes to over 5% of the Indian GDP, which employs more than 50 million people, is a great consumer of equipment, is a great capital formation sector, and will continue to be a major driver to enable India to thrive at 75. I wish you all a great day ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Malik. Thanks, I think I will. Thanks, Mr. Malik. Invite our okay. first and guest of honor, chief guest, Mr. Amarjit Singh Chandyo, former additional solicitor general of India, to put forward his views. Um, Mr. 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 Malik, uh, yeah. Uh, over to you, Chandyo, sir. Thank you so much, Mr. Malik. Welcome, everybody. And an opportunity for me to be amongst you. The International Webinar on Claims and Disputes, Arbitration, and Construction and Infrastructure is the second phase that we are in today. We have uh, deliberations on 7th, which were far reaching. It brought to the industry and the participants various new outlooks that we have to look at. And a major portion of that was whether we should look at finding solutions other than running into arbitration or litigation. And that was a step forward to collaborate with each other to see how we can minimize our conflicts and move forward and move the country forward, as Mr. Malik Aitid said, that we are the drivers, actually speaking, in the Indian economy. I have the pleasure to welcome my Lord Justice Vivu Bakru, the guest of honor. I had the privilege to walk into the corridors of the court with his lordship. Had the opportunity to be thrown down out of the court by his arguments. And then in 2011 came the golden day when we saw his lordship being elevated as a judge of the Honorable Delhi High Court. And I am proud to say that one of the foremost commercial judges that we have today, a person who would not mince anything, would tell the counsel right on his face as to what is the real problem and how that he can resolve it. Opportunities are given by his lordships to see if we can go out and talk to each other, resolve it, because that is the best way to come back to the court and say we have resolved. However, from 2011, the volumes of the judgments pronounced by his lordship would show, right from taxation till the Companies Act, where we saw directors being disqualified. And in every arbitration matter that we see every day before his lordship, I can only say with proud sense of privilege and pride that he is the star of the judicial system today. May he continue his endeavor to unfold the law and pronounce judgments, give justice, which is the requirement of the Constitution. Over to you, my Lord Justice Vivekananda. Thank you, Mr. Malik. Uh, thank you, Mr. Malik. Uh, yeah, uh, Lord, you have muted. Could you unmute yourself, my lord? Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, Mr. Chandyot, thank you for your kind words. 
I'm not sure that one deserves it, but uh, coming from you, I will accept whatever it, whatever flows in any event as I've done in the past. Uh, we, we have, uh, I esteemed uh, Sister Justice Banu Mati, the Chief Guest, Mr. Nagendra Sena, Mr. Chandyok, as we've just heard, is uh, and what 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 is a little lesser known of him is that he is an ace mediator, and he uh, he's he's been on the forefront of mediation in the Delhi High Court for a very long time, apart from being a former law officer in this country. Uh, yeah, the problem that uh, we all we all seek to want to debate today is about. Uh, claims and disputes in construction and infrastructure sector. And I'm glad that uh, a very focused topics have been chosen because if you don't if you don't focus on particular topics, the discussions hardly remain remain very wide and one doesn't go back with any definite opinions after some discussions. So I'm quite glad that party that the organizers have decided to have a very focused approach. No. And that uh, construction industry, as Mr. Malik just pointed out, is, is one of the major drivers. I uh, mentioned 5% of India's GDP. I, a cursory research that I did on the net may be incorrect, but indicates at least 8.4% of the GDP is, is contributed by the con construction industry in, this, in India. It employs over 40 million person so the spin off of this industry is huge it's it it uh, this, this is this is direct employment 40 million people if you look at the indirect employment that you generate it, it would be much larger however despite this being one of the major industries if you look look over past couple of decades you'll find that it has not received the attention that it normally that it would deserve in an industry which contributes that much to the GDP perhaps would require a, a more focused approach. But this industry has been plagued because it's largely disorganized and has little or few controls. And even those regulatory controls are in most parts of this country wanting. Resultantly, what has happened is that the, the structures that are necessary to address dispute resolution pertaining to construction industry have remained wanting. We haven't, we haven't been able to develop the necessary structures. And when I, when I say structures, it doesn't mean uh, structures in physical form, but structures to practices. Uh, some of the practices that are adopted for dispute resolution have been more ad hoc, more haphazard. It's, it's, it's not being focused as one would expect uh, with an industry of this size. And I think uh, the problem really lies on because the disputes relating to construction are complex. They involve a very high degree of specialization and expertise. And uh, till some years ago, there was hardly any body of precedent law which would address the disputes that were that were being often raised. Now, add to this the fact that. Uh, so the recourse to courts in such complex cases is excruciatingly painful. And even if one sees the end of litigation in courts, uh, pertaining to any particular litigation in courts, then you would find that it doesn't present any, any, any joy because the passage of time eventually makes every litigant the loser. And all victories which, which, which one may Yet in litigation over after after 10 or 15 years are only peric victories because on the net analysis, anybody who has laid a claim and succeeds hasn't really won. And I think this, uh, and here, here lies the genesis why arbitration has been always, always been the preferred choice for a dispute resolution in construction industry. But like I mentioned, the Practices, if you if you examine closely, have hardly developed in this field. Things really began to change sometimes in 1991 when India opened its economy and the policy changed. Thereafter, there have been significant strides uh, in presenting arbitration as an effective resolution mechanism in all commercial matters. 
and construction industry has been one of the major beneficiaries of this development as well. Uh, one of the developments that has happened in certain sectors of construction industry and infrastructure is a very wide acceptance of, a, of the what, what we call a PPP model, public-private partnership. The BOT model, which is the build, operate, and transport model, in various variations, there are various variations to this model, but that's now become perhaps the most accepted uh, model, at least in certain part of infrastructure industry, such as roads. I think that's, that's, that model is being followed uh, very consistently. And I think this is, uh, the, the reason for that is that we require to, to attract investment, garner investment, channelize investment, and do it very fast. And this model has uh, worked to some extent. But with these BOT models, what we saw was another dimension got added into the disputes. And because now, on one hand, it was the pure, simple construction disputes that, you, that we would see earlier. Now you have an investment arm to it as well. And I think you'll find the number of litigations, the number of disputes that are pending in courts and before arbitral, various arbitral tribunals uh, pertaining to BOT models is, is quite large. What I, but today, what I really want to speak about is, uh, is, is, is what are the focus areas that, that I think one should keep in mind going forward. As I mentioned, construction disputes are very complex, but they present their own set of unique issues. So it's, you won't, you'll find that the issues remain somewhat uh, common in different forms, but they're not, uh, they're not as wide, uh, as varied as one would imagine. But despite that, we find that the body of the president to address the same is being, is, is, is a little shallow. And I think this is where the first focus must be. We have to develop, and we must develop a practice in arbitration, in construction, in, uh, in dispute resolution, for construction and infrastructure industry, uh, with 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 certain resolve to in, to ensure that there are there are certain standards. It shouldn't be in what we see today is a very ad hoc reactions that come from various and depends on the arbitral tribunal because there are no standards and as we know arbitral awards are confidential. So so there is a little gap there. What 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 we've seen is that the that the parties take the first step to address prevent any disputes and that's to resolve it by a very detailed contract and uh, that on one hand presents a solution but also presents a problem because the more detailed a contract gets the issues become even more complex one of the ways that parties have gone forward is to adopt templates federation of uh, International engineers or FIDIC is, is one of now common templates that we, uh, we adopt in India. But that too has its problems because when you adopt a temp template, then, it then you have to show that you have to ensure that it necessarily fits into the contract uh, or you have to modify it very uh, intelligent uh, with, with certain amount of intelligence because if you don't do it, that creates its own issues as well. So I think to, to develop uh, more specific contracts as in respect of a particular industry and create our own templates, uh, which, are, which are more, which address the issues that, uh, or address the kind of contracts that uh, at least the government sector would want to enter into would probably be, a, uh, be an area of focus going forward. The second is, I, I think, uh, is the standards of evidence. Because uh, we have, over the years, not concentrated enough to present a standard for evidence. You'll find in some cases of dispute resolution, a very uh, rudimentary sense of, uh, uh, you know, rudimentary facts are taken as evidence. While you find other 
arbitral tribunals which are actually running the whole dispute as a trial. Evidence Act, as we all know in India, doesn't apply to arbitrations, and therefore it gives the arbitral tribunal a very wide berth to see what kind of evidence they would accept. But that's not a very satisfactory position because unless we have a standard of evidence that is acceptable, we will always have uh, ad hoc results. Ad hoc results don't give any party any certainty. It only spawns speculative litigation. And in a system that is already overburdened, this must be avoided at any cost. And I think here the practices must pick up. Uh, it's, it's, it, uh, it would be essential that uh, the professionals who are practicing set down the levels of evidence or standards of evidence uh, that should be required. We hardly take in our country expert evidence. We must learn to now rely on expert evidence. And experts must be put to their standards, not really you know, just simply give evidence on, on one party or the other without, uh, merely because they're engaged by that party. But those standards are, are, are unnecessary. Third is, of course, the body of law is to quantify damages because mostly almost all claims which stem from the construction industry and uh, infrastructure in, in, in contracts in our country are for damages. Now here too, we find that the standards of damages are, are more like a chancellor's foot. You don't know what's, what, what standards really may be enforced. That, uh, there are no really real standards that one can enforce. So I think we need to uh, develop certain amount body of law on what standard of damages must be applied. I mean, I one thing that comes to my mind is uh, and we see a number of um, uh, arbitral awards. All of you must have noticed it as well. When it comes to uh, something like loss of profits for work that is not done or work that has been descoped or removed from a contract, you'll find that one of the case laws that is uh, an earlier decision, which is almost four decades old of the Supreme Court in A.T. Bridgepoll decided to say that you can estimate damages and you'll find large number of arbitral tribunals take the 10% figure that is mentioned in this judgment is almost sacrosanct and uh, what damages. But contracts vary in their form. Uh, contracts vary in the kind of profits they yield. What was a building construction contract may not, what is good for that may not apply for a road contract. Certainly will not apply for a contract where concession is granted for 30 years or 40 years. So we do that. We, we go back four decades and, and take take what, what, what is a very simplistic approach that was adopted in one case in the Supreme Court as almost uh, give it a stature of uh, law that is binding for, for everything. That's not correct. And that's, not sat that's certainly not satisfactory. And the reason I think uh, we do that is because we haven't developed any standards, effective standards to measure damages. And uh, some of the some of the arbitral, some of the dispute resolution areas uh, or adventures, the parties don't want to take that laborious uh, step to garner the evidence and then present it as a as a measure of damages, I think this is this is going to be a focus area because if we have if we have very varied uh, sense of damages that can be awarded, then again the same problem happens. Litigation becomes speculative. Parties that embark on it are not sure of where they're going to lead. Uh, and if 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 we can if you're able to define a set of uh, a measure of damages that can be applied and create a body of uh, precedent for it, then I think we'll be better off. And because I said arbitral awards are not are confidential and they are not published and they're not uh, in that sense, they, they, they have little precedent value. The onus will be on the professionals who practice it. And I think that's that's the area that they, they, they need to that we need to work on. 
and uh, i have no doubt that going forward uh, we will we will find the arbitration as as a dispute resolution mechanism in construction industry will become more definite more predictable uh, the disputes that that will uh, the, the matters that will ultimately escalate to disputes before arbitration would be would become fewer because once we do that then we, we open the ways for resolving it uh, before them before claims escalate to a full-fledged dispute COVID, as Mr. Alec pointed out, is going to present another issues. Force measure is now going to be a, a very hotly debated topic. Here again, I think we have to quickly come up with uh, some sense of uh, of the kind of damages that can be presented on force measure, the kind of relief that can be given on force measure, and uh, if, if the industry and the can work it out between themselves. As to what that standard should be, and, and then I think we we would we would get over this problem fairly quickly. I don't really want to, I think, uh, hold back the seminar any further. And I, I leave it to the leave it to the next speaker to take it forward. But I'm sure that all of you are going to have a very enjoyable. Session after pre noon session. That's planned. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Manod. Thank you for your suggestions and guidance that we must have standards now with respect to not only just pick up templates from international world and just put it on, it may not fit into it. We need to bring standards for evidence. Force measure, which is especially post pandemic a situation where we need to look at. We need to see how we draw. And I think, in fact, what Lordship has actually given us a hint was that we must draw our documents properly, not just pick up templates and just put them in. We must see whether it's a construction contract related to a building or a project in reference to a road or etc. Thank you so much, my Lord, for your inputs. I'm sure. CII with Pro Ultimus would probably look at it, form a committee to see how we can go forward to have best practices, standards, which will help the industry to move forward in this direction. Let me take this opportunity to introduce another guest we have with us, Mr. Naginder Nath Sinha. And may I request Mr. Malik to introduce him, or would you like me to go ahead? Uh, sir, uh, on behalf of Mr. Malik is, I think, uh, requested us to, on behalf of CI, I'm going ahead. to introduce him. Please go ahead. Okay. Yeah. So, I welcome to Mr. Nagendra Nath Sinha. Sri Nagendra Nath Sinha, IAS, Jharkhand, Cadre, 1987 batch, uh, took charge as Secretary, Ministry of Rural Development, Government of India, New Delhi, on May 27, 2020. Sri Sinha holds bachelor degree in electric, uh, Electrical Engineering from IIT Kanpur, 1985 batch. He also did a master in health science from Johns Hopkins University, USA. He has held sensitive assignment both at the uh, central government and the state government, Jharkhand and Bihar. His previous assignments include Secretary, Border Management, Ministry of Home Affairs, Chairman, and National Highway Authority of India, Managing Director, National Highway uh, and Infrastructure Development Corporation Limited, New Delhi. Additional Chief Secretary, Rural Development, Government of Jharkhand, besides Secretary, Principal Secretary in Department of IT, Road, Construction, Industry, Mines, among others. He has to credit several landmark projects in Jharkhand, including Mega Sports Complex and Games Village at Rachi, Rachi Ring Road, State Data Center. He has also been instrumental in development of several policies and documents, uh, example, PWD Code 2012, Public-Private Partnership Policy, ETC, and uh, in Federal March Road, Jolia and Sila Karya Tunnels, Delhi Mumbai Expressway at the center. As Secretary, Rural Development, he is responsible for formulating, coordinating, and implementing programs that addresses the development need of the rural areas, focusing especially on mitigating and eradicating the poverty and creating sustainable employment and livelihood opportunities. His program really heavily on use of technology for furthering sustainable development. 
His major interest in the domains of sustainable development, use of ICT, infrastructure, health, and institution buildings. May I request uh, uh, Sri Nagendra Nasina to give his uh, thoughts? Over to you, Sri Sina. Others, morning, uh, very eminent panel. Privilege to be invited to speak. I'm not sure I'm audible. Others can give me feedback if I am audible or I should I raise my voice? Sir, sir your can be a little loud. Uh, voice uh, is little low, slightly low. Uh, so, so it's a privilege for me to be allowed and invited to speak in this August gathering where judges uh, of the Honorable Supreme Court, High Court are present. They are. <laughs> Presenting their thoughts and uh, had the privilege of hearing Justice Matro on uh, how the conduct of arbitral proceedings could be improved and how more certainty could be brought the way these are conducted. Oh, I, I, I have brief association with the National Highway Authority of India. I had been there for over six months, and uh, during that brief period, since NHI has a large body of arbitral awards, so I will draw upon that experience to uh, give very, uh, very few uh, thoughts uh, which come to my mind. I tried to look at uh, what is the proportion of the uh, claim, uh, between the claim and the arbitral award that takes place. And I also did analysis between uh, 2000 to 2015 period and 2015 onwards when the amendment to arbitral uh, arbitration and conciliation act took place. I find that during the, both the periods, the ratio between the claim and the award is about 32%. So 32% of the amount which is claimed is awarded. Then I also uh, try to make a comparison between what happens when uh, parties resolve it amicably. So there are two instances uh, where uh, uh, this kind of a exercise was taken on a large scale under NHI. Uh, one is what is called the Independent Settlement Advisory Committee. And this body came in place December 2012. And uh, under its as is about 111 uh, such disposals took place, in which the claim amount was 18,743 crore. Out the settlement stood at 1,713 crore, uh, which stood at 9% of the claimed amount. Another uh, uh, place where uh, this kind of a conclusion could be arrived at comes from the forum which NHI again established, which is called uh, Conciliation Committee of Independent Experts, CCIE. And three such panels were constituted. And this panel uh, is handling, handled, handling about 194 cases, out of which 188 cases have been successful, I mean, uh, in which the conciliation has become successful. And in these cases, uh, 20,926 crore was the claim, and the amount uh, which the claims were settled at stood at 2,320 crore, which is at about 11%. So my conclusion on the basis of uh, these two uh, pieces of evidence, which I brought to you, tells me that uh, the independent, the uh, true amount should be somewhere between 10 to 15 percent, should not go more than that. And there is another piece of piece uh, which I wish to bring to uh, the notice uh, before this August gathering. Uh, there was a piece uh, in October 11, uh, 2019, the Times of India, in which they brought it, uh, brought the instance of Madhukon, 
so madhukan has the total project cost was 629 crores while the claim was 8199 so it was 13x 13 times the total project cost i mean one can very well understand uh, how can it be so much then there was another uh, uh, book called soma isolax okay. there also 7336 crore was the it is uh, the claim while the tpc was 2747 so 2.5x that article also gave data which is again quite striking the amount of claim arising in those uh, was almost close to the amount of works uh, Taken up by the NHI, so 1.2 lakh crore was the works which was were not concluded, while the claim was 1.07. And uh, the respondent had spoken to several of the contractors uh, who admitted that they inflate their claims so that uh, the arbitral claims also does it proportionate. So I mean. I, I have a feeling, uh, and this feeling is widely shared in many, many parts of the agencies uh, which deal with such businesses. Is that uh, like Bihar? In many parts of Bihar, which get suburbs like Saharsa and Madhepura, uh, North Bihar, people have a crop called relief crop where. Uh, In addition to the crops of uh, the Harif and Rabi, you have the relief. So similarly, uh, there is a feeling that uh, the litigation and arbitration and conciliation have become another uh, source of, rather than compensating for the just losses and damages which have. Been. I think uh, arbitrators and arbitration processes and conciliation processes. A huge responsibility in uh, kind of uh, setting a, a system, setting a stage where the there could be trust in the processes, then uh, distrust of the processes and uh, kind of uh, not being very comfortable with the way these have been conducted and some of the issues. Justice Parkhu pointed out that there are issues of standard, uh, issues of standards of evidence, issues of way the, these claims would be constructed. I think uh, we should now call upon uh, the bodies which kind of bring lot of arbitrations, Indian uh, Council for Arbitration or International Council for Alternate Dispute Resolution or Sarod or CIAI or many other bodies. So that these gaps in the way these uh, proceedings are conducted are kind of settled. Otherwise, this miasma of distrust would continue to prevail, and uh, it's not very helpful uh, for the either for the industry or for the government or public bodies or uh, any such things uh, which conduct it, which are engaged with the arbitration business to be. Associated with, uh, and uh, I, I think uh, one of the reasons why Indian arbitration looks good in country, it's not being accepted worldwide as much as Singapore arbitration or London arbitration or other arbitrations have gathered degree of acceptability. Is why we have not been able to all those practices and those standards uh, as much as we. And uh, we have not been able to generate as much social capital towards the arbitration process as we ought ought to have. I think uh, this 75th year of Indian independence, Adi Kamrit Bhawsa, as a body and as a society, uh, we ought to kind of commit ourselves to make sure that such gaps in the law and such gaps in the conduct of Things are filled up, and arbitration is uh, on a higher pedestal where people see it as it as more of a moral calling. 
place where justice is to be delivered, commercial profits be so. So, in addition to that, uh, code of ethics is also very important that I, I think we ought to work uh, on that as well because the way the arbitration and conciliation act is now framed, uh, there, there is hardly any recourse to litigation. So, at the first stage, the justice does not prevail, then to that extent, uh, justice is done. I think uh, we also need to uh, work on uh, the issue of the vulnerability of the officers, offices, officers of the public sector, and particularly including the NHI and others are uh, in esteem. So you have the Vigilance, uh, these uh, CBI, CBC, all of that. So most of the people uh, kind of pay the resolution of disputes, uh, leave it to the arbitration. In the process, not only the project sector suffer and the nation as a whole. Suffer. So I think uh, we also need. Uh, these bodies as well, so that uh, people who are deciding in a just manner in the interest of the projects not suffer, uh, not are not put necessary. Yes. I must mention to you that this is that the National Highway Authority of India has now brought uh, within its processes so that more scope for. Uh, CDSM uh, for the stage reaches for the arbitration. So they have made the conciliation and mediation through the independent expert, party engineer, and after dispute resolution board is mandatory. Conciliation committee of independent expert is mandatory. And only if these stages fail, then the this could be had in arbitration. So I, this kind of a design of a dispute resolution is now much more helpful. On the resolution of disputes. So I thank uh, the CIA and Pro Articus for inviting me and giving me an opportunity to speak in this gathering. Thank you very much. May I request, uh, thank you, sir. Uh, may I request Gautam Malik to just conclude his uh, thoughts uh, and then over to the Chand Chandyok, sir, so that he can uh, introduce uh, Honorable Justice Bhanumati also. So, Gautam Malik, uh, uh, sir, are you there? Yeah. You can conclude his thoughts. Yes, sir. Yeah, uh, conclude in the sense that it, it is uh, uh, very interesting to share their uh, uh, ideas and suggestions. Uh, Mr. Tandyok uh, rightfully mentioned, uh, just to paraphrase him, that there should be an opportunity for parties to discuss and come back to the court that their issues have been resolved. Uh, Justice uh, Bakru was uh, very, very insightful and uh, rightfully mentioned that uh, recourse to courts can be a very painful matter and uh, that uh, uh, now uh, professionals would have to play a major role in resolving uh, disputes in the construction sector and also that uh, we should not rely on standard templates as, as the past and a more elaborate system would have to be uh, developed. Uh, uh, Sri Nagindra Nath Sinha, IS, uh, shared his experience, uh, tremendous experience in this sector and how he has uh, resolved uh, many, many issues, uh, you know, enormous uh, amounts, and uh, uh, suggested that uh, gaps need to be filled up in the arbitration process, and the code of ethics also has to be strengthened for uh, arbitration to be more effective. Uh, uh, Mr. you can now take over and introduce uh, Justice Banumati. 
Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Malik. I just wanted to add to what was said. I think the Honorable Secretary was pleased to tell the that we need to fill in those gaps in the arbitration. I think the arbitral tribunals, especially our honorable judges, who have been who are appointed as arbitrators, they have done a tremendous job. We have done a tremendous job even in court where arbitration awards have been challenged, and there is an expeditious disposal of the same giving priority, including the Supreme Court. And the yes, the there are problems in every issue. Many of us feel that uh, court is last resort, but we should be happy that at least the rule of law prevails in this country and we have to fall back on the court in case we are not able to resolve. But the experience tells us that where we have sent parties for negotiation or mediation, even if they have resolved three points between themselves, the remaining three became almost nil when it came to arguments in court. So, the, you know, the, those three have been resolved, those ancillary issues or something automatically was easier for the honorable judge to prevail upon the parties and ultimately enter into a judicial settlement. Thank you so much, Mr. Malik, for your concluding things. I have the honor to introduce to you honorable Ms. Justice R. Banwati, a long journey from an additional district judge to the honorable Supreme Court. I don't know, this Vanamati does not know I happen to be her neighbor in Defense Colony. And I have more access now. I have a Chief Justice of India on one side, and this is Vanamati on the other, and two, three judges on the other side. So I have always the influence of the honorable judges on what I do and what I don't do. <laughs> the honorable judge has experience of 30 years at her command from commercial to constitutional measures, and then has an in-depth knowledge and understanding of legal ecosystems under the Indian and the consumer law. She has revised the classical textbook of shorter constitution of India. And what is more interesting that she authored a book called Judiciary, Judges, and the Administration of Justice. How you link the interlink between the three of them and she shares a chapter in the said book of e-management, which is a bone of contention in many parts of the country. Some lawyers are agitating, some people feel that these e-courts must be stopped, we must go back to physical. But how these e-courts have benefited, the cause of justice, as she has looked at into it, her book title, Court Administration and Use of Computers, is another fascinating book which one must have. I think all the yardsticks laid down by her lordship in those chapters would help the industry to look at how do we formulate new systems, how do we face the new pandemics, new way of life, and move ahead with the justice system. I am sure with the experience that CII has, along with the collaborators that we have today with respect to Pro Ultimus and others, and Mr. Adash there to help us out. You'll form a committee to see that we can make standards with respect to everything, see how ecosystems can work better. And I would request her lordship to give us her inaugural address. Thank you, my lord. Over to you. Thank you, Senior Counsel Mr. Amarjit, for uh, speaking some nice words about me. And very happy to know that you are my dearly neighbor in the defense colony. This is also this uh, surprisingly I know today only. Very happy to learn about this. Mm -hmm. The members of CAA, Mr. Gautam Malik, the member of CAA, Mr. Adash Kumar, Pro Ultimus, and your team of members, Honorable Brother Justice Vibhu Bhakta, and Sri NN Sinaji, the Secretary, Ministry of Road Development, the senior advocates, the respected speakers, and all those who are connected to the link. I am very happy to be here in this morning. At the outset, I would like to thank CAA and Mr. Adesh Kumar and the Pro Ultimus team for uh, giving me this opportunity to be in your midst on this, uh, on this morning. Honorable Justice Bagru has uh, 
uh, has uh, shared his thoughts on the issues faced by the construction and industry sectors. Sri NN Sinajino has pointed out has to has to pointed out to the wide gaps between the claims made and the awards passed, and he has suggested the measures. I would like to share some of my thoughts on the challenges in the implement enforcement of the arbitration award. That is, after the award is obtained, what is the what are the challenges that are faced in enforcement of the award? which in my view is uh, very important for the construction and infrastructure sector. As uh, pointed out by Mr. Gautam Malik, COVID era 19 has forced all of us to change our lifestyle and it has greatly impacted all the business, especially in the construction and infrastructure. It has greatly impacted the economy of the nation and also the lives of the people. Due to lockdown and the restriction relaxations across the country, mostly the hearings are held in virtual mode. Face to face interaction with the clients and the litigants have become very limited. In this scenario, it is befitting that CAA and uh, Pro Ultimus have coordinated in organizing this webinar on the very relevant topics on the claims and disputes in arbitrations and the construction and infrastructure sector. I have also gone through the topics. The topics chosen are very important and relevant for discussion. See, the awards passed in the arbitration proceedings and the realization of the award plays a very important role in the construction and the infrastructure sector and the economy of the nation. All of us know that there is a direct nexus of the commercial arbitration and realization of the award with the economic growth of the nation. Unless the award holder, the entity, realizes the amount, the award merely becomes a paper. Without money, there is nothing can be made out. Yes, we must be able to realize the award holder must be able to realize the award amount. And only then the entity can discharge its financial commitments to the lenders and also to make investment in its upcoming projects. The studies around the world suggest that judicial efficiency in dealing with commercial matters and the effective enforcement of contract regime has a bearing on the optimal functioning of the economy. The economic survey of 2018-2019 tabled in the parliament by the Honorable Finance Minister highlighted, the highlighted that the contract enforcement remains the single biggest constraint. It, was, it is the single biggest constraint to improve the nation's ease of doing business ranking. However, the survey reports points out that the problem is not insurmountable. At this juncture, I also wish to strike a positive note. Thanks, uh, thanks for uh, Senior Counsel Amadit for mentioning about the book uh, Judiciary and the Court Administration, where I have laid a special emphasis in two chapters. I have made a special emphasis upon the eCourts project. The Court Administration and the Government of India and the various state governments have taken a lot of initiatives through legislative enactments, integration of the smart technology in court processes by implementation of the e-courts mission mode project, constitution of the commercial courts, fast track courts, etc. In recent years, the implementation of the e-courts project, constitution of the commercial courts, and the rules rules and the guidelines governing these commercial courts for time-bound disposal of cases, in particular the arbitration matters, have brought in sweeping changes in the functioning of the courts. The implementation of the e-courts project and the availability of all the information in the national judicial data grid on the click of a mouse has made the system more transparent and efficient. I would like to impress upon 
the construction and the industrial sectors and all those who are connected that we need to use all the available resources and sweeping changes, especially the integration of the smart technology to make the dispute resolution process in commercial matters are made quicker, uh, quicker and effective and the enforcement of contracts and awards are made easier. It is a matter of common experience that in civil courts, after getting the decree, the execution of the decree and realization of the decree amount becomes more difficult than that of obtaining the decree itself. This happens in the civil courts, all of us know. But according to me, this applies in our courts to the arbitration awards also. Because when the arbitration awards are sought to be executed, there are so many objections, unsustainable objections are raised in enforcement of the in enforcement of the award. It takes a lot of time for the award holder, award holder to just realize, realize or execute the arbitration award by 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 meeting these abstract objections raised by the other side. I would like to say that the recent judgments of the Supreme Court are very encouraging. Recently, the Supreme Court held that the emergency arbitrator's award passed if provided for under the institutional rules would be covered by the Arbitration Act. In Amazon versus future retail case, the Supreme Court held that the order of an emergency arbitrator of Singapore is enforceable in India under Section 72 of the Arbitration Act. I would also like to mention about the amendments 2015 and the relevant cases and 2021 amendment also. Prior to 2015 amendment, once a petition for setting aside of arbitration award under Section 34 is filed, the arbitral award is almost automatically stayed. But after 2015 amendment, there is a major shift. That is, after 2015 amendment, there was no deemed or automatic stay of the operation of the award and the mere filing of a petition under Section 34. The court has to specifically grant an order of stay of the operation of the award. There was no deemed stay. In BCCA case, the Supreme Court held that the provisions of 2015 amendment would apply prospectively. After BCCI case, by way of 2019 amendment, section 87 was inserted into the Arbitration Act, which had the effect of nullifying the judgment of the Supreme Court in BCCI case. However, in Hindustan construction case, 2019 SEC online, 1520, Section 87 was held to be unconstitutional by the Supreme Court and it was uh, struck down. Thus, the position of the law laid down by the Supreme Court in BCCA case was restored by the Supreme Court. A special mention about the 2021 amendment. After 2021 amendment, in case where a prima facie case of fraud or corruption is made out with regard to the arbitration agreement, which forms the basis of the arbitral award, the court has the power to stay the award unconditionally during the pendency of Section 34 petition. The recent 2021 amendment has also repealed Schedule 8 of the Act. The 8th eight schedule prescribes a minimum requirement of the persons with an educational qualification of degree level with the 10 years of experience in scientific or technical streams. Uh, the effect of age schedule is said to be seen. I have not seen uh, this uh, age schedule. Um, this uh, amendment to age schedule has been made, uh, made a topic of discussion. I wish that in the future uh, that the pro ultimus will think about this 
and uh, what will be the effect of this amendment to H schedule? No, this need to be elaborated and discussed upon by by all concerned. Arbitral award is enforced as a decree of the civil court. Here again, the award holder faces a lot of difficulties in collecting the details regarding the movable property and the immovable properties. The award holder has to furnish the details of the assets of the immovable property or movable property or intangible properties of the award data. Attachment can be sought against the intangible properties like shares and immovables, so shares and movables. In this regard, I wish to refer to the relevant judgment in uh, chair and properties 2018 16 SSA 413. Here again, I wish to point out that it becomes uh, difficult for the award holder to collect the assets, asset details of the assets of the judgment data, which is you now scattered across the country and especially the shares, etc. It becomes too difficult for the award holder. So all these things need to be discussed and elaborated upon. In my view, the courts are to play a proactive role in ensuring that the awards award is enforced. I wish and hope that the enforcement of the award becomes more effective especially in construction and infrastructure sector, thereby giving impetus to the PPP models and ultimately to the economic growth and the development of the nation. I wish and hope that the discussions and deliberations scheduled for today would lead to constructive suggestions, in particular in admissibility of the moral evidence and also the documentary evidence. There are a lot of difficulties faced in admissibility of the of the documentary evidence in particular, even after filing of the affidavits of admission and the denial, and over this past one year of experience, we are uh, some standards will have to be there no, for admissibility of uh, this uh, documentary evidence and also the oral evidence. I wish and hope that the deliberations for the today will bring out some constructive suggestions, and some suggestions in this area, and facilitate quicker and effective resolving of the disputes. I once again thank uh, the Pro Artemis and the uh, CAA for giving me this opportunity for sharing some of my thoughts on the challenges and the enforcement of the award. Thank you, one and all. Thank you, my lord, for your voluminous various aspects of the Arbitration Act, and especially the enforceability. I only wanted to add that now we have taken aid of Order 21, Rule 41, and asking people to disclose on affidavit their assets, which has helped. Therefore, court is playing an active role. We had another formal uh, judgment by Delhi, by which said that you need to disclose something more than what was required. That recently has been set aside by the Honorable Division Bench. We hope the matter may travel to the Honorable Supreme Court, and we have something else to fall upon. But even an enforcement with respect to construction contracts, I think even after the award time is that we're in during enforcement, the parties must be brought together to see because the third party, which is the actually the person, unlike the uh, construction of a road where especially a project, residential project, or commercial project is there, which is partly sold, the rights of third parties which are which are involved. Therefore, best would be to see how the enforcement can take place where both all stakeholders can come forward to do that. I think time is not far. I am sure Mr. Malik and Mr. Adarsh Kumar will together form a, or with the help of others form a committee which will look into the standards that we need to look at. And once we form those standards, I'm sure it will help the arbitral tribunals to decide faster and lay down our standards with respect to both how to need evidence, what would be admissible, how it would be admissible, and the standards of experts that we just Baku just mentioned, we need to bring in. Thank you so much, my lord, for your valuable time to inaugurate this session. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chanda. Thank you. Thank uh, you. Thank you. May I request uh, Mr. Malik to uh, just uh, share uh, concluding remarks and vote of thanks. Mr. Malik, over to you. Yeah, thank thank you, Mr. Adarsh. Uh, uh, it's been a wonderful session, a great learning experience uh, for the attendees 
I found it extremely informative and valuable. I have personally. Uh, it's been a great opportunity listening to the legal uh, luminaries and uh, without paying any fee. That's the best part. <laughs> of and and uh, I'm sure that uh, the suggestions put forth by them uh, would be carried forward in the right earnest. And CII uh, should, as suggested by uh, uh, Mr. Chandyok, form a committee to take this uh, forward. I uh, would like to propose a vote of thanks. Uh, thank you, Mr. Uh, Singh Chandyok, for taking time out and being uh, with us uh, this uh, morning. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Justice uh, Bakru of the Delhi uh, High Court. Thank you so much. Uh, for taking time out and uh, uh, giving your insights and uh, valuable suggestions and views <clears throat> and how issues related to conflicts and disputes in, con in the construction sector could be resolved in a better manner. Uh, I take this opportunity to thank uh, uh, Sri Nagendran Atsina, IAS, uh, Ministry of uh, uh, Rural Affairs, for also taking time out and sharing his experience, enormous experience in uh, this sector and his suggestions also. And uh, it's, uh, uh, of course, uh, just Mr. Bhanumati, what, a, what an experience listening to you uh, and, and your uh, suggestions. And, and, you know, what you said was very pertinent that uh, enforceability of arbitration awards has to be made quicker and easier for this to be more fruitful. Thank you very much. I wish everybody a very uh, uh, prosperous Independence Day in advance, and please continue enjoying this session. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ji. Thank you, Adarsh Kumar Ji. Thank you, Senior Thank, you. Thank, Thank, you, sir. Thank, Thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. Thank, 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 Thank you, Sina Ji. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, sir. So I would like to thank you, Honorable Justice Vanumati, Honorable Justice Bakru, Sri Anansina, Mr. Chandyak, Mr. Malik to share their thoughts uh, in this inaugural session. So we will start a technical session after a break of two minutes. And however, we are going to cover the first session itself, a challenge in arbitration award, which uh, Justice Vanumati has uh, just pointed out. And it's all the sessions are very uh, interesting. So just have a break of two minutes. We will start the technical session. Thank you, all of you. <laughs> Adir, how much time do we have yeah. for this session? Uh, Vandana, uh, can you quickly introduce all the panelists? Uh, we are anyway running half an hour uh, uh, behind the schedule, so we don't know how we'll uh, I mean, adjust in the com running sessions, coming sessions. Uh, yeah, over, Vandana, over to you. Can you introduce the panelists? <clears throat> Vanna, you're, you're on mute, I think. Your voice is not audible. Yeah, uh, Adesh, my suggestion was that <clears throat> we've had a discussion okay. amongst the speakers. Uh, I'll okay. just do a very quick uh, two line, three line introduction so that we can save on the time for. Okay. Uh, great, great. Lovely. Great. Uh, I mean, uh, very good suggestions. We can just. Uh, Super. Find it. Okay, yeah. So, shall we start? Yeah, Thanks. yeah. Um, thank you. Uh, for being with us here today, and thank you, CII and Pro Altimus, for inviting us to speak at this very excellent uh, conference. Uh, we are going to discuss, as we know, we are running short in time, and we have a stellar cast, uh, a stellar panel, which actually does not need much of an introduction. But what must be done must be done. Uh, to start with, we of course have Mr. Ganesh Chandru, who is a partner with Dua Associates in Chennai. Uh, Mr. Chandru, of course, spends time in Chennai, but also in Delhi. Uh, he moved to India in 2015, and prior to that, Ganesh spent more than 16 years in Singapore. Uh, he was also a, an alumnus of the Singapore International Arbitration Center's Secretariat. Um, 
he was the counsel and assistant registrar. He also worked with international law firms, Singapore law firms between 2002 and 2007. We also have Kevin Nash. Uh, Kevin is the deputy registrar and center director of the SIAC. Over the course of last decade, Kevin has overseen administration of thousands of international cases. Uh, he is a well-regarded, well-known expert in international arbitration, and he's also the member of the Uncitral Working Group 2 and represents SIAC at the Uncitral Working Group 3. Last and certainly not the least, we have Mr. Samir Jain, who is a founding and managing partner of PSL Advocates and Solicitors. Samir is an expert in international arbitration, and recently his firm was ranked in band one for arbitration and legal 500. Prior to establishing the firm, Samir spent time with Goldman Sachs, Ernst & Young, and Luther & Lutra. Welcome, everyone. Uh, we have approximately 35 minutes, as I understand, Adarsh. It, it will be much more helpful if you can conclude this session in 35 minutes. So we will uh, save some time. Thank we you. Will certainly try and conclude the session in 35 minutes. Sure. Uh, Thank you. So jumping straight up, this session is about enforcement challenges, section 34, section 48. We did hear a little bit about it from Justice Bhanumati, Justice Bakru, but we are going to get into some finer details and, and talk a little bit more in detail. And, and I'm going to invite Ganesh straight away uh, to throw light on <clears throat> Ganesh. There's a lot that's happened in India in the last 10 years, from 1940 to 1996 to 2015, and successive amendments after that. 34 and 48 remain perhaps the, the two cornerstone sections within the Indian arbitration regime. And may I invite you very quickly to tell us as to what the grounds on which an application for setting aside a tribunal of an arbitral award can be filed in India? You're on mute, I believe, Ganesh. Uh, you can hear me now? Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Abhinav, and uh, uh, thanks, Adarsh, for inviting me. In fact, uh, this is a uh, Though many may say who are practitioners here, I know we have just about 30 plus minutes, that uh, this is a topic which is spoken in almost all arbitration seminars. But I guess it's a very important topic, as uh, Honorable Justice Banumati just mentioned. Uh, you know, if uh, how much ever effort you take in your infrastructure, construction, arbitration, you have all these experts come and testify before the tribunal, you have, you know, um, big pleadings made, you know, submissions, detailed ones. At the end of the day, all this effort is for you to get an award and the successful party to be able to enforce the award and realize the proceedings uh, of, uh, you know, the successful award uh, given by the arbitral tribunal. But that said, uh, an arb arbitral award can be challenged on very limited grounds. One mistake which everyone makes, including us lawyers, some of them, we use the term appeal interchangeably with the word set aside. That is something I wanted to bring about first. An uh, application under Section 34 of our Act, which mirrors the ancestral model law on international commercial arbitration, is not an appeal. It is an application that you can make to the court to set aside the award on very limited grounds. And this is exactly what uh, Abhinav uh, asked me just now to point out. They are very straightforward. If once I give you the list, you will appreciate that these are more uh, dealing with procedural requirements that might have perhaps been uh, not carefully gone through by the parties or by the tribunal on which you can make such a challenge. Firstly, if the party was under some incapacity during the arbitral proceeding, that is one of the grounds on which an award can be challenged. Then if the arbitration agreement is not valid, so that is the basis uh, for an arbitration itself, that it's party autonomy, parties agree that their dispute will be resolved by arbitration. So that arbitration agreement concluded by them has to be a valid arbitration agreement. In this context, many of you know about the doctrine of separability. Uh, even if a contract for some reason is found to be invalid, the arbitration clause itself is a separate agreement and it can be still relied upon by the parties for resolving the dispute and the tribunal will have jurisdiction to decide whether the main contract is valid or not. So, but the arbitration agreement per se has to be valid, you know, even if it is separable, it cannot be ambiguous, it cannot have, you know, um, anomalies which will make it unenforceable. So that's what it means. So arbitration agreement has to be valid. Proper notice of appointment of arbitrator was not given to the parties. 
the arbitral proceedings, uh, the notice of that was also not given to the parties or the party was unable to present its case. So these are uh, this is the next set of grounds on which you can challenge an award. The next important thing is the award fell outside the scope of arbitration agreement. This is often parties try and say that you 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 you, you know kind of wanted to refer a particular aspect of the dispute to the tribunal, but in spite of this, the tribunal went on and decided certain other things. If you do that, of course, if the court finds with you saying that, yep, yeah, you know what you say is right, then it can actually distinguish and those parts of the award which are not within the scope can be set aside. So it's not that the whole award needs to be set aside. Very important, the composition of the tribunal and the procedure should be in accordance with the agreement of the parties. If not, this can be a ground for setting aside the award. For example, if you want, if you have said, if you have expressly stated that you want engineers to be the arbitrator and you and you know, ultimately go ahead and appoint, let us say, uh, some other lawyer as an arbitrator instead of an engineer, then that could be a ground as well because you specifically wanted the engineer to decide this case uh, in the arbitration. So um, it's very important for you to, when you draft the clause, to be very careful. And when you appoint an arbitrator or when you go to court under Section 11 for appointment, you should point this out very clearly to the court as well. Um, the other aspect is if the subject matter of the dispute is not capable of settlement by arbitration, this essentially means arbitrability. Uh, for example, in certain jurisdictions, um, IP rights, for example, intellectual property rights. Uh, in fact, I don't know if Mr. Chandyok is still here. I mean, we did a seminar last year on arbitrability itself uh, by a Madhyam, which he chairs as the president. We had a very good session on arbitrability. So if a matter is not arbitrable, the subject matter is not capable of settlement by arbitration under the law of India, then you can uh, file an application to set aside and more. The, this, uh, the next ground that I'm going to say is often used if the award is in conflict with the public policy of India, then again, you can uh, set aside the award. Of course, we are going to have some questions on public policy and I will deal with that later. And I'm sure Samir and others are here who can also throw light on that. And one other aspect, which will also be discussed in detail, I'm just putting it down so that there's one other ground that's very unique to India that under the new section 34.2a, which was amended in 2015, an award made in India can be set aside, a domestic award can be set aside if the court finds that is vitiated by patent illegality, which appears on the face of the award. But that doesn't mean that you can set aside the award merely on the ground of an erroneous application of law or reappreciation of evidence. And this challenge that you make in 34, the court has to dispose of the challenge application. They shall endeavor to dispose it of within a period of one year. We'll come to 36 and the latest ordinance and other amendments during the course of this session. But these are the uh, main grounds which mirrors actually the uh, model law. Abhinav. That was very well done. I mean, I've never had a, seen a summary of Section 34 done so brilliantly and so, you know, uh, in such brevity and, 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 you know, conciseness. Thank you, Ganesh, for that. And, you know, 34 moves on to 48. Samir, uh, there is always a confusion. Actually, to be very honest, you know, it took me some time in my initial years of arbitration law to really understand the difference between 34 and 48. Uh, could you tell us a little bit more? What's the difference between challenging an award and ref and and refusing enforcement of an award? Can an award that is being challenged or set aside, say in India, can it be enforced somewhere else? Or an award that has not been enforced in India, can it be enforced somewhere else? What's the distinction between the two? And, sure. and part one and part two of it. Sure. Thanks, Abhinav. Um, now, very simply put, um, as Ganesh said. You must not confuse 34 with an appeal. Uh, and likewise, you should not confuse your resistance to enforcement in the 48 with 34. So if at one end of the spectrum, there's appeal where you can raise any grounds uh, before the judge to challenge a decision, uh, a much lesser scope from the appeal is your challenge to an arbitral award on the 34. And then 48 provides you with a further restricted grounds to challenge uh, the enforcement of an award and rightfully so. So understand the concept of this so under 48, what you enforce is uh, prop, uh, your foreign awards. And uh, when you, when you are enforcing a foreign award under 48, you must understand that the party 
either has exhausted its remedy to challenge an award at the seat of the arbitration or has chosen not to do that. In both of those cases, the enforcing court in India cannot really go into the grounds of challenge which are available to challenge an award either under the ancestral model or the grounds which are available under your law. And therefore, 48 is a much restricted grounds. Now, what are the grounds in the 48? There are some common grounds uh, between 34 and 48, and most of those common grounds are in relation to the fact when either you are not able to present your case, that is, or the alternate part or natural justice has not been followed, which is a universal ground everywhere to challenge and enforce and challenge in a vote on an appeal, or that the appointment was not mal validly made, or that the tribunal was uh, dealing with a dispute which was beyond the reference or was not capable of arbitration under Indian law. So these are the some primary grounds on which you can resist an enforcement on the merits of the case. I think it's only public policy, uh, which which the uh, section 48 says that if the award is is beyond the public policy of India is in violation of the public policy of India, then you can enforce, uh, then you can resist enforcement. Now, uh, what is public policy of India is, in my view, uh, uh, a topic of a separate debate altogether because the courts and time and again been debating and laying down that public policy of India under 48 would be different and 30, 34 would be because 34 also talks about public policy of India and and uh, there are judgments where they have said that public violation of public policy of India under 48 and violation of public policy of India under 34 have a restrictive scope. So. Um, Without going into a much detail in the case laws uh, on on uh, on public policy and on 48 versus 34, the the basic idea because we have paucity of time is 34 is slightly uh, has a slightly larger scope to challenge an award, while 48 is uh, the most restricted covenant of a party's right to resist an enforcement, and that is the key difference between 34 and 48. Thanks, Amir. Uh, now that we've set a basic background of 34 and 48, Kevin, may I, may I bring you in? You know, uh, all the 34s and the 48s and the equivalents, the parent document from where they draw inspiration is the model law, right? And you are in Singapore and you've been in Singapore for a long time, 11 years, and you've seen the application of the 34s and 48s in the Singapore context. Uh, I think it would be very helpful to understand where all this started from and what does Singapore law, how does Singapore law look at 34 and 48? Sure. Thank, okay. thank, thank you, Abhinav. Thank you to the organizers. It's, it's great to be here. Maybe as a, as, a, as a starting point, let's look at the choice of the seat and the supervision of the curial court. So your application to set aside an award is going to go to the courts at the seat of arbitration. What Singapore has done very well uh, is be decidedly pro-arbitration. There's an unequivocal judicial philosophy of the facilitation and promotion uh, of arbitration. So it's a non-interventionist approach by the Singapore courts. So you can run down the list in Article 34 of the model law. There are these limited avenues uh, where you can potentially go after an award. The Singapore jurisprudence has made clear that this is has to be done in 90 days. But the Singapore legislation for international arbitration also adds, in addition to the grounds listed under Article 34 of the model law, that an award can be set aside if the making of the award was induced or affected by fraud or corruption, or there was a breach of natural justice in connection with the making of the award. So, functionally, when you have a Singapore seated arbitration, these are going to be restrictive grounds and they're going to be construed narrowly. One thing that can be an issue in arbitration is the sometimes unruly force, say, of public policy. How is this going to be interpreted? There's a predictability to the Singapore regime that these are limited avenues and they're going to be construed narrowly. Thanks. Uh, sorry. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, uh, Ganesh, you yeah. mentioned something about uh, you know the public policy and. It is, of course, the unruly horse that you know we've been dealing with since uh, the public policy, the concept came in for. How has the ground of public policy been dealt with by courts? And you know, there is a plethora of judgments, and we know Justice Nariman retired. <clears throat> I can recall very quickly at least two of his judgments, Sang Yong and Associate yes. Victors, uh, yes. which, which, which talked about public policy. Uh, is it any different from the 2015 version of the Act? Uh, 
and 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 how the public policy has evolved over the years please yeah, um, I mean, of course, uh, bear with me for a few minutes because this is uh, it is an important topic and probably the crux of the uh, 34 because uh, this is what most parties use. This is are unable to present the case when they try and challenge an award in India, which is made in India, as well as resist enforcement of foreign awards under 48. Of course, we were talking about the model law. 48 is a implementation of the New York Convention. Article 5, which are very similar grounds, except that in 48, we don't have patent illegality, which is there in 34 for domestic awards made in India. But of course, patent illegality was an extension of public policy, but now there is a separate provision that deals with patent illegality in section 34 itself. Coming to public policy, now it's very helpful that in the 2015 amendment, which you rightly pointed out just now, there are two explanations given to section 34 that are extremely helpful. Explanation one clarifies what would be in conflict with public policy of India. Earlier public policy, as Kevin said, is an unruly horse, which you know was stated few hundred years back by an English judge in a case, because everything you can say public policy, but what is uh, against the public policy of country A may not be uh, against the public policy of country B. So it's very helpful that the uh, legislature has now clarified this in the 2015 amendments. And it is expressly provided in the act that an award would be in conflict with the public policy only if the making of the award was induced or affected by fraud or corruption or was in violation of section 75 or 81 of our uh, arbitration act 75 and 81 are in the conciliation part which is part 3 of the act which is more about uh, confidentiality being violated if there was a conciliation uh, you know uh, pending uh, the disposal of the arbitration and they violate that then if the award is in contravention with the fundamental policies of indian law or it is in contravention with the most basic notions of morality or justice. So this is an explanation given in the act itself, which is very helpful. And there's another explanation 234, which says that just because you file an application at 34 uh, on the grounds of public policy, that would not mean that the court can review the merits of the dispute while deciding whether the award is in contravention with the fundamental policy of Indian law, which is one of these three uh, limbs that I mentioned to public policy. First, fraud or corruption while making an award. Uh, then fundamental policy of Indian law, contravention of most basic notions of morality of justice. Few cases here are extremely important in the context. I mean, the most important, of course, is the Renu Sagar case, which was pre our 1994 act. It was decided, uh, you know, in 1994 before the implementation of the 1996 act, sorry, of our, um, you know, which followed the model law. This, of course, was not, it was under the Foreign Awards Act, uh, which you, which implemented the New York Convention. Now, of course, under the 1996 act, both the, the 40 Act, the Foreign Awards Act, and the Geneva Convention Implementation Act, everything is now encompassed in the 1996 Act as one single piece of legislation. Renu Sagar was a decision under the Foreign Awards Enforcement Act of 1961, where the court said, what is public policy? Now you have this explanation in 34, but the genesis of this was in Renu Sagar, which was an AR 1994 Supreme Court case, where the Supreme Court said that it uh, an award will be in con contrary to public policy, if it is contrary to fundamental policy of Indian law, interests of India or justice or morality. So, of course, some of these have been now decided in judgments and Abhinav, you very rightly pointed out, Honorable Justice Nariman's very helpful judgments. I'll come to them in a minute. But then the next case, which added to these grounds was patent illegality, which uh, I think Samir will be speaking about. That was an ONGC versus saw pipes in which the court, that was in 2003, where the court uh, decided that in addition to the Renu Sagar grounds, you also look at patent illegality. Well, Renu Sagar was a judgment, uh, you know, which is under the for, for enforcement of foreign award. ONGC and saw pipes was a case under Section 34, uh, which is a enforcement uh, setting aside application uh, for a the award made in India. It is important in this context to uh, recall Bhatia International, where in Bhatia International, while the court, Supreme Court, dealt with the case where interim measures of protection was. Uh, being asked for a quote from India. The court said that the whole of part one will apply to arbitration, uh, even seated outside India. Therefore, um, you know, in cases, future cases like Venture Global, some of the parties invoked in this particular case, section 34, which is in part one, 
to set aside an award in India, an application for an award made outside. So this was this raised a lot of hue and cry in the international uh, legal market, saying, "How can you go and file an application in India using Part One to set aside an award made in a foreign country?" Then came Bhatia International. Uh, then came uh, Balco, which overruled Bhatia International Venture Global, and it was the other uh, the other end of the spectrum. But he said Part One will not apply at all, so you couldn't get interim measures from court. Then, 2015, the Act was amended, which said that you can still get an interim measure from the court and section 9 would apply extraterritorially. But the reason I'm mentioning this is now you cannot file an application in India on any of the grounds uh, to set aside an award here where the award is made outside. You can only resist enforcement of that award when it comes as a foreign award under section 48. It's important to remember this. There was a case of Pulchan, but then that was overruled. Sri Lal Mahal is a very important case which reinstated Renu Sagar principles, it said that this is what is the law and uh, there has been ONGC Western Go Gekko, which laid down, you know, what is uh, fundamental policy of India, the court said judicial approach, principles of natural justice and Wednesbury principles of reasonableness. So, in addition to that, I've been I've just mentioned about Associated Builders GDA, then the uh, Associated Builders GDA, the court went on to discuss about fundamental policy of India where it said that examples were given that violation of foreign exchange legislations, disregarding orders and binding judgments of supreme, uh, superior courts, and all the three principles laid down in Western Gecko, which is judicial approach, principles of natural justice, and Wednesbury principles. These were all quite, uh, quite expanded. It So these, in fact, after the Law Commission made the report, there was an addendum sent including these two cases and therefore what I said earlier about section 34, the explanations were very carefully crafted. And let me just finish with Sangyong, which is a very important case where the court, Justice Nariman, very, very uh, progressive judgment, I should say, where uh, the court said that, you know, uh, after the 2015 amendment, the expansion of public policy in the saw pipes case and the Western Gecko case have been done away with. And the court said that the issue of patent illegality will not apply to international commercial arbitration, even if seated in India. And the ground of justice or morality is now to be read as most basic notions of morality of justice. In fact, in this case, the court went on to invoke Article 142 of the Constitution, its inherent power, and the minority award, it was a split decision, the majority award and one was a minority award. The minority award was upheld by the court. It said that if the, the matter is set aside, and they go back and really re arbitrate the whole thing. It's going to cost so much of uh, money and time. And therefore, the minority award was upheld, which was what the court accepted. And this was a groundbreaking judgment, in my view. You know, Sangyong was an excellent judgment. And I think um, uh, that's something that all of us should definitely read. Thanks, thank you. Thanks, I think that, with that, I th yeah. That, thank you. I can only echo everything that you just said. Uh, also, for the benefit of the audience, there is a Q&A tab that I see. If you have any questions, please feel free to type in and uh, we will try our best to answer those queries. Um, you know, Samir, Ganesh has already given the cue from, uh, you know, public policy to 34-2A, patent illegality. And perhaps you could help us draw the distinction between <laughs> the two sections and the, the provision of patent illegality, which exists in one and not in the other. Uh, well, I mean, a patent illegality was, was relatively uh, a newer addition in the... Uh, Act, uh, in, in I mean, you may want to come a little closer to your mic. I think if perhaps, yeah, yeah. Uh, right. Is it better? Much better. Right. So, um, it basically gives uh, statutory recognition to um, what has been said by the courts and law as it was developed. And uh, it's very important to understand that while uh, Section 34 uh, may apply to challenge to all India seated arbitration, be it domestic or international. Patent illegality ground is only available while you're challenging a domestic award and you're not challenging an award passed in an international commercial arbitration seated in India. So, uh, and it's an interesting distinction because here the, this, the court and the legislature goes on to show that um, it is it is progressive and it is uh, only available to uh, the domestic was now i'm not going into the the, the whole uh, debate of why it is not under 48 and it is only under 34 and uh, the the provision of patent illegality uh, has been explained in various judgments but i'll just mention the provision and the provision 
of 342A has a proviso which specifically says that award shall not be set aside merely on the ground of an erroneous application of the law or reappreciation of evidence. Now, this is extremely important. That sets the counters for the for the court to test the the application of patent illegality. Now, uh, in an arbitral award, you cannot, as Ganesh said, you cannot go and reappreciate the evidence. You cannot go behind the mind of the arbitrator to see whether what he has said is right or wrong. However, and I'm referring to Sangyong again, um, because Sangyong also talks about what patent illegality will cover. Now, uh, Sangyong in various paragraphs has basically uh, summarized the application of patent illegality as this. Now, it says that patent illegality has to be such an error which one needs to be apparent on the face. It should not take court uh, hours and hours and days and days to to threadbare, dissect the award and then find out whether there's a patent illegal. <clears throat> it has to be something which is which should be very apparent on the face. Now, <clears throat> it also says that the mere contravention of the substantive law uh, by itself will not be patent illegality, and that that's coming out of the proviso of two A, which which says that merely long application of law will not be. Um, in case of finding of an arbitrator is based on no evidence. Uh, that is, he, he makes a determination of fact uh, which for which there is no evidence on record or there is a contrary evidence on record, then yes, uh, you may you may uh, put into action the, the clause of patent legality. Uh, now, also, if if uh, the arbitrator ignores vital evidence, that is something where patent legality can come in. Um, in case the arbitrator goes outside the scope of the contract or does not apply a clear provision of the contract to the arbitration, then you may uh, push in patent illegality ground. Now, um, after after Sang Yong, there are multiple judgments of the Supreme Court where patent illegality was clarified. More recently, the Bombay High Court and BCCI was the Deccan uh, Chronicle also talked about uh, patent illegality and and it said that perversity is also um, a dimension under which patent illegality can be tested. So perversity, as all of us know, is also a ground available to challenge uh, a domestic award of 34. Now, uh, earlier patent illegality was not an independent ground of challenge, but now it becomes an independent ground of challenge of an award. And if the horse everything else, there are the above three and four errors or three and four lacunas in, a, in an award, you can successfully go and challenge uh, an award under 34. But again, I will reiterate, it's it's important to understand that you cannot go into too much merits of the case. It has to be very, very um, uh, patently illegal award. Uh, and parties must understand that they need to ideally respect the arbitrator's award and the habit of going and challenging every single award which comes against the party losing it is is just uh, not going to reap any benefits because the law now, uh, as far as domestic challenge of an award is concerned, is extremely clear and there is a very little scope on which you can really challenge the award. Thanks. Thanks, Amir. You know, I, I agree with you and, and I have always believed and that's the analogy that I like to give that arbitral awards should function like an ATM card. Right, you take an ATM card, you insert it in the machine, you get the cash. You've taken an <laughs> arbitral award, you go to a national court and you ask the court, give me my money. Now, in order for the, for the court to do that, I mean, what should be the elements in that award? That award should be clear, concise, legible, uh, detailed with all the reasons. And, and that's why I'd like to bring Kevin in. Kevin, you have been cementing awards with precision for as long as I can remember. And the way the SEAC Secretariat does it is by way of scrutiny. Now, I cannot overemphasize the importance of, of what scrutiny really does. But however, I think when it comes to the audience or the clients of arbitration, the concept of scrutiny is not as clear as it is to those who do it. Would you like to tell us how do you strengthen these awards and how have SEAC awards benefited through the years to the eagle eyes of the ICC, SEAC court and, and SEAC secretariat. 
Thanks, Abhinav. We've been talking about scrutiny for over a decade, and it is one of the most valuable features that an institution can offer. And it's critical to realize when you're, if you're choosing ad hoc arbitration or an institution that doesn't have this review process, the award is just going to go out. And what we're looking at in scrutiny, we're not trying to change the tribunal's mind. That's sometimes a misconception. So as a secretary reviewing the award, you're just making sure that it's enforceable. You're not moving the tribunal to one decision or another. So ICC and SIC are the two most well-known institutions that do scrutiny. And at SIC, we have a two-stage process. So it starts with one of our 14 legal counsel, and then it will go up to me and the registrar. I think that scrutiny starts from the commencement of arbitration. If you're looking at, at having an enforceable award, you started as soon as you received that notice of arbitration. So making sure that service has been properly affected in the relevant jurisdiction. When is the date of commencement under the applicable rules and the legislation? But once we get to the drafting stage, we're going to look at, at how is the tribunal set out the procedural history? Are there any procedural irregularities that the tribunal needs to address to the extent that procedural irregularities can now be addressed at the drafting stage? Certainly, uh, I would always advise tribunals and especially uh, relatively new arbitrators to get parties to agree on the list of issues. What are the list of issues that actually need to be decided and what do the parties agree on? So the parties may not be in agreement on some and then the tribunal is going to have to decide on those issues and make sure that they've addressed all the submissions on those is issues. Those issues will then lend itself to the determination is, that is required. Has the tri tribunal reached the determination? on all these issues and only these issues, not going outside the four corners of the arbitration agreement. A very common feature that you will see in arbitration awards is sometimes there will be an award that is against a non-signatory to the arbitration agreement. So unless this party has been joined, that cannot happen. You can have an award that will impact on a third party, but will not uh, bind a third party. So Abhinav, I really like your ATM. Uh, example, I sometimes look at awards like a story or a script and that they, that they are, there's very measurable parts. And the most important part of an award is the dispositive part, the operative part, and that is the award proper. So all of the body of the award is setting up the analysis for this dispositive part. And this dispositive part has to match all the findings in the, in the, in the body of the award only deal with those issues and no other issues. Let me close with, with a, a quick final example of how scrutiny works. And this, I think this example is now old enough that I can use it. So we had a case, very contentious case, high value case, and the claimant had been substantially successful in all of its claims. Within the arbitration agreement, it said that the losing party would pay the winning party its costs. The tribunal decided that each side was to bear its own costs. So we as an institution, we are looking at this. This is uh, perhaps a classic splitting the baby approach. And we know the transnational test and international arbitration is the cost follow the event. We're reminding the tribunal of the agreement of the parties in the arbitration clause. And in the end, the tribunal still decided that each side was to bear its own costs. Our job as the secretariat is to make sure that the tribunal is alive and apprised of these issues. But at the end of the day, it's still the tribunal's decision. We're just making sure that it's enforceable in as many jurisdictions as possible, not changing what the ultimate decision is. Thank you. Thanks so much, Kevin. Uh, we're going to close in three minutes, and I'm going to now invite the, the, the panelists for a one minute remark on their views. And, you know, we are still grappling with the ad hoc versus institutional. A very basic question, but still, I think this, the message needs to be sort of drummed as loud as possible, as often as possible. Uh, Samir, if you were to advise a client today, and Ganesh, same for you, and Kevin, same for you, uh, why would you advise institutional over ad hoc or vice versa? Start with Samir. Well, I, I think it's, it's one question which has been um, uh, answered again and again and again by, by experts in arbitration, and I'm, I'm nowhere close. But hands down an in institutional arbitration for three primary reasons. One, uh, you, you have a certainty of uh, procedural sanctity. You have a certainty of enforcement with institutions which have scrutiny like uh, ICC and SEAC. And, and also, uh, if I may say so, the institution somewhere keeps the arbitrators in check in terms of not letting them uh, go astray in terms of their over enthusiasm or 
uh, in in terms of procedure. So yes, uh, these three grounds for me are are primary importance when I advise my clients to opt for an institutional arbitration. Thanks, uh, Ganesh. Why why do people still go for ad hoc arbitration? I have never understood that. Uh, why <laughs> is it? Please tell us as to what more can we tell people to to opt for institutional arbitration. Yes, firstly, I think uh, in, uh, in, in a country like India, I'm not talking about Singapore, even Singapore for that matter, only the last, uh, I would say 20 years, institutional arbitration has been very popular. I think it depends on the country, the jurisdiction, the, the, the law that you follow. The countries which follow the common law approach, the English common law approach, be it England or India or Singapore or Malaysia, traditionally ad hoc arbitration has been very popular. You know, though you've had LCIA for more than 100 years, you know, I mean, uh, a lot of arbitration in England is still ad hoc and same in India as well. So we actually adopted the English model when we came to having a ad hoc um, arbitration. Second, in terms of institutions, for example, in continental uh, Europe or in other civil law countries, like in China as well, you have more than 130 arbitral institutions. Every province has an institution. First, I think most important institutional arbitration is the access to an institution, number one. Number two, they need to have an awareness about this institution. For example, uh, I can tell you, I mean, uh, I might have a bias being a former uh, you know, uh, uh, CIAC alumni, which I'm, which Kevin is, uh, 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 you know, uh, now currently this position, which Kevin was, I was many, many years ago. And I'll just give you one example and I'll finish with that. It was in 2003 when I was, uh, you know, with CIAC and I was invited to a construction conference, incidentally, in Delhi at the India Habitat Center, about uh, 700, 800 people at the Steen Auditorium at the Habitat Center. And I asked you how much of you have heard of the Singapore International Arbitration Center? That's probably the first talk somebody from uh, Singapore is giving in India. Two hands went up, and those were the guys who had actually invited me. You know, so, uh, but within within seven years, within two by 2010, the maximum number of Indian parties at SIAC was from India. So I think institutions now you you did a great job for ICC in uh, in in South a South Asia and many. I think that's very important. Why they are not choosing institutional arbitration? It's because they are not aware. But now this awareness is being created. We have come up with the amendments. Part 1A is still not uh, you know, implemented in India, where Arbitration Council of India will rank institutions. Where are the institutions? You have a handful of them. And can you just give the role of appointment of arbitrators to them? With, but most importantly, they need to be trained, the people running the institutions. So it's a lot of work, but I think definitely, I think there's excellent work in progress. And in 10 years' time, I've been, I think there'll be a... Uh, see change in at least in so far as India is concerned. Singapore at least uh, definitely has reached that mark now. Singapore, most of the arbitrations are institutional. So I think India will also, at least the cities, uh, not the whole country, the country is big. You've got uh, millions of arbitrations in India, the big, big ones, the smaller ones. So I would not, uh, you know, say ad hoc is bad. For certain cases, ad hoc is good because when we don't have a institution we have few institutions in india we are doing a stellar job but still even when we advise clients unless they want a ciac or an icc or an lcia in india of course mcia is doing a great job ica has revamped itself but dehors these couple of institutions all other institutions are being created the new delhi international arbitration center is yet to be born though there's an act in place so these are things which will take time so i think once that is done I think ad hoc is going to be the order of the day, at least for the next decade in India, at least. That's very, very promising to hear, Ganesh, and I hope that is the case. So final concluding remark, Kevin, you can probably answer this question in five different ways in your sleep, uh, but perhaps something different, something more refreshing as to why, why SIAC, why institutional arbitration? Uh, what is it? What is the key advantage, the key inherent benefits to institutional arbitration? I actually think the misconception is that ad hoc arbitration is going to be cheaper. I think that users draft an, an ad hoc arbitration clause and they think it's going to be cheaper. And because of the benefit of the ICC uh, cost study, we know that 80% of the costs in an arbitration are legal costs. And if you end up in one of those seven year or 10 year ad hoc arbitrations, it's going to be very expensive. I know of a, of a very small value ad hoc case where the tribunal's fees ended up spiraling into hundreds of thousands of dollars. I felt bad when I told this user that if this was under the SIC rules and the SIC schedule of fees, that arbitrator's fees would have been subject to a maximum of $6,250 instead of those many hundreds of thousands of dollars for a small value case. So 
institutional arbitration in general is going to be more cost effective. And you have to ask yourself, do you want the lack of certainty in an ad hoc arbitration? Ad hoc arbitration is great when everyone is getting along, when you have a senior eminent tribunal, both parties are cooperating. But when things go sideways, that's when you need an institution. That's where you need the procedural propriety of an institution. But to me, the, the biggest message I would like to communicate is that institu institutional arbitration is more cost effective in general, not more expensive. Absolutely, golden word. I mean, this is certainly in my view, a caterpillar, which is now a butterfly. I mean, and it is only going to fly higher and higher, like Ganesh said, in the years to come. With that, thank you so much. Uh, it has been uh, an excellent session, a very effective, uh, time effective session, just the way institutions are uh, and behave and act <laughs> uh, in, in, in arbitration. So thank you, uh, Adarsh. Uh, with that, I, I, I give it back to you. Can I ask one question uh, with your permission, Avina? Please. Uh, any panelist can answer, uh, or I would like to answer Mr. Ganesh also. Would, uh, whether grounds for enforcement of foreign awards is narrower than enforcement of the domestic awards? Okay, enforcement. See, there's two different things. Well, enforcement of foreign award is under you know section 48, which you can resist. You know th that is enforcing, but enforcing domestic award is not under 34. 34 is to set aside. You enforce a domestic award or an award made in India under Section 36. For enforcing an award made in India, you enforce it like a decree of the court, right? So okay. the only thing in India which is unique in enforcement is you you will have to wait for three months, uh, which is the time given for setting filing an application to set aside under 34. And then you file an application to enforce an uh, award in India. But I think one important aspect which uh, Honorable Justice Banumati had just mentioned was a new ordinance in India that has just come into so a new amendment that has come into force in March of this year, uh, subsequent to a presidential ordinance last November, where a proviso has been added to 36, where you know now the once you enforce an award. Um, in a court, if you want a stay of the enforcement pending your set aside, typically the court can order uh, some kind of a security to be put in by the award debtor. But now the new amendment provides for an unconditional stay, right? If the court prima facie, that is important, prima facie finds that there is fraud in entering into the contract or the arbitration or the making of the award. The making of the award is already there under 34 <laughs> explanation. It has been brought in again here, but the point is the first point, you know, in making of the contract or the arbitration agreement, there's a prima facie fraud. You can give a stay on enforcement unconditionally. So the only thing uh, uh, I think uh, the comments uh, I would personally have is when this is being done, the court of obviously will be very careful because otherwise it will be opening a Pandora's box and a backdoor entry into the whole regime of uh, you know granting an uh, unconditional stay, which will be bring back bring us back to the old regime before the 2015 amendment. So when it's a foreign award enforcement, you can certainly resist on certain grounds, but it can be enforced as a decree as well. And the same with uh, an Indian award under 36, you can enforce as a decree of the court. And uh, you'll have to just in India as a specific provision, you'll have to wait for three months from the date of the award so that you know the time given in India, apart from three months, you still have a 30 day, um, you know, kind of a buffer where the court in its discretion, even if the 33 months is completed, can permit you to file if you uh, give reasons for why there was a delay. And within 30 days after the three months, you can do that. So you wait for that period, then you file an application to enforce in India. And the 48, of course, the New York Convention, you, you need to have an authenticated award. It needs to be, you know, uh, certified in Singapore, actually, under the legislation itself. For example, an award made in Singapore, not just a SIAC award. Even under the legislation, International Arbitration Act, I think SIAC can authenticate awards, right? I mean, Kevin, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, uh, you, they can yeah. authenticate awards, all awards, even ad hoc awards made in Singapore. So once it's authentic, otherwise you got to go to the embassy. It's all very complicated when you bring it. So, and more importantly, you'll have to translate the documents as well. You know, if they are not in English or, you know, the language of arbitration, it's bestest for you to translate in English. So these are certain requirements when you bring the foreign award inside. But one <coughs> thing that Samir has very helpfully explained, patent illegality is not a ground that you can, uh, you know, uh, kind of uh, use when you resist enforcement of a foreign award, right? 
but when you try and set aside in india you can if it is provided as a domestic award that again the distinction samir made very very helpfully whenever we say domestic we assume every award made in india there are also international commercial arbitration award seated in india right, to which patent illegality will not apply only to domestic awards in india it would apply thanks thanks ganesh uh, so <clears throat> So, so we are unable to take delegates questions due to the paucity of time and my sincere apology. However, we may request all participants to email the questions to us. We would glad to answer them post events. And finally, on behalf of CI and Proeltimus, I would like to thanks Avinav, Ganesh, Kevin and Samir to taking time, uh, his time out. Uh, and we will start next sessions immediately after a break of one minute. Thank you all of you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Abhinav. Thank you. Thanks, 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 everyone. Thanks, Abhinav. Thanks, Kevin. Thanks. Thanks, Ganesh. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. So, I think all the panelists of uh, Session five are on board. Right. I am unable to see the video of Mr. Karthi Ken. Okay, can you see now? No, still not visible. Your audio is coming, sir. Video. Yeah, oh. now it's okay. Perfect. Now it's okay. Yeah. So uh, may I request my colleague Vandana? To quickly introduce a very short introduce because of the paucity of time, uh, if she can uh, quickly reduce all the panelists and then uh, propose moderator Saurabh can take up the sessions forward. One now over to you. I think you are on a mute, Vandana. Your voice is not coming. Hello. Yeah, now audible. Go ahead, Vandana. Yeah. A uh, very good afternoon. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce the uh, very special panel that we have today. Uh, we have Mr. Ganesh Chandra Kabi, who specializes in construction arbitration, and as sole arbitrator has made about 180 awards. He's a fellow of the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators in UK and governing council member of SCL India. He is a fellow, he's a former chief engineer, Central House Department, Government of India, and has about three decades of experience. Our next panelist is Mr. Jatin Jadunwala. He is a commerce and law graduate and a fellow member of the Institute of Company Secretaries of India. Presently, Mr. Jatin is joint president, legal and company secretary at Adani Group. He heads the corporate legal secretariat at group level. He also has an experience of about 35 years. Uh, our third panelist is Mr. Karpitian. He is the general counsel for Siemens. Renewable Power Private Limited. His experience is also 30 plus and is in legal and compliance arena. Uh, our next panelist is Mr. Kirandip Singh. He's a senior partner in litigation and arbitration practice. He's graduated with LLB honors from the University of Leeds and B BCL from Oxford University. Mr. Kirin has been involved in various international and regional matters, dispute boards and commercial arbitration. He's a contributor to the Singapore's president of readings and speaks on a regular basis at various uh, conferences in Singapore and overseas. Uh, Mr. Agarwal, who's the moderator of today's session, is a graduate in law and an enrolled advocate. He practices mainly in New Delhi and has appeared before courts in tribunals in various parts of the country. Uh, so over to you, Mr. Agarwal. Thank you, Vandana. So today, uh, this session deals with the aspect of liquidated damages. The concept of pre-assessed compensation for breach, which we all call as liquidated damages, has been a matter of discussion in various seminars, judgments, articles, reports, and everywhere. Parties enter into the clause for liquidated damages thinking that it would bring about some kind of a certainty to their contracts. But our experiences have also already always shown that liquidated damages becomes like a pair of strings which is being pulled aside by forces on both sides. The contractors trying to avoid the liquidated damages and the employees wanting to enforce the liquidated damages. It has not actually been like a dip and take out kind of a situation where parties could 
just enforce the liquidity damages clause and keep the money with themselves because invariably the contractors oppose it. The courts have interpreted it in different ways. The law is evolving also. So the United Kingdom judgments recently in Cavendish has been giving a different approach to the concept of liquidity damages. There's a good reason why this uncertainty is there, which we'll be discussing along with the panelists. One of them could be that because the, con the clause of liquidity damages is agreed at a time and all the going is good, the parties think that it will all be fine. And I have never come across a situation where parties actually apply their mind to assessing damages at the time when they are signing the agreement. It gets entered for the asking, and especially in government contracts. Today in our session, we would be therefore dealing with not only some of the clauses of liquidated damages that various panelists have seen across, the evolution of law, particularly in respect of the proof of actual loss, and the concept of liquidated damages in context of extension of time situation. It's very common for all of us that there is extension of time as well as there is liquidated damages clause. And finally, we'll have some discussion on whether we should adopt the Cavendish approach, which is being now adopted in the UK courts to Indian situation. So I would start with a very simple uh, issue, which is speaking from the practical aspect. And there I would invite Mr. Jatin especially to give his views on what are the uh, peculiar clauses on liquidity damages that he or his company would have come across, keeping in mind that you have been working with an industry, with a conglomerate dealing with infrastructure, oil and gas. It would be helpful if you can tell us as to what are the peculiar clauses on liquidated damages that you have come across. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Saurav. Good afternoon to all. Uh, you know, the liquidated damages clause is a very important clause as far as any project is concerned. And that is also for the infrastructure project. This LD is provided only as a genuine pre-estimate of the damages. The authority or the concessioner is likely to suffer and are not by way of a penalty. Say, by way of liquidated damages, a person cannot make a profit. The objective of LD is that to put a particular person in the same condition as it would have been if there have been no delay or no non uh, no fulfillment of obligation has been made. That is the first and paramount important basic rule of the liquidated damages. I have come across various clauses of the liquidated damages. To start with, I can say in pot business, there are liquidated damages on both sides, one for the authority and also for the concessioner. When authority has to fulfill certain condition precedent and those obligations are not fulfilled by the authority, in that case, LD is levied by the concessioner as 0.1% of the performance security. This percentage may be changing depending upon the contract. And but that will be subject to maximum amount equal to bid security. Not beyond that. On the other side, when there is non-fulfillment by the concessioner, in that case, liquidated damages to be levied by the authority may be 0.1%, 0.3%, 0.5% of the performance security for every day of the delay in fulfilling obligation. And that is going up to maximum of 5% of the estimated project cost. You will see the percentage wise, 5% means how much they are getting, only eight weeks, 10 weeks, only as a uh, delay damages, which is also may or may not be reasonable. For that purpose, and the concession agreement provides for a clause, one more clause that the authority may terminate the agreement or contract over and above the LD if the amount of the LD exceeds an amount equal to 5% of the estimated project cost. So, after the 5% levy of the liquidated damages, they have a right to terminate the contract. <laughs> Similar type of uh, Clauses are in mining business also. Well, you know, mine owner and mine developer, there are two parties. 
one authority and one concessioner. The same clauses like concession at point point five one percent or five percent. If you are continuing delay for a number of days, then maximum five percent of the uh, contract value and annual contract value they can deduct as a uh, liquidated damages. Over and above that, in mining contract, there are certain parameters. Which parameters provide for excavating of the coal at a particular level and particular quality. And if it is not done, then mine owner can have a liquidated damages to the mine operator. Similar light, similar type of liquidated damages in mining is that, okay, suppose as a mine operator, I have to supply the coal within a particular time period to the mine owner to a destination which they have told to me. And if I am not providing, if I am not supplying, then they can purchase this coal from outside, from market, and whatever the price which we have fixed, and any difference is that they can recollect or collect from us as a mine uh, owner. That is the clause in mining. Uh, I am coming to next uh, one more contract side like road contracts. Road contracts also there are two types of contracts with NHA. National Highway Authority. Then the similar type of clauses are there. They may impose a liquidated damage of 0.5% and 5% of two soils of the contracted value. And same way, but another contract which we are interesting here is that the contract which are executing with the subcontractor and they have been given suppose a time period of 15 months to complete a particular contract, complete a road. In that case, five months, five months, five months, three milestones are given. And suppose first five months milestone they are not achieving, then then we will deduct certain percentage of liquidated damages. Similarly, further five months milestone is given and that also they are not achieving. And in all total goes up to 12 months, then another liquidated damages will be imposed upon them. But another positive clause I am coming to now, that now three months are remaining. And that particular subcontractor completes the road work within three months. That means he has completed in all the contract work within 15 months, which has been provided for in the contract. Whatever liquidated damages we have deducted from first and second project milestone, the same will be reimbursed in the third milestone. That is a particular clause we are putting to the subcontractor in road building. I recollect some novel LD clauses, but I will tell you only one clause if due to the positive of time. Because you know, power purchase agreement have been executed for 25 years. Now, always it's a one way love. Seller has no right to terminate the contract. Only buyer has the right. Buyer means DISCOM has the right to terminate. In one particular agreement, I have seen that seller has also a right to terminate the contract, that is the power purchase agreement, by paying X crores of rupees as liquidated damages. And that is only I have seen in one particular power purchase agreement. Thereafter, I have seen no such power purchase agreement have been executed till date. So that is what I just wanted to draw upon the type of LD clauses in infrastructure projects. Over to Mr. Saurav. Thank you. Thank you, Jadin, sir. It's very interesting to hear about the last one, particularly where you talk about the termination payment becoming a liquidated damages. I think uh, if my memory goes well, uh, then even in NHI contracts now, this concept of termination payment is coming in in a big way. Uh, the legal system has in India particularly has been dealing with liquidated damages ever since 1962 when Chunilal Mehta's case was decided. And since then, till very recently, the concept has been evolving. Some of the concepts have become more profound. Some of them have lost their significance. I would invite Mr. Kabi to give his views on the evolution of liquidated damages in the Indian jurisprudence. And especially, I would request if you can emphasize on what are the certain aspects which have gained significance and some which have lost significance right from 1962 or even prior, if you can. Thank you. Thank you, Sadhu. Good afternoon, Rohal. Good afternoon, others. Good afternoon, Rosmas and CAA for inviting me for this. Okay. 
since I am from the industry, before we exactly get into the section 74, let me just uh, give you some of the fundamental uh, aspects of uh, liquidated damages as far as the contract is concerned. One, the fundamental objective of the liquidated damages under Indian contracts, the, the involvement itself was to reduce litigation as to and also to have a certain certainty of the contracts, commercial contracts are concerned. See the first point, okay, first point is of the contract is concerned, the contract has to be a valid, enforceable and binding contract, which has been extensively negotiated by the both the parties. Second aspect of LD is concerned, the LD it has to be a well negotiated and a mutually agreed by both the parties. It should not be an one-sided LD. If it's an LD, it is negotiated before execution of the contract and mutually agreed by the parties, then that is becoming a valid liquidated damages applicable and enforceable to both the parties who own, who is at breach. The third aspect is concerned, but I would say that, okay, there has to be an express breach has to be established in the contract. The performance of the contract is concerned. The previous speaker has mentioned that, okay, certain milestone breaches. Yes, it is absolutely right. Milestone wise breaches and overall contract breaches has to be established for invoicing or claiming an LD on a, a default of a contract is concerned. Now, coming back to your question under section 74 is concerned, we have extensive arguments or the principles laid down by Supreme Court in Fatechan as well as in Kailash Nath, which says that for any default of contract is concerned, if the quantum of damage <coughs> or injury that can be proved or it can be proven, okay, then the actual quantum has to be considered. If it is not provable, then what is stipulated, that is what is mutually agreed by the contracts, that has to be considered as the liquidated damages for arriving an award is concerned. May I invite Mr. Kapi yeah. to give his view? Yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you, Mr. Saurav, and good afternoon. I am interested by what Mr. Kathik has shared on the point. And uh, if I uh, trace these uh, judicially, how the LD section 74 has evolved in India. And uh, there are many judgments from Chunilal Mehta onwards. Chunilal, uh, there's a five judges bench 1962, Fatechand in 1963, five judges, Mola Box 1969, three judges. Uh, of course, there are other judgments uh, which are not on factum and quantum, but other aspects like Raman Foundry 1974, Justice Bhagavati 1983, partially overruling Raman Foundry by Kamal Sri, three judges. 1987, I think uh, Rameshwar Rice Mills. That was full bench of Karnataka High Court, then affirmed by Supreme Court. Uh, so pipes in 2003. Uh, 2015, of course, uh, Mr. Kartikan referred to Kailasnath, but then one construction and designer services versus DDA again in 2015, and some Delhi High Court judges. So there are two parts of these three types of judgments. I shall confine to those which are uh, on the factum and quantum of loss, and other set of judgments are dealing with the propriety of levy and forcibility and other aspects. Uh, now, before uh, Chunila, uh, I will refer to one judgment of Privy Council, 1929. Uh, that was uh, it's High Panna Singh versus by Arjun Singh. What it held, the effect of Section 74 is to disentitle the plaintiff to recover liquidated damages or penalty, simply said. The plaintiff must prove the loss. Now, coming to Chunilal, again, the clause 14 of that, which had a provision, it was a long term management agreement which was terminated, held to be in breach. And then, uh, as per that, uh, the, the provision which was there, he lost not less than 6,000 rupees per month for the balance period till expiry of the contract shall be payable. Now, though Mr. Palkiwala argued that this is a minimum amount and there is another provision under clause 10 but the supreme court held that this is when there is a specified amount of ld in the contract 
there is no question of starting unliquidated devices and didn't allow uh, by ld by another methods now coming to fateh chand is the most seminal judgment and i don't think there is any judgment subsequently to fateh chand versus balkishan das which does not refer to fateh chand but again that was a dispute on transfer of property but uh, dealing with a forfeiture clause but uh, the supreme court uh, did traverse into the interpretation of section 74 and uh, on this aspect confining to the fact and proof what two three findings are very important in that which has been expanded subsequently first finding is that even if the words are written in uh, indian contract act whether or not actual damage or loss is proved to have been caused thereby 74 it says it doesn't mean that no loss is suffered and still money can be recovered or damages can be awarded so it said that whether it is a genuine pre estimate or any other penalty stipulated the court shall only award reasonable compensation secondly it laid out another principle that the court shall follow the established principles for determination of damages or reasonable compensation the third aspect which is important is that the assessment of damages shall be done at the considering the circumstances at the time of breach of contract that is how it is taking at it at par 74 with section 73 now these are the main finding in uh, this of course it uh, distinguish the english common law or liquidated damage and penalty in indian law and the scope of penalty is very huge because any type of stipulation in penalty is covered under section 74 now next judgment mola box of course there was a two contracts of supply of potato and uh, another was of poultry feast and eggs and again there is a forfeiture now these two judgment mola box and this these are not dealing with the delay these are basically dealing with penalties and forfeiture clause now here mola box is it expanded this section 74 this uh, whether or not uh, proof proof is required and this it told that it held that the whenever it is possible to prove the loss it must be proved so even when only it is not possible to prove loss then if it is in the genuine pre estimate then it can be considered for as a reasonable compensation so this is the main finding of mola box now coming to uh, so fights i am not touching ramon foundry and others these are on other aspects uh, considering the time coming to so fights this is something which deal with the delay and this contract has a very clear provision for deducting money on ld or any from the bills itself and due to the, it was a case of uh, offshore oil drilling and supply of casing files from abroad and this was delayed and the uh, when the application for uh, ut was made itself it was made clear that ld will be deducted and it was done now the tribunal found that the uh, ongc has not proved its losses and another parallel finding is that there were other factors also which would have delayed the project but the supreme court held first thing it held that when the it heavily relied on the terms of the contract and thought the and held that when it is in the nature of uh, genuine pre estimate there is no case of proving the loss Burden of proof was put on this, and uh, now if you subsequently the most another judgment which is most seminal with and it cannot be proved and it can be considered if it is any other liquidated sum. or it is a penalty then only reasonable compensation one more important thing is that i think there is a poor connection from mr kavi's side excuse mm -hmm. judgment subsequently one is uh, the construction and design services versus dda the important thing was there it was a public utility service and to be done and loss could not be estimated 
but it was uh, held uh, if the Supreme Court tried to find out if the amount specified is a Sorry, Mr. Kavi, uh, your voice is getting interrupted because of the poor he, network. He lies on the party who is committed breach. And, uh, yeah, and same thing was the uh, damages was reduced by 50 percent by guess what? Reduced by 50 percent. So the what I find is to say sum up. First thing is that loss must be there to claim any liquidated damages. If it is a loss can be proved, then it must. All the cases, only reasonable compensation can be done and the court has the power, unqualified power to assess the losses. I think that is how I can in a very quickly. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kavi. So, uh, thank you, Mr. Kavi. Uh, Mr. Kavi, just you can check uh, your uh, yes. network also. It was a uh, lot of disruptions earlier, so you can quickly check in in the meantime. Yes, sorry, go, uh, sorry. go ahead. Thank you, thank you, Adarsh. Okay. So really, the Indian perspective, as Mr. Kavi also says, is emphasizing more on reasonableness. That no party should be put to a lot of prejudice just because he's agreed to a certain amount of clauses, and if if loss can be proved, then it should be proved. If you can't prove it, then let's get into liquidity damages. Can I invite Mr. Singh, who practices primarily in Singapore, to tell us that in Singapore law, assuming that the liquidity damages is not a penalty, sir, what is the standard of proof that the Singapore courts are looking at? Do they want the parties to actually prove the loss, or they are fine with enforcing the anticipated loss as per the liquidity damages clause? Uh, thank you, Saurabh. Um, I must say it was very interesting listen to, listening to Mr. Kabi. Um, I found that, except for the disruptions, it got disrupted, and then the, this mini summary of yours uh, got, got, you know, it was very interesting because the position is, is, Europe is very difficult, very different in Singapore. Um, in Singapore, we uphold liquidated damages clause, and there is no need actual loss. And this is confirmed, uh, was confirmed, uh, sort of, in a very recent case in 2020. And that case is called Comfort Management and OGSP. And the judgment there confirmed that under Singapore law, where a party has the benefit of a LD's clause, it's entitled to recover the LD's clause irrespective of whether it has suffered loss. And um, in that decision, the court said the disposition. I mean, there are no English lawyers here, but they said that this position is, is consistent with the position in the UK in the case of Jobson and Johnson. Now, let me give you um, a very brief summary of the facts. Um, here, what happened is, what was argued is comfort management was claiming uh, damages. And the dependent OGSP argued that, look, you can't claim liquidated damages because you suffered no loss. And the reason OGCP cited, OGSP cited for that is that OGSP said, look, you comfort management has not been hit with liquidated damages in the lead contract. So comfort management had a um, agreement with the lead contractor and in turn comfort management then had a subcontract with OGSP. So comfort tried to impose liquidated damages against OGSP in the subcontract. And OGSP argued, hey, you've not been hit with LDs in the lead contract, so you've not suffered loss. And because you have not suffered loss, you can't claim these liquidated damages from me. Now, the court disagreed, and the court held that an enforceable LDs clause, a liquidated damages clause, does not cease to yield damages simply because the party seeking to rely upon that clause has suffered no loss. Uh, the court basically held that the party's right to recover LDs in accordance with the clause, that right accrues when the contract is made. It doesn't depend on actual proof of loss. Right? So the court said that it would be a right. And, and when, when the court turned to, to, um, to the lead contract, the court said that look, there can be a variety of reasons 
why there were no LDs imposed on, on the lead, in the lead contract. Uh, maybe they waived their right to liquidated damages. Maybe there was a settlement. But since parties agreed on a liquidated damages clause, uh, and there was a delay, there was no defense to that delay, comfort management was entitled to claim the liquidated damages without having to prove any actual loss. So that's the position in Singapore. Um, I might just might just caveat that position by saying that this has um, not been tested at court of appeal level yet, right? Um, and it may be it may be tested. One argument you could say is that look, so what if uh, if the lead contractor did not impose liquidated damages for a variety of reasons? So what? I mean, it, I mean, you may say, I mean. The, the court said there could be a variety of reasons why liquidated damages are not imposed by the lead contractor. But your reply to that is, could be so what? You know, did comfort management suffer any loss? That's what OGSP held. I mean, uh, argued. But the court said, well, that's irrelevant. You, as long as the LD's clause is not a penalty, it is a genuine free estimate of loss, it has been negotiated and agreed and entered into by both parties. Prior, uh, at, the, at, the, at the signing of the contract is something that comfort management can rely on without proving actual loss. And I think the position in, Singa in, 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 in Singapore is, is quite, I've learned from Mr. Kavi of the position in, in India. Uh, much more complicated, it seems, in India. But I, I just had this query, um, and maybe I didn't quite understand it uh, properly, Mr. Kavi. If, if the court um, requires party to prove their loss, right? Um, I mean, forgive me for my ignorance, but if they prove loss, then do they have to claim that loss or can they rely on the liquidated damages clause? What, what's the position in India there? Sir, uh, in uh, what has been found, uh, I have one case of experience as an arbitrator where I decided a little distinguishing Chunilal Mehta. The system here is also in constitution when Chunilal Mata is that if there is a liquidated damages clause that you can't claim on liquidated damages or the maximum amount will be the liquidated treasury amount. That is same. But in that particular case where I was an arbitrator, there were delays which were not concurrent in two different periods. And the employer had claimed both liquidated and unliquidated damages for the same period as an alternative. I did uphold this. The award was also accepted because contractor was given uh, general damages and the uh, employer was also awarded general damages uh, based on the evidence, whatever it is. But keeping the maximum amount, what would have been the LD amount? Right. Okay. I think that's clear. Thank, thanks for the clarification. Thank you. That makes sense. That makes sense. So if one wants to enforce the liquidated damages clause, one needs to go to Singapore. This yes. is the conclusion. Yeah. Right. <laughs> the law, uh, what I could also understand from the US case laws is that they are also now going and looking into the reasonableness of the of the quantum which is provided. So the proportionality test is actually also gone into the US jurisprudence and the uniform commercial practices. Okay. Now moving on to a slightly different aspect is that there is always a tussle between extension of time and liquidity damages. And this is more so in construction contracts when we are faced with a situation where the contractor wants extension of time. And if the contractor is given the extension of time, then the employer wants that the liquidated damages should also come out. On the other hand, the contractor is always at a doubt that if they ask for extension of time, it may tantamount to an admission of breach, and therefore they may be exposed to liquidated damages. Since we have all had chances of handling contractor situation and employer situation, this is particularly a question that I will put first to Mr. Jatin because his company is also doing a lot of infrastructure related contracts. As in a situation where, uh, where you are, suppose the employer and the contractor wants extension of time, your commercial team comes and tells you, uh, Mr. Jatin, it's important that we give the extension of time for our commercial necessities, contractual necessities. Then what are the precautions you would suggest? That the employer should take where while they grant the extension of time they should not lose out on their rights and claims towards liquidated damages 
And keeping in mind, particularly in a situation where parties at that time are not in a state of dispute, both are performing. Whether con whether time is of the essence, whether time is not of the essence, how would you react to that? I think so. You are mute, sir. Yeah, yeah, Mr. Saurav, it's a quite practical questions you have raised, and uh, we are facing sometime day in day out. Uh, my techno commercial team comes to us. And tells us okay, whether we should deduct the liquidity damages or not in some of the contracts. So what happens? Okay, there are two types of contracts. We are executing short-term contracts and long-term contracts. When there is a short-term contract and the delay has been there, then we say, okay, let us close the contract. It's over. And whatever last bill we have to pay, let us deduct the liquidity damages from that particular bill and close the contract. However, when there are long-term contracts are going on. And where the time is in essence, what shall we do? Because there are two options available to us. A particular time is given to the contractor to complete the job and he does not do. Then first we give an extension to him. If we give the extension to a contractor, then we shall specifically give a notice or must, uh, must give in writing that this is an extension given to you as an exceptional case. However, we reserve our right to deduct the liquidity damages. That's one part. And sometimes we feel that this particular contractor is unable to execute further. Then we may terminate the contract looking to the time being an essence of the contract. And in that case, we have to go for a new contractor. But such situations arise very less because you know a particular contractor when he has done a particular job to a particular level then it is difficult to engage some other contract to get the work done. So main point is that if we are granting the extension to protect ourselves by giving a particular notice or particular thing in writing that this is a specific or special case extension has been given to you, but subject to the LD. I remind myself in one case at our port, we have to build the GT and that is to be completed in a particular period. Now what happens okay, the contractors, laborers were there, everything was available from the contractor side, but the particular equipment which has to come for that came late, one ship late by it is 25 days delayed. In that case, we ourselves say to the contractor that okay, this particular period of delay we are condoning because it is due to our due to a fault or due to something wrong from our side and therefore we will not conclude we will not uh, uh, count for this delay but if you see i remind here one particular case which is of hindustan hind construction versus state of maharashtra it's of 1979 which which was decided by chief justice uh, uh, mr y v chandchur very important case where the contract clearly says the time is an essence of the contract. But there are certain clauses, or there were certain clauses in the contract. This contract I'm talking about 1956-1957. I'm not going into the detail okay, what was the contract. It was uh, just building some bridge on the river. But there are certain clauses, okay, time is an essence. But two clauses were available in the contract saying okay, extension of time has to be given to the contractor in case of certain circumstances. Second clause was also given like if he is not adhering to the time limit, so much percentage of the liquidated damages or penalty will be payable by the contractor. And with these two clauses, keeping in mind, a judgment was given that even though time was an essence of the contract, we have to see other clauses of the contract like extension can be granted penalty can be imposed and therefore therefore the contract cannot be terminated and whatever amount they have deducted from the bill of the contractor has to be refunded that was the that was the judgment which is a very good judgment and if you read para 7 and 8 of the judgment it's quite interesting so this is what i can say as an employer what shall we do as far as to preserve the right to claim the liquidity <laughs> while granting the extension
Thank you, Saurabh. Saurabh. Yeah, now, can I put the same question to you when you are acting as a contractor? And Saurabh, as a can contractor. I add something? Saurabh, can yes, I add yes, something? Please, please. please. Yeah, I, thought I was coming to you after, this, uh, after the second bit. But yes, please, please add. Yeah, I fully agree with what Mr. Jatin has mentioned. One more additional point what I would rather recommend is that <coughs> while accepting the milestone performance, okay, one aspect is that while granting the extension, we need to specifically mention that, okay, this extension is subject to imposition of applicability and over and above while accepting the performance, that means the milestone, okay, maybe some of the companies, there is a, um, a process called work completion certificate will be issued. In such a circumstance also, while accepting the uh, performance of that contractor, it has to be stipulated that this is subject to imposition of applicable ELD. So that makes a foolproof and, and another aspect is that if that can be duly acknowledged by the contractor, that will give a full proof on the extension of time as well as the liquidated damages concept. Or do you? Yes, now, I'll put a question to both of you from the contractor's perspective, because I'm sure your companies have even acted as a contractor many times. Yes. Now, yes. In a situation where a contractor wants extension of time, and that can be for many reasons. One of the reasons can be situations that are beyond the contractor's control or situations that may be attributable to the employer. And the contractor wants the extension of time. It wants to continue the performance of the time, so it doesn't want to fight with the employer. Now, what precautions does the contractor take while seeking extension of time to, in the future, avoid liquidated damages and, at the same time, does not admit a breach because otherwise a, a request for time extension would be construed as a breach. So what are your experiences? What are your suggestions and views on that? So okay. let me, yeah. Okay, so ask. Okay, Mr. Jatin, you want to continue? You, yes, you either Jatin sir or Kathika sir, whatever. Saurav, so, is to whom? Uh, to uh, whom did you address this question, Saurav? Saying this is open to Kathika sir and uh, Jatin okay. sir. Okay, okay. So, so, so to answer to your question, that as a contractor from the shoes of a contractor is concerned, it is very much essential to reduce or mi minimize the liabilities are concerned. So, first point is that, okay, it is very much essential to analyze what are the reasons for attributable to the delay is concerned is that, okay. So, there are situations where that the, uh, the contractor has not received the payment or contractor has not received certain kind of a permissions and everything. So it is essential to analyze and understand that, okay, what are the uh, ways available for them to uh, get an extension of time without imposing a uh, LDE's consent. That is aspect number one. I'm not directly coming to force major situation. Most of the contracts are concerned where the force major situation is there. There are many places it is stipulated that the extension of time will be available without having an LD on that. So it is dependent upon the nature of the contract as well as the nature of the extension which is going to happen. There, there are many places there is a payment delay, places where there is a, what you call there is a, a delay in opening the LC or driving the cargo from both the sides. As Mr. Jatin has mentioned that, okay, the uh, input has no reach, which was supposed to be uh, supplied by the owner. So it is depend upon that, okay, and it is essential for the contractor to have a close by close analysis and to understand that how it can be saved. See, from my perspective, I'll tell you that, okay, once a contract is executed, we divide that into different parts and each and every section keeps what is the accountability, what is the date of uh, completion of that, how it has to be <coughs> covered or executed within that part. And if there is a delay happening, okay, what are the reasons for that? Then based on the contracts, it can be it can be claimed from the owner that okay, these are the reasons, okay. You need to provide me the extension without imposing an LDO. That's all. Mr. Jatin, can we have a short reaction from you? Yeah, I'm just giving short reaction. <laughs> Because uh, we have also worked as a contractor apart from the employer on the other side. Say I'm on the other side of the table now as a contractor. 
then uh, what we have to do first is contract planning and contract uh, what we can say is contract management these two things are very important for a contractor and for seeking the extension of time like a covid situation recently some force major event is there then whenever i'm asking as a contractor the extension of time i shall specifically mention in that particular letter or so okay that application shall not be considered as an admission of my breach of any any of the clauses of the contract because this is due to this force major situation or this is the situation which is quite beyond control of myself that should be the my first uh, first writing to the employer so that i can save in future any liquidated damages secondly what precautions a contractor has to take because sometimes what happened ke i have to fulfill certain obligations in a year or two years time then there are so many things happening in between when something is breached by the employer then i must immediately bring to their notice ke this has happened and due to this i am delayed by 15 days or so so suppose what happens in our coal contract when we are supplying coal to the discoms what happens they are not issuing the deliver uh, order that where this to be coal has to be supplied from the port when we are getting the delayed order immediately send a email to them ke okay, even though it is a contract provides for an order to be given before so and so date which i have not received and therefore even the coal is available at the port of delivery i cannot supply to you so it should not be construed as any delay from my side and i shall not be penalized for that purpose this i have to take into consideration and sometimes as a contractor and as an employer both have to seek whether it is a contributory delay or a so a contributory default or a sole default this has to be same and this is where section 55 of the contract act you know is coming into picture i am not going into the detail of the section 55 thank you mr saurav now we all know that every employer wants to treat a liquidated damages clause as a dip and take that they want to dip it and take it out and more often than not we are given performance bank guarantees to cover the amount that us that is there in the perform under the liquidated damages in the law obviously doesn't want to it go beyond the law that has already laid down on the encashment of performance bank guarantee but i want the singapore perspective on on it from mr said as to in a situation where there is a claim for liquidated damages and the contractor simply wants to encash the employer wants to encash the performance bonds then how does your courts in singapore look at such encashment actions what is the scope of interference that you have seen there Mr Singh are you are on mute All right thank you sir of Adarsh for telling me I'm on mute Yeah <laughs> uh, yeah audible Yes so in Singapore the situation the the approach to performance bonds is quite unique we have two grounds to injunct uh, calls for performance bonds one is i think you all are familiar with it's same in india there is fraud and secondly we have this ground called unconscionability right and and that's what i would like to talk about now there have been two recent i i will address your questions or but this going to set down what unconscionability means first so in singapore there have been two very recent decisions of the high court um the first one is salza pumps and high flux membrane now here the court um discharge an ex parte injunction by salza um Salzer went to court to restrain the call of a performance bond and obtained a an injunction on an ex parte basis. He obtained an injunction on the ex parte basis. High Flux then um, challenged that injunction at an inter parties hearing. So what High Flux was saying, the reason they called on the bond was because of various design flaws, and um, they alleged that. these design flaws were breach of warranty obligations since the warranty obligations had been breached they could call on the performance bond now the court refused to extend the injunction and the court said that well uh, salzer tried to argue unconscionability but the court emphasized that unconscionability is a is a very high threshold and it requires a very strong prima facie case now 
the co just alleging that there's a very uh, heated dispute or genuine dispute on the root cause of the design flaws doesn't amount to unconscionability. There has to be something more. Uh, Salzer tried to argue that High Flux was going through restructuring proceedings. They were in, uh, in, in very well known in Singapore. They were in financial difficulties. They were being restructured. So Salzer tried to argue that there was some ulterior motive um, because High Flux was in financial trouble. That is why they were calling on the performance bond and the call should be injuncted on for the reasons of unconscionability. Uh, the court held that was not a reason. Now, the next case is more, more relevant to what you just asked. It's CEX versus CEY. And um, here, CEY was, uh, uh, sorry, CEX made a call on a performance bond. And, um, sorry, uh, the, 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 I mix up. CEY made a, was a developer and it made a call on a performance bond against its contractor, CEX, right? So the names are blacked out because it's confidential. So CBI developer makes a call on a performance bond against its contractor CEX on the grounds of delay. Now they don't claim liquidated damages, but they claim general damages for delay. So it, it, it's quite similar, right? Just it, the position would have been same if they claim liquidated damages. Now what happened is CEX argued that the call was unconscionable. CEX argued that look, the delay was due because the qualified person on the job was hospitalized and then passed away. One of the main reasons, which then led to the delay. And CEX argued that under Singapore statute, the developer CEY had a part to play under the statute in appointing a new um, PE, a new professional engineer, a new qualified person. Uh, in this case, an engineer minister the contract. So the court held that since, since CEY had some part to play in the delay, and secondly, it would have been illegal, illegal for the contractor to continue work in the absence of the qualified person. The call on a performance bond was unconscionable, right? It was uh, inequitable because CEY, number one, had a part to play in appointing the new uh, uh, qualified person. And secondly, CEX, the contractor, couldn't carry on with the works without this qualified person. It would have been illegal for them to do so. So the court very broadly laid down, um, very uh, broadly laid down categories where you can stop a call on a performance bond on the grounds of unconscionability. They said if there is there are excessive sums, if the demand is excessive, it goes beyond the uh, maximum damage that uh, the, the party calling on the bond could have suffered. Um, if the party calling on the bond itself is liable in some way for the breach, and in this case, CEY was liable because they didn't um, do their part in appointing the new qualified person. The court also said another ground for unconscionability would be coming to the court with unclean hands or for an ulterior motive and the call base and if you make a call based on a on a stand if your if your call is inconsistent with the stance you had taken earlier that is also unconscionable so just to sum up uh, in singapore Sharof, uh, Sharof, if, if an employee calls on a, on a bond and tries to uh, because of liquidated damages if the employer is itself somewhat liable for that delay then that can be and that can then restrain the call on the performance form so you don't have to prove fraud yeah very interesting mr singh because look at the difference in the indian system and the singapore system the, the indian courts do not stop in do not injunct the call on performance bonds saying no no i would not look into it but they do look into the conscionability of the liquidated damages clause whereas in the singapore system at the stage of invocation of the performance bond, the conscionability aspect is looked into, but not really at the stage of enforcement of the liquidated damages clause. That's right. It's, That's it's right. extremely interesting. Yeah. Now, I have the last question on the table, and um, since we are running short of time, just to give a small background, uh, 1914, the UK courts in, brought down uh, 
introduced the penalty test for testing the liquidity damages clauses. 2015, they evolved it to a new test called the legitimate interest test. And legitimate interest test is very simply put. They really examine, is there any legitimate commercial interest of the contracting party behind such a clause? And then they get into the proportionality test. So from the penalty test, now you have a twin test of legitimate interest test along with the proportionality test. India, however, continues to follow the penalty test. I'll quickly invite Mr. Kabi to give his quick views on, the, do you think that India should also evolve and adopt the legitimate interest test as per the Cavendish approach, or it's still time to wait for it? Thank you, Saurabh. I think uh, Cavendish approach is basically balancing the twin concepts, as you told, of legitimate commercial interest and proportionality. As we have seen in India, so far it is the penalty test or genuine pre-estimate test, which is still upheld by the courts. Now, if we go by Cavendish approach in India, then this reasonable compensation, the factors under consider how to arrive at reasonable compensation, that has to go beyond this reasonable compensation test and to factor into the legitimate interest as well as uh, the proportionality aspect, unless it is extra measures. Now, if you look in one aspect, in sophisticated, sophisticated commercial contracts, complex contracts, these are freely negotiated and this will serve a purpose and parties agreement will be offered. The way liquidated damages are, uh, I think, uh, I think this whole purpose of LD is to create certainty. Now, as you told in the very beginning, it has created a lot of uncertainty even on the amount aspect now. Even if you go by the latest 2015 Supreme Court in design and construction. But the problem in India is that we don't have an unfair contract terms act, the unconscionability issue, and the contracts by government and PSUs are not freely negotiated. So the unequal bargaining power is also not being recognized in commercial contracts followed by Prajana Dhanangoli and SKJ Supreme Court. So the difficulty is that this will create some amount of vagueness and maybe there will be more dispute in dealing with this aspect on legitimate interest and proportionality. If you just uh, refer one judgment, that is Bharat Sanchar Nigam Limited versus Reliance Communication Limited decided by three judges in the Supreme Court, Justice Kapadi, as you just wrote that. Now, of course, it relied on uh, finally on legitimate test, though it affirmed the particular clause. So, it did not apply this test, though the, it on the sense it was trying to under, uh, balance this legitimate interest test. So probably we, in India today, we are not prepared for this unless there are other developments, legislative as well as the way we treat this concept. Just one line from Mr. Singh, is Singapore adopting the Cavendish approach? You are on mute, You are on mute, Mr. Singh. Sorry, bad habit. Sorry. Uh, sorry, one one line. No, we are not adopting a Cavendish approach. Here is the recent decision of, of Singapore in the uh, the Denka, right? Um, here, the Court of Appeal, Denka and Saraya Energy. Here, the Court of Appeal basically said went back and we affirmed the Dunlop pneumatic approach. And just to briefly. The Court of Appeal said that the, that the legitimate interest approach in Cavendish is too uncertain and inflexible. And flexible. It's too flexible, it's too uncertain, it doesn't give certainty to parties. Uh, whereas they prefer the Dunlop pneumatic approach. Before that, there was some uncertainty. Some cases followed Cavendish, some cases didn't follow Cavendish. But the Court of Appeal has now, in that case, they didn't it outright, but they rejected the Cavendish approach in the Denker case and went back to Dunlop and said that Cavendish approach is uncertain and can be too flexible. That's, that's just to sum it up. Thank you. Although, uh, uh, for Mr. myself, Sarah, I think, uh, with your permission, can I ask one yes, question yes, also? Please, please, we can conclude uh, your question with that. Yeah, yeah. just a minute. So, um, uh, I would like to ask, in fact, uh, two short questions, and I would like to ask uh, the, uh, these questions to Mr. Kabi. Uh, so, uh, from the delay expert perspective, on delay analysis based on the critical path methods, certain delays are found attributable to the employer and certain delays 
as concurrent, but some delays on account of the contractor. So whether LD can be imposed on the contractor for delay period that is found solely attributable to the contractor or not? This is uh, uh, my first question. And uh, second question, uh, just I have uh, done several delay and quantum analysis of various clients and most common issues uh, is that whether EOT is ground, granted without imposing an LD, should this mean that the contractor must automatically get recovery of this additional cost claims loss of opportunity cost because of employers delay etc just i'd like to ask quick two questions from mr Kavik. yeah, yeah. yeah. thank you and for a quick reply the second question first and the answer is very simple and it is already settled principle in every jurisdiction that the extension of grant uh, time grant does not automatically entitle to damages of course, there may be concurrent visual, there may be force measure. Only if the extension of time is due to employer's delay, then only the contractor will be entitled to damages. The automatic uh, claim of damages is not the principle of law, I think, in any jurisdiction anywhere. And uh, the, the, the first question is very, very important. And uh, now let us understand this. The LD is primarily a legal issue and not a, only a delay issue. So delay is one of the things. Now, you have to look into your contract. Now, if the contract has a particular procedure for grant of extension of time, if it provides for contemporaneous assessment and extension of time, then the employer is obliged to grant extension of time contemporaneously based on not necessarily on actual delay analysis, but based on most likely. That is what the SCL protocol also suggests. Now, if this has not been done, then in most common law jurisdictions, except in USA, uh, it will be the prevention principle will come into operation. Now, prevention principle will come into operation in two aspects. One is the inadequacy of the extension of time clause to cater for certain delay events. Second is that if the extension of time clause is not operated as per the provision in the contract. So, and there may be too many preventions, maybe late variation order, let maybe any delay event and if the employer is not uh, dis determining the extension of any time and as the very very widespread practice in india of granting of provisional extension of time every time you grant provisional extension the first thing you do you forfeit your life to LD or even termination now the question is that so the prevention principle will disentitle the contractor uh, the employer to put ld once the extension of time clause is not operated and probably by retrospective delay analysis it may not be possible to do unless contract has a specific provision for that now the exception in the us jurisdiction is that where retrospective analysis of extension of time is being considered for ld claims and it is being allowed but there the risk is that if the employer does not grant contemporaneous extension of time if there is a provision then the contractor may claim constructive acceleration claims because out of this because of threat or not giving the extension of time it, if it of course it has to prove other factors and data uh, documents that it has incurred additional expenses so my in my own experience at least out of the arbitrations i have handled uh, at least 50 cases where ld claims are uh, coming the it, LD claims fail not because of loss and other things. It fails because of poor operation or non-operation of extension of time clause and the whole LD clause gets vitiated. Thank, thank you, Mr. Kabi. So, thank you. Uh, 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 others, others, can I, uh, can I add one additional point? Okay, as far yes. as the employer or employee is concerned, the documentation which what is prepared and available from the insertion of the contract is the most important factor for arriving or claiming an LD is consent. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Karthikan. Thank you. So I think we are running sort of time and we are running behind the schedule. So with the, uh, your permission, sort of, can we conclude this uh, session? Yes, yes, yes. Please. It was a very Others insightful also. session and uh, really we got a lot of uh, thoughts from India and international perspectives. And uh, I think participants has really enjoyed this session. And I would really thanks to Mr. Kartiken, Mr. Kabi, Mr. Singh, and Mr. Jatin, and uh, last but not least, Mr. Saurabh to moderate this session extremely good. And 
uh, with the one minute break, we will just go in the second session, which is also interesting and on the delay analysis and forensic delay analysis and damages also. Thank you, all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. So I I think uh, all the panelists uh, are for the next sessions are there. Mr. Bain Burley, Mr. Promet. Uh, can I request uh, uh, IT team, uh, Mr. Vishal Nadula, uh, can you just give him a video rights also? He's unable to uh, just uh, open his video. IT team from CIA can give him a video, uh, right? Yeah. Just give him a right so that he can put on video. He's unable to put on his video. Rights are already given, sir. Okay, okay. Vishal, uh, are you there? I am there. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you, but uh, your voice is not coming. Your background is, uh, I mean, we are able to see your some background, but you are not visible. Okay, let me just check my settings. Yes, I think, uh, uh, anyway, we can, in the meantime, uh, I just uh, give uh, one quick uh, housekeeping announcement. Like, uh, due to the last minute exigency, Mr. Gagan and Mr. Bhatt was supposed to be speaking in this sessions, so could not join. And Mr. Vishal is going to cover Mr. Gagan from the same organization. And Mr. Promit is a renowned advocate uh, who will share his legal perspective uh, because Mr. Bhatt could not join also. So I would request uh, my colleague Vandana to have a quick uh, introductions of all the panelists and then I can start moderating the sessions also. Yeah. Over to you, Vandana. You are on mute. Yeah, yeah, yeah. go ahead. Uh, yes, I just take the pleasure to introduce the panelists for this uh, session on delay analysis. Uh, Mr. Ben Burley is a managing director of the Secretariat specializing in consultancy on construction projects in the area of TV analysis. Mr. Boyle is an experienced expert and specializes in high-value complex international arbitration. Who is who legal describes Mr. Boyle as a diligent, proactive and efficient, and is on top of every detail and complicated cases. So welcome, Mr. Boyle. Uh, Mr. Vijay Simha Kasi is the Chief Operating Officer of Ultimus. He has over 35 years of experience in project management, contract management, DDA analysis, and planning. Uh, Ms. Kasi appears as a DDA expert and technical expert, cost expert in construction disputes and arbitration. Prior to working with Prost Ultimus, Mr. Kashi has worked with other organizations like NTPC, Adani, Reliance, Nancoda, and Tubro, etc. Uh, Mr. Vishal Narula is the next panelist. He is the managing director with Anderist and Marshall India in its disputes and investigations practice. His area of expertise includes disputes, <coughs> antitrust and interpretation practice, and investigations into complex frauds and financial risk statements. Ms. Naruna has about 16 years of experience and has worked over various sectors in approximately 20 different countries. Uh, we also have Ms. Promit Chatterjee, he was a principal associate of P&A Law Offices and based in Delhi. His practice is focused on international commercial arbitration and investor state disputes. He is a duly, dual qualified as an advocate in India and as a solicitor advocate in England and Wales. Higher rights of audience in all civil proceedings. We also have Mr. Adesh Kumar, who is partner with Pro Ultimus Consulting. He has about 17 years of experience and uh, is an expert in uh, planning and DA analysis. So Mr. Adarsh would also be uh, moderating the session today. I hand over to Mr. Adarsh, thank you. Um, thank you, Vannath, thank you all of you. So, um... I think Mr. Kasi could not join in a last minute uh, exigency also. So anyway, I will be covered uh, uh, 
in the delay analysis topic what mr kasi was supposed to speak on that so i would request uh, first mr ben burley who is a very renowned delay expert international delay expert and he had done quite a good matter of international arbitration like icc sisc lcii all good arbitration he had handled and he has uh, appeared uh, as a delay expert in many of the indian matters as well so he is having an experience of both indian as well as international perspective so i would request mr ben burley first to just uh, give some lights on the forensic delay analysis and i believe mr burley may speak uh, with or without slide whatever the way he uh, feel comfortable if you want to present through the slide then i will give you a presenter right and i will request uh, ciit team to give him a presenter rights thank you for the in, uh, introduction adarsh um are you, are you able to hear me okay yes loud and clear Yes, so uh, I've prepared some slides which I will briefly run through on different methodologies and the considerations of methodologies for delay analysis. So just bear with me one second and I will just share. Yes, you are still able to hear me. Right, so thank you. Thank you very much, everybody. So, as Adosh kindly introduced, I'm going to cover different methods of delay analysis. Um, so, first of all, why is delay analysis required? I mean, this this follows on from the previous session, um, and it's really to accurately assess either the contractor's relief from liquidated damages or an extension of time, but usually more importantly, is to calculate the financial losses. Um, and as we move on to the various delay analysis techniques, you will see that some of the some of the techniques only um, can only demonstrate entitlement to an extension of time, whereas others are probably more suitable to calculate financial loss, and particularly in different jurisdictions where that loss has to be actual, there are only certain methods which would be most useful, particularly where you need to demonstrate actual loss. You would need to demonstrate actual delay periods as well. And alternatively, um, the employer may look to deduct liquidated damages if they consider that the contractor isn't entitled to any extensions of time. And there may also be other cost claims that arise from the contractor's performance. So as, as with everything, you know, you need to look at what the contract says in the express terms. Um, most contracts don't expressly um, describe a delay analysis methodology as such. But you may be able to infer different methodologies should be used, as I've previously said, uh, where there's actual cost or likely cost incurred, that may dictate whether a theoretical or actual type of delay analysis is required. Uh, or where there's pre-agreed damages, uh, it may just mean that you need to identify the number of days because you're not actually looking at the, um, the period of time when any loss incurred. And that flows down into the various delay analysis te techniques of whether they're theoretical, hypothetical, uh, whether they demonstrate actual delay or, as the case may be, acceleration periods. So just putting that into graphical terms, you can see extension of time at the top, which is the number one consideration. But all of the other parts arising from delay analysis is really to do with the calculation of um, losses or damages, and essentially cost claims or prolongation. So uh, additional management on site longer than there should have been, acceleration, which is working quicker than there should have been, Disruption, loss of productivity, changes in sequence, other characteristics of the works and variations. And then the employer's claims may be liquidated damages, defects prevent an operation of a particular um, project, interface contractors for large contracts or, or multiple different sites, um, or shutdown periods if, if it's an existing facility. So just moving on now to the Society of Construction Law um, delay analysis techniques. Um, so the, the first one on there 
in the first column is the type of analysis. So that's the, the typical name applied to each of them. The second column is the understand of the cause and effect. And in there, you can see there's two, two options. There's cause and effect, or there is effect and cause. In cause and effect type analysis, um, the, the delay analyst has to identify all of the delays in which it wants to model, and then insert those into a program to work out what the effect is. So you look at the causes first, insert that into the analysis, and then look at the effect that comes out of that. And all of those are prospective uh, types of analysis that estimate the likely extent of delay, um, which, it, which is quite important because it's not the actual effective delay because it's a modeled type assessment. You then look at collapses built, which looks at the hypothetical assessment of delay, and we'll come on to the pros and cons of that later. That is essentially taking things out of the program rather than putting it in, but you still have to identify all of the causes at the outset of the analysis. You then have time slice analysis, which is effect and cause as is, as planned versus as built. Uh, the difference with these is because, because you start off with a, in our as built program or time slice program, that inherently includes the effect of any delay events. What the analyst then has to do is work back from that effect to try and identify the cause. So rather than start at the cause and work out the effect, you start at the effect and then work out the cause. And all of these are retrospective uh, types of analysis that quantify the actual period of delay. And as I said earlier, where, where you need to identify actual cost and actual loss, it's probably these two methods which would be more reasonable in those circumstances. So impact as planned analysis, the purpose of it is to determine the likely impact of a delay event, assuming it all went as planned. And what that means is that there, in, you take the baseline program, insert events, and the assumption is that everything thereafter commences as planned. Um, so it, it's a modelled assessment, looking at the likely effect of any delay it, and its perspective. The main issues with, with this type of analysis is that it's theoretical. Um, and it depends on the quality of logic in the baseline program. If the logic in the baseline program has inherent flaws, then the quality of the conclusions that arise from this theoretical and model type of analysis won't be as robust as one of the other methods. And the, the other major issue is it doesn't consider progress of the work. Now, time impact analysis is a more sophisticated version of impact as plan. And as I've just said, impact as plan didn't consider progress. Time impact analysis does. But it still has some of the same issues as impact as plan, insofar as it determines the likely impact of a delay event at the time it was instructed. So rather than look at the actual effect, it's still a theoretical type of analysis. It, Wherever there's a modelled approach, it's like any model modelling exercise. It's only as good as the parameters within that model, which in programming and delay analysis terms is generally the durations and the logic within the baseline programme or the programme used for that analysis. The issues with it are, is it's very, uh, it's expensive, yet leads to theoretical impacts. So you're still not getting to the actual period of delay and the actual loss. The third on the list is collapsed as built or but for analysis as it's called in some places. Uh, the purpose of that analysis is to uh, establish the impact, what would have happened but for the delay event. And the way that that's undertaken is rather than add in delay events, delay events are removed from the program. So you start off with an as-built program, take events out of that program, and the difference between the actual completion date 
and the completion date book for the event is the contractor's entitlement to an extension of time. Uh, the main issue is the recreation of logic relationships, particularly as built logic relationships, because um, they, they don't exist in any contemporaneous or planned program. They always have to be replicated in hindsight and retrospectively, and always for the purpose of the claim or the uh, independent analysis that's been undertaken at that point in time. So it's not based upon um, a contemporaneous assessment. And that, to me, that is one of the, 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 the largest problems of, um, it, it's very time consuming. It's not based upon that many records and it's very much down to the analysts um, skill in determining that as built logic. Uh, and the results depend on which delay events are selected to be removed. Um, if all of the delay events aren't identified at the outset and aren't removed, then the, the, the conclusions coming out of that analysis won't be as robust as other forms because you haven't assessed all of the delay events or the delay events have been selected. So just moving on now to the two retrospective time slice analyses. Um, th these are probably more common now um, in arbitration because of the retrospective nature and because in a lot of jurisdictions, the, the, the requirement to demonstrate actual costs. So um, as I've said, where, where there's actual cost, you typically have to identify actual periods of delay. Uh, the purpose is to identify actual periods of delay. The method is based upon a review of programs during the project, so it's contemporaneous. It's based upon records at the time and what parties said and did at the time. Uh, the windows are divided into time slices. Now, they can be multiple time slices. They can be uh, monthly, or they could be um, where the critical path shifts, or it could be when different programs are issued, or maybe one, one single window, but that's not very common. Um, so the, the calculation of the critical delay incurred in each window is by comparing progress through the window. So you look at what the critical path was at the beginning of the window, what the critical path was at the end of the window, and where that moves during the window, you have to identify at which point in time one part became critical, and at which point in time the other, and then assess the actual period of delay by reference to the contemporaneous records. Once those periods of delay are determined, you then have to look back through the project records, contemporaneous information, to identify what caused that delay. And that's probably where the more time consuming part is of this analysis, because it heavily relies on a robust set of project documents, records, describing what happened and why. Uh, the main issues with this are inappropriate inherent program logic, which may affect the contemporaneous or the critical path perceived by the parties at the time. And the other, as I've said, is it, it's a record-based analysis. So if there is inaccurate or differing as-built data, this may not be the best type of analysis because of that issue. As planned versus as built analysis is quite similar in, in some ways to um, the time slice or windows analysis, um, but it may be carried out under one window or broken down into multiple. Uh, the purpose is to determine the actual delays incurred during the course of the project, and it's again retrospective. You compare the as planned sequence to the as built progress, and it's observational. Apply common sense practical, practical planning and PM experience in evaluate sequence of work. So I think this is where the major difference arises between as planned versus as built and time slice analysis. Time slice analysis is more program focused, schedule and focused, whereas the as planned versus as built analysis is more based upon common sense, records, practical planning and the experience of the analyst on the take that work. Again, it's an effective cause, so very similar to that time slice analysis, 
but as I've just said, it's less reliant on the program logic and computer calculations. The issues, it requires significant effort and time consuming. Because it's less reliant on program and logic and computer calculations, the analyst has to make sure that all of their analysis can be backed up by reference to project documents and records, such that that is the time consuming part of undertaking this analysis. It relies heavily on the analyst's judgment and experience. And again, depend on how experienced that analyst is, or if they're working to demonstrate a certain issue rather than an independent analysis, then it might be used to you know, modify what, what actually happened by trying to show the critical path through different areas of the project and where it actually occurred. So that's the end of my presentation, Adosh. So I don't know if you want to take me off um, presentation mode now. Yes. So thank, uh, thank you, Mr. Bain. So um, it was a very insightful presentation. Uh, you can just close this and uh, just uh, give him a presenter right to me. I, I mean, just uh, fine, okay. So. So I remember one incident where uh, I was a delay expert and uh, I was representing the Clement and Mr. Bain was uh, responding the uh, representing the respondent side and we had a high profile international arbitration uh, of a billion dollar disputes and we had uh, prepared a joint expert report later and it was a good experience with work, working with Mr. Bain in one of the very high profile matter. Nice, Mr. Wayne, you, we are lucky to hear you once again. And our participants, all Indian part participants are getting insightful thoughts from you that uh, what are the actual delay analysis uh, from the inter international perspective as well. So now we have a, uh, our CEO, Mr. Kasi is there, who is a renowned delay expert. And he has worked earlier in such a renowned company like NTPC, Adani, Reliance, Toshiba, and McKinsey also. So I would prefer to ask one question to Mr. Kasi. Ki Mr. Kasi, you have been working with a lot of experience in uh, almost all good companies and EPC companies. So which met method of delay analysis is more suitable for the complex project? Mr. Bain has already uh, uh, explained here a lot of delay analysis methodology, but uh, complex projects like a power plant projects or oil and gas projects, which are very much complex in nature. So what kind of delay analysis would you prefer? And I would like to uh, understand from both perspective, while the project is during the execution project, uh, project, I mean, project is during the execution period, while the project has not been completed, and uh, contractor wants to submit the extension of time, and when the project has already been completed as and gone into the dispute success, then what kind of delay analysis would you prefer? Mr. Kasi, you are on mute. Yeah. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Nadar. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, so uh, I have been asked what is the best uh, suited uh, delay analysis technique for a complex projects at various stages. So uh, it's, a, it's a very difficult question to answer because the type of delay analysis uh, which uh, to be selected depends on many factors and at what stage the project is as others uh, has asked that question at what stage uh, what type of delay analysis is uh, preferable uh, generally i would prefer a prospective delay analysis method like iap if the delays have occurred at the beginning of the contract or within a short duration of notice to proceed and in case of completed projects preferred method would be retrospective analysis like as planned versus as built or uh, a time slice analysis. And uh, in case of projects which are well advanced stage of execution, a combination of prospective and ret retrospective analysis would be required. Uh, having said this, the choice of the method has to greatly depend on the many factors like availability of records, the skill sets which are present with the delay analyst and the time which is available for the delay analysis. So any retrospective analysis would require well-maintained contemporaneous records, 
which may be in the form of uh, submitted approved intermediate programs, minutes of meetings, progress reports, submitted on regular basis, updated programs, and also as built records. So if these are available, well-kept records are available, then it would be preferable to go for a retrospective analysis. And uh, uh, however, a prospective analysis would require only a well-prepared agreed baseline plan. So with the, as far as the availability of records is concerned, if the records are minimal available, availability is there, then a prospective analysis would be preferable. Another factor to be considered is availability of skill sets of delay analysts. Any retrospective analysis tends to be highly complicated and the delay analyst should be, uh, should have a good judgment and experience and skills to establish the as-built logic and the as-built critical path. So the in this in the retrospective analysis, the skill set of the delay analyst, um, not only uh, skill set of the delay analyst in other matters, uh, that is in other manner, like his judgment and experience are uh, more uh, required than his uh, skills with uh, uh, the schedule analysis that is uh, uh, that is maybe primavera or ms project the his uh, skills with uh, software may not be that much required whereas for a prospective analysis if the skill set required would be more of uh, the uh, his uh, skills with uh, software okay and uh, another met another uh, factor is the availability of time so any uh, prospective any retrospective analysis would require great amount of time because so many records have to be gone through and with the judgment and the experience the as built uh, uh, logics and as built critical path will have to be created so this requires uh, uh, sufficient time and if the delay analyst doesn't get that much time it would not be worthwhile to go for such an analysis and uh, in that case, it would be preferable to go for a, a analysis, a prospective analysis. So, uh, so in the uh, conclusion, I can say that uh, it's not a straightforward uh, uh, thing that we select a particular delay analysis method if the project is in the beginning or in the middle or in the end. But it would uh, it, we have to take into consideration many factors in selecting the right type of delay analysis. Uh, thank you, Mr. Kasi. As far as my experience, we have experienced that mostly in the uh, completed projects. Uh, as you correctly said that uh, during the completed projects, we usually prefer the as plan versus as built analysis, uh, which is a retrospective in nature, because uh, we have experienced mostly in the ICC arbitration and uh, international arbitration uh, impacted as a plan. Uh, methodology which is most contractor centric i would say it is the most favorable to the contractor or it is a so called as a biased kind of analysis so it yeah. is not relying in the most of the international arbitration iap is not very much recommended of course during the execution of the project uh, sometimes we prefer ki what is the anticipated date of completion of the projects and where the project is going and we do prefer iap impacted as a plan but uh, in my experience yes uh, most of the uh, international projects, completed projects, which are in the dispute and arbitration, uh, either they prefer retrospective analysis as planned versus as built or, uh, or other methodology, what Mr. Bain has suggested earlier, but all are in ret retrospective nature, not the prospective analysis. Yeah, yeah definitely right. retrospective analysis, as I said in the beginning, retrospective is preferable. Uh, but if we don't have the records or if we don't have the time uh, or the skill sets, then we need to get that uh, unless it is available then uh, it may not be worthwhile conducting a retrospective analysis like in uh, indian conditions we have observed that the records are not available in many cases and yeah. records are not well kept so in such cases it may not be worthwhile to go for retrospective analysis and also as you as you know that uh, many cases the client wants the delay analysis to be done within a one week or few days time so in such a deadline, it's not possible to do retrospective analysis. I agree, Mr. Kasi. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Thank you for your insight. Thank you.
uh, you are not audible you are not audible hmm. i'm sorry so uh, thank you mr kasi um, for your insightful thoughts so now i would like to put up one questions to mr visal who is having a vast experience of working in a almost good consulting firm so mr visal i just want to put up a one questions you what is the difference in a delay expert and a forensic delay expert how does the work differ because many people get confused with the forensic delay analysis and the delay analysis and one and the same they understand that they are one and the same so i would definitely uh, prefer you just can, can you clarify that you what are the difference between those i think i think fundamentally um, there are very similar i would say but the difference would be and i can explain this through an analogy you know if you don't feel well you go to a general practitioner to say i'm not feeling well is there something wrong and a gp and say would say you probably need to do some tests you carry out the test the gp sees the result and says this looks like um and say if it is if it is a malignancy or or a suspected malignancy says maybe you need to go to an oncologist or a specialist who needs to determine whether this is a malignancy or not well an oncologist is like a delay expert who would be able to determine and say yes there has been there is a malignancy or there is a delay and there is a problem uh it could be that say in a certain area of of the human body uh, you know there is a specialist oncologist as well like someone who specializes in 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 tumors of the lungs or the brain and says because this affects the lungs why would you visit another oncologist who is a specialist in uh, cancer of the lungs and is also a specialist surgeon who knows the, the right treatment to take so a forensic delay expert is that level of specialization you know all of everybody is qualified so all of them have the right skills as well but when it comes to pointing out forensically whether or not there are facts that back any kind of uh, a claim for a delay or whether or not there are facts that stand the test of evidence in a forum like a court in in a litigation or or an arbitral tribunal in case of an arbitration and whether or not you have the evidence to say something has happened or not happened then you need to be able to determine that evidence and if it is fact based you should be able to determine it in a forensically sound manner so so why all are qualified and might also have the similar skills and you know there are some forensic experts who take the help of delay experts in some extremely technical matters as well you know for example if there is a chemical process you know where uh, there is something very very specific that has been changed and there are chemical reasons to change it one you know some something that is deep in chemistry uh, a delay expert or a forensic expert or quantum expert would want to consult someone who's who's a, a professor in chemistry or someone who's been in that field in chemistry for many many years and can put a, a expert opinion to an expert opinion to say whether this was required not required or if there was a work around you know or a mitigation in that sense so all of these things become uh, rather more kind of specialized so in the end i would say that a forensic delay expert is someone who would use facts and evidences to support all the analysis of delays that has happened and then go on to quantify whether there is any loss or any damages that needs to be computed basis what is being claimed by by a claimant you know so there are many times i can tell you from my experience it has so happened that claims have said there has been a delay this is not our fault and i can show you a piece of paper that demonstrate that i had raised an issue but when we forensically determine other communications like letters or emails that would have been exchanged we realize that maybe it was a strategy gone bad you know so what is the evidence that one needs to put forward to say that this is not your fault you know so as an independent forensic expert i would say listen there are facts contrary to what you are claiming and therefore should you really claim this or not and as an independent expert i would be inclined to say this was bound to happen any which ways and therefore you should not be using this as a head of a claim or there could be new facts that come to play that probably that the claimant would not even know and a forensic expert would say that while the claimant says there are certain inactions of of uh, uh, the other party because of which a delay has happened or any loss has happened but to corroborate that there are these sequence of events documents communications 
uh, actual data, you know, from project accounting, from inventory accounting, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, that can be put forward to corroborate that it is probably even more than what the claimant thought it was. So facts become the foundation of the claim, and therefore a forensic delay expert combines the forensic uh, aspect of finding facts, the delay expert aspects of finding out the delays and the quantum expert uh, uh, methodologies to then put in a quantum. So it's it's that just highest level of specialization, which I would say would be uh, more than just an oncologist, would be say an oncologist of the specific area of the body where you have the tumor in that sense. So, you know, I'm, I'm, I, I hope I've answered that with some clarity. Uh, Mr. Vizal, you have given an excellent analogy, and I, I think that this analogy is very, very easy to understand instead of giving a technical explanation. So people will, uh, can easily understand the differences between two. And just a one quickly follow-up question, uh, as you uh, emphasized all these things on a forensic way of analysis, so uh, what I understood that or what we understood that we are expert in the software like Primavera and Microsoft Project, where we can do a lot of uh, analysis on a critical path analysis, which is not can be concluded on the basis of the paper, letters and all these things, because these are the factual things. Delay has happened, it can be proven through the letters and various do uh, records, documents, monthly progress report, daily progress report, and so many uh, other documents which can be e easily established. But whether those delays are critical delay or not, I think the software can only assist to finding out the critical delay. So how do you take it up? Like forensic delay analysis, do you always work with the software delay? I mean, normal delay expert who are very good in a software or how do you prefer usually? I think I think you've raised a larger point is about using technology in, in right. the whole aspect of uh, you know, uh, quantifying, uh, assessing delays, quantifying claims, etc. I can tell you, it has become indispensable today. You know, so we do rely on experts such as you who use softwares like a Prime Aware or a Microsoft projects to understand whether there is any overall impact. You know, which should eventually result in a claim or not. So, for example, you might have a claimant say that, you know, we were not provided the materials on time or the design on time because of which there is a delay and we have a loss of opportunity, right? But what if that had no impact on the project at all? You know, or what if, what if there was mitigation possible which you did not do? Or what if apart the apart from a delay that has happened, there are other implications because of which you have a bigger loss that you've not even thought about? So, like I say, it could go from one end of the spectrum to the other or lie anywhere in the middle. Only technology can help in building all scenarios together. Like you mentioned about softwares that are used on delay, there are softwares that also help in going through millions of documents. You know, that could be either in the form of electronic communications or emails, or that could be even going through hard copies which can be transcribed, made searchable, and you can rely on all the relevant parts of all the documents that tell you, uh, are you in consistency with what you have been saying? This is your facts, your, your communications, and, and all the documents that you have collated. Or have you missed out on something that helps you make your case stronger? Or is there something to the contrary that makes your case even weaker? I think. It is technology that can help you effectively meet timelines, make sure you're accurate, and make sure that you've taken a 360 degree view of all possible scenarios, and not just the one that you feel because you're aggrieved and you're, you have a loss, but you had a 360 degree approach, you looked around every single corner and made sure that you actually not put forward something that's detrimental to your own interest. It is only technology, you know, and tools like relativity are the ones that lawyers use all over the world in all sorts of matters. With some specialist tools like Nuix for making it searchable, you know, and other contract management tools that can immediately throw out all the relevant documents that you need to look at. Technology is absolutely indispensable, you know. So working with you, uh, where you use tools like Primavera, is now become a standard operating procedure or a methodology in the process of of calculating damages or claims on on delays, you know, in in a delays claim. 
thank you visal and uh, sorry th thank you uh, for giving such kind of uh, information and to, in today's world technological disruptions nobody can deny it. and in every uh, area technological disruption is too much and without the help of technology it is very very difficult to establish certain facts and certain analysis uh, which cannot be done manually. Uh, we also utilize all kind of latest technology, including Primavera, and we have experienced also, unlike Indian contract, uh, in international contract, uh, at the time of contract form uh, formulation, um, it is clearly mentioned that you have to use Primavera as a, a programming software to develop the program. Uh, sometimes it is written there, but in India, of course, uh, uh, during I mean, especially in a small contractor, they develop the program in uh, Primavera, but they do not rigorously follow during the execution of the project, month on month update. So we usually face that, that kind of challenges also. So sometimes we recreate the baseline schedule or we recreate the updated schedule also based on the certain documents. So definitely I would uh, second with you that technology is uh, gonna help a lot in any kind of analysis and it would be a giving a more and more accurate analysis. And I just add one point to that, you know, in that same thing, if when you use Primavera, we rely on people like you to 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 do to scenario building to say had this instant not happened, what would have been the impact? What would would the critical path have drastically changed? Would it cause any other unforeseen delays that probably we are missing out on? And all of those scenario building are uh, very very important when you get cross examined as an expert to know that you have considered all of this, and yeah. because you have considered this and you have used technology, you are able to. Tell an arbitral tribunal or an arbitrator or, you know, or, or in a litigation, you know, a bench that, you know, I have considered all of this. My work is complete because I am an expert. I have not missed out looking around the corners and I know that even if this would not have happened, you would still be on the same position or a better position, which I have already focused on and and therefore I have given you say a range of claims that what is the best case scenario, most realistic scenario, the worst case scenario that would have happened because I have done all of this exercise in the past. So relying on, you know, uh, uh, people like you who are able to help us with the scenario building using technology is now become indispensable for an expert like me who needs to be prepared from all angles in, in a expert testimony scenario. Thanks, Mr. Thanks. So thanks, Vishal. So now we have a one very young, prominent lawyer, uh, Mr. Promet, uh, who is having a vast experience in working in India as well as in Singapore also. And uh, he has probably used so many, uh, he have engaged so many experts, delay and quantum expert in various matters. And uh, as far as uh, in international arbitration is concerned, uh, usually in institutional arbitration, they always encourage uh, expert to be engaged, whether it is a delay expert, quantum expert, or technical experts. So I would prefer uh, to ask one question, Mr. Promet. Uh, so uh, just want to understand the role of expert at which state uh, stage uh, should be engaged. I mean, expert can be engaged uh, during the preparation of the statement of claim or at the witness stage. So what is your point of view? Usually at what stage you engage experts? Thanks, Adarsh. Mr. Pramit, over to you. Yeah. Thanks, Adarsh. So usually in India, there's a prevalence of pleading style arbitrations, which we see, uh, where the first the statement of claim is filed and after all pleadings are concluded, all pleadings are completed, do we go to the stage of witness statements? And in international arbitration, the style is slightly different. We follow memorial styles where we file witness statements along with and at the time of the statement of claim. Now, irrespective of which style uh, an Indian arbitrator is following, uh, we as lawyers always suggest uh, uh, the client to engage an expert at the time of drafting the statement of claim itself, uh, whether or not the witness statement is filing, being filed at the same time. Uh, the reason, uh, frankly, is because um, the earlier we engage an expert, uh, the earlier we get to know and get clarity as to what are the events of delay, the cause of delay, as well as the uh, likely man hours uh, which are involved here. And that greatly informs the formulation of the claim by the lawyers. And uh, if we get the expert's input at that formulation of a claim stage, uh, then as lawyers, we do not have to face the uncomfortable situation of even having to drop a claim at a later stage. Uh, because maybe we file a statement of claim in a pleading cell arbitration and the time of expert doing his analysis, they come back to us saying uh, that a particular claim 
uh, will not be much meritorious uh, based on their analysis. So from that perspective, I would definitely suggest that we bring in an independent expert as early as possible. Now, this is obviously when we're discussing about independent experts. Uh, experts or uh, claim analysts can also have a different role where they uh, more act as advisors to the lawyers and advisors to the clients. In that situation, we often even find that uh, experts or claim analysts are used at the time of even drafting uh, notices, uh, which sort of initiate the whole claim process. Uh, but we have to be very mindful as lawyers as to uh, how much of exposure those claim analysts have uh, while the uh, arbitration starts. And maybe we would want to have a sort of a six degrees of separation between that claim analyst and the team or the expert who will be testifying in the arbitration just so that there's no contamination of the two particular teams. <coughs> it is fine for the same expert consulting firm to provide both these services, so long as uh, th th there is a strict separation between the team. Uh, the former analysts will mostly act as extension of the counsel team, uh, helping the counsel and the client to formulate the best foot forward, uh, whereas the other independent expert uh, uh, will give a more neutral assessment. Uh, that's my view, Adish. Thanks, Pramit, uh, for sharing your view. And uh, you are the one of the young lawyers who are having experience of working in India as well as in Singapore. So it's uh, quite uh, enriching experience. So uh, I would like to ask one more question to Mr. Kasi. Uh, Mr. Kasi, uh, you know, I like a like, uh, uh, million dollar question is like a concurrent delay, which is a very hot topic in any delay analysis. And, and um, concurrent delay uh, is the part and parcel of any projects. I don't believe that any projects cannot be uh, without concurrent delay means uh, solely attributable to the employer or solely attributable to the contractor. It is very, very difficult. So I just would like to understand ki how do you establish the concurrent delay? Uh, I know it's a very complex topic and it cannot be answered in a just quickly two, three minutes, but just I would like to uh, answer, uh, I would like to answer you just uh, very quickly. Uh, what are the fundamentals there? Mr. Kasi, you are on mute. Yeah. So, uh, so Adarsh, uh, as you know, the concurrent delay is, uh, as you yourself said, it's, uh, it, uh, it's, uh, it involves uh, that is uh, uh, much uh, uh, that is time and uh, analysis required for uh, uh, for finding out the concurrent delays, <laughs> and the concurrent delay exists in all the projects, as you rightly said. And uh, it depends on uh, finding the concurrent delay is important because uh, on that it rests whether the delay is uh, compensable or not. So if concurrent delays exist, then that delay may not be compensable. So it, it is quite important from that angle. And uh, uh, finding concurrent delay in, in case of say we are using the prospective analysis say at the beginning of the project is there we are using prospective analysis then finding concurrent delay is a, uh, a, it involves uh, maybe we have to insert once uh, the uh, iap has to be done with uh, contractor delay events and again do the iap with the employer delay events and then compare the project completion date where they are going and then the difference of that could be the concurrent delay even though it may not be the exact thing because in a, a prospective uh, type of analysis, you cannot exactly find the concurrency of the delays. So uh, this is one part, but if you are using a retrospective analysis, then the uh, it's a, it requires a study of the contemporaneous doc documents. So study of con contemporaneous documents is uh, the best way to find out the concurrency of the delays. So, so uh, these are the two methods available for finding the concurrencies. Right. So uh, good. Uh, I mean, uh, I think uh, concurrent delay is the actually bone of contentions between employer and the contractor because yeah. employer also wants to prove that most of the delays are concurrent, so that they, as you correctly said, that the concurrent mm -hmm. delay in the Indian, uh, as far as my information, it is not a compensable. So uh, def definitely, uh, maybe at some different point of view somewhere, but uh, mostly uh, concurrent delay is never being compensated by the employer. 
uh, uh, yes, of course, extension of time is being granted in terms mm. of time, but not in terms of money. So, fine. So, from it, just uh, one quick view. Uh, I would like to understand that uh, how do you uh, understand? Is there the same uh, parameters in India as well as uh, uh, Singapore also that uh, concurrent delay are not being compensated, or is there a different kind of judgment or different kind of uh, some precedence where uh, in some particular cases concurrent delay has also been compensated? Is there anything? No, there's the side in home thing. <laughs> Sorry, there's the Siding Homes judgment in Singapore, uh, which basically say that uh, the contract can provide for risk allocation. Um, so in normal circumstances, if there's a concurrent delay, then uh, we would understand that both parties are equally responsible for the delay and therefore LD clause cannot be triggered. Uh, but of course, uh, since ultimately uh, we are all creatures of contract, so the contract can specify that in case of a concurrent delay, uh, the risk of such delay will be borne by the contractor and such a contractual provision will not be seen as onerous uh, by the courts. There is a Singapore judgment in this regard and I have no reason to believe that Indian courts will also interpret this any, in any different manner. So um, while an employer is drafting the contract, uh, it's very important that uh, the employer uh, practice in as many scenarios as possible and uh, tries to put in suitable wording. Uh, because uh, whatever the contractor agrees with, ultimately they have to abide by uh, such terms, uh, irrespective of whether it's fair or not. Thanks, Pramit. Thanks. So, uh, just I'm gonna last. Uh, I'm gonna ask a very last questions. Uh, we are running behind the schedule. Uh, so, I, I would like to ask these questions to Mr. Visa, uh, Vishal. Uh, Mr. Vishal, uh, there, there is a very again confusing terms. Ki what is the difference between the statement of claim usually prepared by the lawyer? And what is the uh, uh, and the claim prepared by the quantum expert? So, what do you think that what, where is the difference between these two terms? Also, it looks like a similar like uh, statement of claim and a claim prepared by the expert. So, 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 so very quickly, a statement of claim prepared by lawyers is usually what the claimant says that uh, that the claimant believes should be the claim. But it is not an independent uh, assessment of what the claim should be because of the facts. That can be put forward as as the um, as undisputable in that sense. So what happens is when a forensic delay expert forensically finds the facts, assesses whether or not there are facts to support any claim head of claim of a claimant, and if yes, what is the extent? What is the quantum? What are other factors to be considered? Like what are the mitigations that are possible, or if it is about future losses, you know, because of say continuing delays or opportunity loss or anything of that sort, what are the other industry factors to be considered? Whether the amount of loss that is being claimed by a claimant is as per what is known in from an industry perspective to be justifiable or not in that sense. So, for example, you know, what would be the number of hours you can use a certain machinery that that has been deployed and it wasn't used and you still paid the cost and you know what would have been normal, what would have been the normal downtimes and so on and so forth. When when a forensic uh, 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 delay expert <laughs> does this exercise, a forensic delay expert gives comfort to the arbitral tribunal that as an expert, Every single piece of information that is relevant to determine whether or not there is a claim, if yes, how much it should have been has been considered without getting biased on either sides, whether the whether the opposite party or the defending party, the arbitral tribunal gets a comfort to rely on someone who's a friend of the arbitral tribunal. So that is the difference between a statement of claim, which is I say versus what you say. Versus a, a forensically sound uh, claim basis uh, experts computation, you know. So it it is as good as you know. I'll go back to the analogy that I gave. It's as good as me telling a doctor I need a surgery, whereas a doctor saying, "Are you mad? I can give you chemotherapy. You don't need surgery. It is first stage cancer, and you'll be fine. You don't need to do something so intrusive, you know." Or or I say. Telling the doctor, I think I'm fine, I don't need any medicine. Whereas the doctor saying, you're taking a risk with your life. You know, it's as good as that. So it is that expert who really knows every nitty gritty from a 
technical perspective, commercial perspective, financial perspective, telling the arbitral tribunal, this is what the range of the claim should be. Everything considered, don't worry, rely on this. I testify on this as an expert. That is the difference between a statement of claim and a experts uh, computation or quantum experts computation. Thanks, Vishal. It's uh, again superb analogy, and that is why you correctly said that ki in my experience, most of the institutional arbitration they always encourage experts. I have uh, experienced that any CIAC matter or ICC matter or LCIA matter, they definitely engage a quantum expert, and it is a part of procedural timetable also. And apart from that, uh, with due respect, uh, we also experience many times that uh, whatever the statement of claim filed by the lawyer, it are uh, these are the exaggerated claims. And in our experience, if you uh, uh, contractor claims 100 rupees, end of the day award comes around 40, 50 or 45 rupees, something like that. So just 50% of the claims. So being as an independent expert, we try to just give a picture of the tenable claims. And most of the times uh, we our claim computation is lesser than what it is being filed in the statement of claim and definitely it's a very rare cases that uh, sometimes the lawyer has missed out some uh, claims which is untenable uh, in nature then we uh, suggest our client or lawyer that this can be additional claim but it is a very rare uh, rarest of the rare case it 90 percent or 95 percent time we have seen that uh, a statement of claim is a higher side and it is an exaggerated claim and others so, if on a later note i can just say you know in our profession as as experts you know, we have a saying, if you do a good job, your client will remember it. But if you do a bad job, your client will remember it even more. So you might have to do a good job and do something that is right and, and do something, you know, that is technically sound, independent, that makes sure that your reputation, your client's interest and and the and justice is prevails in that sense, you know. So your job is to make sure that the right thing happens and, and not just, you know, uh, siding with any one of the parties in that case. So, right, uh, right. Very correct. So with uh, this, uh, definitely we would like to conclude this session because we are running behind the time and uh, the late has been carried out since uh, inaugural session itself. So uh, I would like to thank you uh, all the panelists, Mr. Bain, Mr. Kasi, Mr. Promet and Mr. Vishal. And uh, again, apology that we could not uh, take up the audience questions, we would love to answer them through email because of the paucity of time, it's difficult to take up their questions. Thank you. Thank you all of you. And we will quickly move to the next sessions, which is a very, very interesting sessions and hot topic in arbitration and a lot of legal stalwarts from across the globe are participating in that sessions. And I really urge all the participants to don't miss out this sessions, which is really, really the best sessions in my view in the entire today's sessions which is covering the lot of very hot topics. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. It was a pleasure being Thanks. here and, and Thanks. nice speaking Thanks. to all of you. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, everybody. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. So uh, I believe uh, all the panelists of the next sessions are here. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can see Marian. Can you hear uh, me? I can you see, me? see Mr. Sarma, Atul Sarma. I can see, um, I think again, uh, Anna, uh, there are six panelists in this sessions. Yes, uh, Niti is there. Dr. Manoj Kumar, I'm unable to see. And Mr. Amit K. Misra also, he's not there. Could I check that you can hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Thanks. That's thanks. all that ever worries. <laughs> so I think this session has uh, is behind the schedule. So let me check uh, quickly. Uh, Niti, can you help me out to check with Mr. Hiro Adwani? He is the moderator of this session. So if you can quickly check him with. Can you hear me out? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you.
Maryan. Hello, Mr. Sharma. How are you? Very well. How are you, Niti? Very good. Thanks. I think Hero is just joining us. He messaged me. He should be joining in about a minute. Yes. Let me check uh, Dr. Manoj also and Mr. Uh, Amit. How long will we run for? I'm hoping 40 minutes or 45 minutes as allotted to us. <laughs> no, no, it's a, a apology from our side that uh, the first session uh, has been prolonged and the delayed has been carry forwarded. Uh, like, uh, of course, in the last minute confirmation by Mr. Uh, Nagendra Nath Sina, who was the Secretary Ministry of uh, uh, Rural Development. And because earlier we had planned only two, uh, guest, uh, one guest of honor and one chief guest. So definitely the first session took 15, 20 minutes more and that for, uh, then half an hour session delayed and it's still continuing. So my apology. You give a mic to the locals and we'll stop it. So yeah, don't worry about it. No worries. Let me quickly check both of them one minute. You can't deprive lawyers of our opportunity to speak. I <laughs> <laughs> never trust a lawyer's time. So, Vandana, I just uh, I would appreciate that in the meantime, the other two panelists join. You can start uh, giving a short introductions to uh, all of the panelists, and then uh, probably in the uh, Mr. Hiru and Mr. Amit and Dr. Manoj can join quickly in the meantime. Uh, Vandana, yes, thank you, you Adarsh. Yeah. yeah, thank you, Adarsh. Uh, I take pleasure in. Introducing the panelists for today's uh, session panel. Uh, Ms. Marian Smith is a barrister and an arbitrator specializing in complex, high value commercial and construction disputes in UK and with international clients. She has extensive experience as counsel before domestic courts and tribunals as well as in international arbitration. The leading 500 Asia specific for construction, where she is described as an amazing first class barrister who is organized and excellent at managing a team of lawyers and experts. We also have Mr. Hiro Advani. He is a highly regarded name and called authority on arbitration law and is one of the only two Indian lawyers ever listed in the international who's who of commercial arbitrators. Recognized as a leading dispute resolution lawyer by Legal 500, India and an A-list lawyer by India Business Law Journal. Mr. Advani has been known to have a fantastic success rate in arbitrations and a record of having won large number of multi-million dollar awards in international as well as in domestic proceedings. Mr. Atul Sharma is the managing partner of Link Legal with over four decades of experience in project advisory, corporate litigation, mediation, arbitration, including international commercial arbitration. Mr. Sharma is highly ranked and recommended by various domestic and global directories such as RSG, Chambers, and partners, the Legal 500 Benchmark Litigation, IFRL 1000, Asia Specific Profiles, India Business Law Journal, Asian Legal Business in the Practice Areas of Aviation, Arbitration, Litigation, Dispute Resolution, and Projects, Infrastructure, and Energy. Dr. Manoj Kumar is the founder and managing partner, Hamurabai and Solomon Partners. Confer the prestigious Mahatma Gandhi Summit at the House of Lords, London. Dr. Kumar is a top tier name in construction law, conflict management, ADR, and mediation, energy, environment, natural resources, infra, and legal estate, corporate MA and policy and regulation space. We ha also have Ms. Neeti Sachdeva. Neeti is the Secretary General and Registrar and MCIA and also acts as an arbitrator. She's currently an office member at IBA Arbitration Committee. She has extensively worked in the field of construction commercial arbitration, both as a private practitioner representing clients and as an administrator facilitating the dispute resolution process. Neeti's past professional experience includes working with some of the top Indian law firms. She has also worked at International Arbitration Department of Fresh Fields at the Paris office, besides being judicial clerk for Justice Geeta Mittal and Justice Mudidhar of Delhi High Court. We then have Mr. Amit Mishra. Mr. Amit is a graduate of NUJS Kolkata and is head of the dispute resolution practice at PNA Law Offices, heading the litigation and arbitration practice. Mr. Amit has handled high-stake construction and infrastructure disputes in SIAC, 
NCIA, ICC, government arbitrations. He represents many clients in the investment arbitration matters involving arbitration infrastructure related disputes. So I welcome all the panelists and I uh, hand it over to Mr. Lee, who is the moderator today. Um, good evening. Um, good afternoon, everybody. I hope I'm audible. Yes, sir. Loud and clear. Okay. Um, this is this is a session that does not consist of construction claims and arbitrations, and it's a little more general. And yes, we are probably in line with the last session about the delay forensics. So that uh, I'm not going to comment on that, um, and I'm not responsible for any of the delays here. So there are no concurrent delays. Uh, we have a very very eminent panel. <laughs> And the first one, the first issue that we're dealing with is about interim relief inside of the section 9 and 17 of Arbitration Conciliation Act. Some very brief comments from me before I bring my panelists on. I think section 9 works very, very well in India, and the courts have been fairly responsive to urgent issues, not so urgent issues, and dealt with it quite well. And although our law commission had recommended the use of emergency arbitrators, uh, ultimately the parliament rejected it and emergency arbitrators have no uh, role to play in India, apart from the Amazon one, which we'll come to next. I find section nine, because it deals with both international and domestic arbitration, works exceedingly well. And I don't think, um, in fact, there is a need for an emergency arbitrator in India. Section 17, of course, has now become standard where the arbitrators have all the facts and they can consider appropriate reliefs uh, when necessary. As we know, in India, courts are very, very delayed and uh, interim relief plays such a critical part that uh, the interim relief almost solves half most of the litigations. Not so in arbitration because India is one of the few jurisdictions, in fact, which have now put time limits on the arbitration. Um, it's, it's, they started with 12 months, it's now gone to 18 months, and it works quite well. And um, of course, the minute you start an arbitration, most lawyers will al already ask, most arbitrators will already ask you for an extension. We have now gone into a practice of refusing that. So we're not prepared to give an extension unless it becomes critical towards the end. And let's see the progress and give an extension. But it's become an arbitral practice in India to say, let's agree on the extension to start it because we know it's not practical. I don't agree with that theory and philosophy. So I think that arbitrators should be able to handle section 17 and section 9 arbitrations accordingly. Um, having said those preliminary comments, um, I know. Um, Neeti is uh, there from an institutional point of view. She is the head of the MCIA. So maybe we can ask her her views on that issue. Thank you, Hiru. Um, let me start off some discussion and probably taking a contrary view to what you think. I think that emergency arbitration, emergency arbitrator plays a very vital Though I do not deny the fact that the courts can play an important role, they have been doing it for a long time. But I think there are three specific reasons as to why uh, we should think of amending legislation once more and, and having an emergency arbitrator, or at least taking in what from the court has said in the Amazon dispute. And the three reasons I would say is that one, um, we all have said that our, one of the biggest arbit advantages of arbitration remains the confidentiality. Now, if even before you begin arbitration, the parties have to go in a section nine court, I think somewhere the confidentiality gets diluted at that instance, instance itself. Second, I would say is that that um, section nine petition that they could easily be moved on to you know, uh, emergency arbitrator. You're definitely taking away the load of the court. We all have read no practically experienced at how the Indian courts are clogged with so many matters. And if at least these could be taken away and you can have an ad interim injunction granted by an emergency arbitrator, then why not? And the third point I would say that I'd support it is, uh, especially international commercial applications, um, you know, which are seated in India or even if not seated 
India, we know that part, section 9 is now available to parties. But then why go to a court? As an international party, I may not want to be before an Indian court. I would want to be before an emergency arbitrator to get, get my uh, relief. So those would be my three points to say that I would be in support of an emergency arbitrator provision. Thank you, Niti. Uh, uh, Atul, if you're online, can we have your views on the matter? Yeah, Hiru, uh, thank you. Um, I'm tempted to quote Lord Mustard in Kopi versus Lebanon, uh, which is 1994 Lloyd's report. And here they say there's plainly a tension here. On the one hand, the concept of arbitration as a consensual process reinforced by the ideas of transnationalism leans against the involvement of the mechanisms of the state through the medium of municipal court. On the other side, there is a plain fact, palatable or not, that it is only the court processing coercive power which could reserve the arbitration if it is in danger of foundering. So now this clearly describes the balance between the powers of the court and the powers of the tribunal. Now, in the Indian context, you see, having brought Section 17 in very materia, exactly in the same language as Section 9, there is absolutely no doubt that both have the same powers. And particularly the amendment which categorically says that they would, because Section 9 itself, as well as now Section 17 uses the language that it will act wherever the arbitrator or the court, they will act, they will act in as if it is a court. So all the principles governing interlocutory reliefs, preservation, etc., etc., would be available to both. In the for the emergency arbitration, I tend to agree here that in the context of the proactive attitude of the Indian courts under Section 9, well, emergency arbitration may not have a great practical value in the Indian context. You can get a notice of motion taken out in the morning, and next morning or maybe the same afternoon, you can have the interlocutory relief which is required, necessary for ensuring that whatever is the subject matter of the arbitration is preserved. So I believe that emergency arbitrations may be as a concept uh, uh, relevant, but at the end of the day, the powers ident are identical, whether it's the tribunal or it's the court. Um, thank you, Atul. Uh, Manoj, can we have your views on the matter? Sorry, is Manoj online or? You are on mute, sir. Mr. Manoj, you are on mute. Ah, okay. Am I audible now? Yeah. 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 Thank you, Hiro. And of course, uh, with your permission, uh, since you are chairing the discussion today, I'll just take a rain check and drop out around 2.30 because of the delay or something else. Coming back to, uh, you know, the, the discussion around emergency arbitrations, I think uh, I would want to grant Neeti the fact that, of course, party autonomy and confidentiality is something that is better catered to in, in emergency arbitrations. But I would want to step, uh, take a step back because the case in point we have just now, the kind of experience we've had with the Amazon versus future retail dispute, the way it has panned out. I think there are a lot more questions yet open to be asked about the uh, you know scope and ambit and how emergency arbitration should be recognized, uh, you know, having seen the Supreme Court judgment as well. I mean, uh, the way it has uh, panned out is almost literally uh, uh, as if it is an arbitration versus competition, uh, compliance of local uh, policy and legal issues, the whole ability of Amazon to do a certain business in India. Now, Section 9 versus uh, reading emergency arbitration into 17, the way it has been read into now, my uh, case would be completely that I think uh, emergency arbitration in the institutions, SIAC as well as others who have built it in their rules. I think India is not ready, the Indian system is not ready till the law itself is amended because the institutions are not able to be cognizant of uh, you know, certain uh, uh, violations of local laws and policies by parties to the dispute and therefore they would want to quarantine and just look within the dispute of the contract, uh, which is not something the case when uh, proceedings at the nine is brought before an Indian court. So I think we are slightly premature on this, although the judgment is welcome. It's a Supreme Court judgment, but we're slightly premature on this. We need to do a lot more thinking 
there, there has to be a reason why the law commission's 246 uh, recommendation was not accepted, why the Sri Krishna Committee recommendations were not accepted, why 9 and 17 have been kept completely identical, and therefore, uh, you know, only the courts have been allowed under the Indian uh, law to step in before the uh, stage of constitution of the tribunal. Uh, so, I, I think there's a lot more thought that needs to be going in rather than uh, just accepting a surgical inclusion of emergency arbitration uh, within the scope of 17. Uh, that, that's kind of my two bits. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Manoj. Um, I think fairly evenly divided on this issue. But I think it's what is relevant to note is that Neeti, who is a part of an institution, is all for it. And some of us who are lawyers who are practicing in the court and arbitration um, don't yet feel the need for an emergency arbitrator. Having said that, our next issue is um, emergency arbitrator. Is there any standard for granting of uh, interim relief? Having said that, I must say I have personally not had much experience of emergency arbitrator except having the Amazon um, uh, judgment before us, which in fact in India confirmed that an emergency arbitrator is a regular arbitrator, is permissible, and his decisions are acceptable. The low court, Justice Mida, confirmed it thumpingly with all kinds of costs and attachment of assets as well. And the Supreme Court also confirmed that the Singapore, if it's an institutional arbitration, an emergency, you all opted uh, for this uh, for institutional arbitration, which provides an emergency arbitrator. So it is completely legitimate and the, cla the clause must sign. One of the issues that I don't think was gone into depth was the fact that in this particular case, Future was barred from doing uh, any further deals with Reliance. Now that has an element of anti-competitiveness. Anti-competitiveness is a uh, part of legislation and not necessarily a part of arbitration. So in that context, um, Marion, if you're online, can we hear your views as an English lawyer and a very prominent <coughs> English QC? If you had a chance to look at the Amazon judgment, what do you think of it? And does the anti-competitive element come into the issue at all in any manner or not? Thank you very much, um, Hiru, for your generous introduction. And thank you, Ardesh, for inviting me to be part of this. I am very aware that I am not Indian qualified, and I have a very eminent panel here who will explain the Amazon and Future Group. Can I share, um, taking up your invitation, can I share sort of three thoughts about this? Anecdotally, I hear that emergency arbitration is chaotic. It's, and I can see everyone's nodding their heads. It's done under huge time pressure for the tribunal and for the parties. And it seems to me remarkable that a dispute of this size, Amazon and Future Group, actually in, it takes connection with the emergency arbitration process. It seems almost unthinkable that it would. Secondly, can I ask you this question? How popular, how frequently is emergency arbitration actually used in India? I went and looked at the LCIA statistics. That's the London Court of International Arbitration. It's an institution that has offered emergency arbitration for a number of years. It said that for 2020, there had been an increase three only three appointed i wonder how popular it is and i'd be very interested in hearing what your experience is in india is it being used or is this supreme court decision a um picking on a minority sport uh, lastly i want to know this it's being reported in the united kingdom as being a breakthrough for India as cementing India as an arbitration friendly uh, jurisdiction, which is, of course, the badge that all of us want. That's how it's being reported in the UK and Europe. It's being widely reported. It seems to me that's the right 
reading of it but do you all agree is that how you see it so like a typical Anything. lawyer you ask me a question and i ask three <laughs> thank you marion um i i still remember reading one english decision where in fact um one of the there was an in, encashment of a bank guarantee where one of the parties asked that look to the english court can you please hold up your decision while i move an emergency arbitrator to hold up the bank guarantee and the english court said certainly not <laughs> um, anyway having, having said that maybe manoj i i understand you on a hurry can you give your views on this yes sure it, uh, uh, this uh, whole issue particularly in amazon is essentially uh, the negative covenant that uh, uh, you know future cannot sign up with reliance and go ahead with the marriage they are proposing and along with that of course the counter flip side of that is i want to flag the other legal gap there is violation of the ecom norms uh, with respect to uh, you know carrying on retail trade so amazon is kind of uh, 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 trying to the way it has turned out i'm not uh, speaking as a brief for future or anyone but what appears is that through the emergency arbitration route by taking it to a foreign seat and completely looking beyond or not looking at some essential aspects they're trying to uh, come in the way of the competition commission the competition law in india as much as all other laws in the companies act which permit certain marriages to happen by way of amalgamation restructurings so there's definitely that element that you know by way of uh, you know in the agreement having a negative clause trying to stop somebody in uh, you know, from entering into contracts with uh, reliance and therefore uh, violating the competition law as much as preventing that same entity from uh, you know uh, 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 taking benefit of certain provisions of the company law section 230 etc i think these kind of restrictive provisions definitely uh, uh, are capable of being challenged and being set aside uh, by the competition commission itself on the competition aspect by other legal courts and therefore the role of section 9 i just come back to that and therefore the role of courts uh, in, in in stages when the tribunal is not supposed to have been constituted and then there are emergency provisions in 9 and once it is constituted the tribunal itself the same tribunal which hears the entire dispute takes on uh, even the responsibility of passing identity orders so there are these conflicts and that is why this this is a very strange puzzle for us although the judgment appears to be quite clear and straight but i think it's just a sur surgical implant of emergency arbitration into 17 and there's a lot more for us to discover out of this anush thank you very much and i do understand you need to leave the panel a little bit early so our gratitude for your views and um, i'll make sure i don't address further questions to you sure. thank you very much so as we can see there is a mixed reaction to uh, emergency arbitrator which is an institutional uh, thing with ciac and with several other institutions india does not have a large amount of institutional arbitrations although i i know that niti may have a different view with mci getting more and more active and the nani pali kaliwala institution and the delhi arbitration it's getting there but 95% if not 99% of the arbitration in india are still ad hoc and therefore um, i think the views are generally that um, we're not ready for institutional uh, we're not ready for emergency arbitrator or to some extent maybe we don't want maybe we don't want to uh, have an emergency arbitrator so um so let's go on to our, our our next topic you heard all of our views on emergency arbitrator if i missed out any, if i missed out anybody and if i missed out anybody and um uh um on and want to have a word on emergency arbitrator please do go ahead but i think we've covered that topic to the best extent we can because we have a number of different topics and a large number of speakers the next topic we wanted to speak was on third party funding and for some of our viewers the issue may arise what is third party funding third party funding is basically funds that have been set up just to fund litigation there are specialist funds there really a hedge fund which which are just to fund litigations 
and they provide money for carrying on litigations, arbitrations, and take a share of the proceeds. It has now become a common practice and common knowledge in most parts of the world, Singapore, Hong Kong, Australia, US, UK, Europe, ICC, LCIA, or recognize it. The Supreme Court of India has given a decision which says it's not illegal. The champerty and maintenance arguments are out of the window. It is not illegal, but it is completely unregulated. There's no regulation in India. And <clears throat> one of the foremost issues that arise to my mind, and I'm saying this because I have had extensive experience in third party funding, is are you required to disclose whether you are third party funded or not? Does that, as a plaintiff, it's normally a claimant, does that make your position weaker, stronger, does it mean you're just taking a chance? Or does it influence the arbitral tribunal to feel? My God, somebody that examined this case and thought it's very good, and they're going to make a lot of money out of it. And maybe two, three law firms have looked at it and recommended it as an excellent case. So the third party funder can make a lot of money. So does it influence the arbitrators subconsciously thinking, obviously the claimant has such a strong case, we got to go ahead. So first question, should third party funding be legitimized in India with regulations? And secondly, should you be forced to disclose when you have a third party funder? Um, with that, maybe I can ask Atul to, um, Atul's views on this issue. Yeah, so Hiro, I mean, the way I look at third party funding in India is a slightly different perspective. It is not a pure and simple way of financing litigation. I would look at it as something which is also a very significant tool to restructure your businesses. If you look at the whole infrastructure space today, there are a large number of claims with developers and contractors who are into a huge financial mess. So obviously the answer is that there's somebody who has to step in and step in with funding or consolidation of the disputes and treating using these funds for the purposes of monetization of those claims. Now, if that is the background, obviously a regulation is a, a must for ensuring that whatever happens, it is at least it is in within the four corners of the regulations. And if those regulations are fairly well known, because today, for example, Funder don't even know what kind of structure he has to follow within the regime of FEMA or within whether is it an NBFC, it is not an NBFC. And if at all, and it is all ad hoc, ad hoc basis that the entire business of third party funding as is just trying to find feet in India, it is being conducted in a manner that you know nobody knows what the regulatory regime is. So I think the answer obviously is that you need a regulatory regime is fairly, fairly well defined. And to the second question as to whether this needs to be disclosed, I would feel that a tribunal would, would be least, or a court in the case of this funding litigation, would be least affected by the fact that a disclosure is made with regard to the, to the, 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 the validity of a funding contract uh, in the context of chance of success or failure. I think uh, a tribunal or a court should be independent and would be independent enough not to get influenced by the fact that it is being funded by a third party funder. Thank you, Atul. Um, maybe we can ask Amit his views on this issue. Yes, uh, thank you, Hiro, for uh, this opportunity. Um, I have to make so, one uh, disclosure that because Amit is very, very heavily involved in Future Alliance, so we could not ask him any of the earlier questions. Yeah, thank you for that. <laughs> thank you for that. Yes, I. Uh, but anyway, this present topic is fully more interesting and more futuristic as futuristic as the emergency arbitrator because this is really a nascent baby in India, which is third party funding. And I think it's only beneficial. I don't think there'll be anyone who will speak against. But yes, to uh, pick from where Atul said, uh, we do need uh, legislative support for it. And that's where if someone looks at the BNC Krishna report of 2017, he 
uh, heavily recommended that there must be a supporting legislation and arbitration amendments equally to see that uh, third party funding is recognized. But uh, having said that, you raised a very important point because if the situation as it exists in a specific context of the uh, particular types of arbitration in which again I'm a bit involved, which is the investment arbitration, uh, there is a big issue involved of the disclosure and it sometimes comes down to the issue as to whether uh, when the third party funder, when a claim is made, at that stage we do not know there is a third party funding or not and there is no automatic disclosure requirement. Should there be some sort of uh, immediate rule that you ought to disclose as a matter of rule if there is any third party funding involved in any in arbitration, whether it's actually investment or commercial. And the root of this then takes you to the fact then that does a respondent in that arbitration is entitled to seek an order of the cost because if it is really a third party funding based and, and you know, it, it claim does not stand, so is then the response at a mercy or will it be able to recover cost? And a very small uh, development, international development, like all of us mostly know it, is that SIAT, which is always the forefront of these uh, you know, uh, rules, they in fact have brought about an amendment in the rules which requires that particularly in their arbitration, investment arbitration rules that you need to disclose your funding if you are making a claim and not only that in the practice note of 2017 new they have gone a step further and they have said that the arbitrators have to disclose not only the moment that third party funding comes to a forefront it's not only about the claimant and the respondent the arbitrators have to make another round of disclosure about their any conflict of interest vis-a-vis -vis the third party funding so uh, this again is not really captured in, in our, the schedule of disclosures that we have presently under the Indian Arbitration Act because of course we haven't reached till there. But I think there is an urgent need because this is really happening even though there is no statutory reason as you rightly said once Supreme Court has banned this concept of uh, maintenance and champetry this is happening and there needs to be some sort of a legislative or regulation on this issue. That's my two bit on this thing. I, uh... Having said that, I fully agree with you that the issue of disclosure is almost more relevant and overtakes everything. About the issue of cost, different jurisdictions have different issues on that. But the issue of disclosure takes overtakes everything because sometimes there are very, very large global firms and now the third party funder that become global. If the third party funder is funding global firms and the arbitrator is part of one of the large global firms, or has certain kind of issues or tie-ups with it, um, that disclosure is critical. And I'm saying this, I sat as a member of the SEAC court, and we have kind of insisted on that because does that disqualify the arbitrator? Somebody has to decide that. And without that disclosure, there's not enough information to do, do so. Having said that, Niti, do you have any views of that as, a, as a in, head of the Indian institution doing uh, arbitration you know i would uh, probably be speaking for myself rather than for mcia right now because we don't have a rule uh, you know on uh, disclosure of third party funding as of now uh, but speaking as a practitioner of arbitration i think unlike an emergency arbitrator this time i tend to agree with the house and say that it should be made mandatory uh, there should be a disclosure for sure would the debate be whether a tribunal would be unduly influenced, uh, knowing that a third party funder is supporting it and that the claim should go ahead, versus the debate of disclosure for conflict of interest? I think uh, it's a no, no brainer to say that it has to be in favor of disclosure of conflict of interest. In fact, IBA guidelines did amend it and added it there that a third party funder should be disclosed for this particular reason. Um, and I think on the legislation part as well, I would say that rather than legislation catching up on the practice, I think it is time that they should at least now have some rules, the basic rules to be drafted, just like probably what Hong Kong and Singapore has done, because third party funding is definitely happening and it's happening in India. So uh, it's better that we have certain rules that everybody is clear on uh, how and in what form and shape it can happen, rather than we then having a problem of reaching to the courts and then to the Supreme Courts for them to be laying down. So I, I seem to be supporting myself in this uh, topic, at least uh, with the rest of the practitioners as well. Um, Marion, as a 
English QC. Have you experienced third party funding and what are your views on that? Oh, yes. Uh, I, I agree with Atul. The terminology is important. Third party funding covers a very wide range of um, sources, but it's absolutely here to stay. I agree with the panel. Access to justice drives it. And as I watch the fires burn throughout Europe, which is currently experiencing the hottest period in time and climate change becomes a reality. You can see how those who have the individual claims that will want to bring the big litigation are going to need this sort of funding to be able to do it. So it's here. We have as an arbitral community to respond. I, like Nitty, I'm almost embarrassed to agree with you again. Disclosure we're going to have to grapple with, aren't we? Um, disclosure is becoming crucial. We've just had the Supreme Court decision in England on Halliburton, which shows the importance of this issue. And I think you know, I see everyone's nodding their heads. We all know we all make regular disclosures, don't we? Of almost anything and everything. So it's coming. Am I? Do I think that an arbitral tribunal is subconsciously affected by the view that um, it must be a good claim? There's a funder. We all know claims fail. We've had some spectacular defeats in England of cases funded by um, third party funders. They're reliant upon what the client tells them. They're reliant upon what the solicitors tell them. You get into the uh, evidentiary hearing and it all changes. The witnesses don't say what you thought they were going to say. So, no, I don't think I like to think I wouldn't be. I, I, I also tend to believe that arbitrators aren't. But am I deluding myself? Should we do a quick poll? What do you think? Yes or no? Shall we ask our audience? There's a couple of questions coming up, actually. Is anything? Yeah, Marion, I want to ask you one question myself. Um, now the third party funding has grown. What will be the next stage? And it is happening. Our third party, what about third party funders just buying up the claims? Well, that's always that's the vulture funds. Is that what you're talking about? <laughs> yep. Uh, well, that's that's here, isn't it? That those who do investment treaty arbitration will know better than I. But I, I believe that's really here. And of course, you know, when we're talking about business restructuring and the assignment of claims, and we, we widely recognize the validity of an assignment of claim, where of course you do get disclosure. I think we're going to see the markets of the world demanding cheaper access to their rights. And if that involves any form of inventive use of funding, the market will want it. And ultimately arbitration is about party autonomy we give them what they need, but then we make sure it's fair. So we bring in the regulation. That's my view. Okay. One, one more issue that I'm, I want to raise is the issue of costs. In obviously North Court versus SR, the English courts have held that the arbitrators are entitled to, in, in fact, award entire third party costs in certain circumstances. What, what are the views of Firstly, some of the Indian practitioners, would that be against a, a public policy or not if the entire third party costs are awarded to the claimants? So that even if the claimants, um, even if the third party funder is getting four or five times his investment and the costs are awarded to that extent, would that be against public policy? So can I ask Atul's views on this? So here, I, I, I don't know. I mean, uh, uh, it's a difficult question to answer. Uh, but on a first blush, uh, I believe that it may be difficult to find this found, you know, falling foul of section 23 of the contract. Because uh, the, the issue is with regard to, and although in the Indian context, for us, costs are a big taboo because we are conventionally not at all used to awarding costs. I mean, what, what to talk of third party costs, even party costs, you know, our courts are reluctant to award and it, they are, they are, you know, minutes are awarded. But I think if we are moving towards a regime, which is much more, uh, you know, move in a direction where it, 
we bring in the element of cost as really a very very significant decision making uh, uh, price for whether to go in for litigation or not to go in for litigation uh, i believe that third party costs should not be found foul of the public policy of it okay amit what is your views so you know i see honestly a slight conflict of two issues here uh, as i raised in my opening point uh, a uh, third party cost uh, means uh, order of seeking a cost is um, normally uh, a, a first thing that a respondent does when they get to know that the claim is funded by a third party arbitrator uh, third party funders but i think there are two conflicting points here one of course there is a full party autonomy but in the interest of transparency it is required to be disclosed but the greater issue here is the issue of confidentiality and the privilege which is that uh, here if uh, we do not know and sometimes unless it's disclosed because if only sometimes it requires that you go into the details of the disclosure and the depth of which the third party funder has made uh, analysis of the claim and in that part uh, is he then going beyond the confidentiality because you know how even our newly inserted clause for the thing in our arbitration act required the whole proceeding be kept confidential So in respect of that, is there a breach of public policy? I would tend to agree yes, because if it is not disclosed, it will amount to a breach of public policy, and hence, a uh, order of cost is a very important thing, which I think should be naturally be allowed whenever there is a third party funding involved, because we are still, as Muthi says, you know, legislative there is no guidance. Third party funding is very much in India. and we do not know to what extent things are being kept confidential or not because if it is not disclosed ultimately and if it comes out at a later stage i personally believe it will be a breach of public policy because you are now running straight into the teeth of the new amendment of the arbitration act for it to be which says okay. it should be kept confidential thank you thank you amit um niti in now in your personal capacity i fully understand You know, following the decision in North Coast versus SR, where arbitration costs were award, our our arbitration act has been amended to award costs, lawyers' costs, arbitrators' costs, everything. Do you think following that decision in India would be against public policy or completely acceptable? I think you know my first guess is going to be that it is the way we have seen the courts interpreting, especially the public policy. Though though we have become very lenient. I still think it's going to be fudgy and it's going to be on the line of saying that it is against the public. I come from the from the idea that ultimately this uh, third party funders is a financial arrangement, a private financial arrangement between the party funded and the funder. These are not the costs uh, arising purely out of the arbitration agreement itself, and neither are these damages claims, right? So. um when an arbitral tribunal presuming that uh, the arbitration agreement doesn't restrict it there is no uh, legislative um, you know guidance for us in such a matter i would say in an indian scenario we would be uh, the courts would actually be tempted to set it aside on public policy for sure okay thank you well, we are moving on to our next subject about exclusion clauses exclusion clauses are clauses where say that whatever happens whatever the breach whatever the breach of contract whether it's negligible deliberate or any reason and the contract says in any case my damages will be zero you cannot claim damages or in any case you cannot claim damages more than x amount whatever the circumstances marin can we have your views on the english law on this issue Pleasure. We've just had the benefit of a Supreme Court decision on the approach the courts take to exclusion clauses under English law, and I'd be very interested in hearing if this is the general common law experience that you have in India. The approach has changed in the last fifty years, and that's been driven by two things. Firstly, legislation, the Unfair Contract Terms Act. has given the court the power to strike out an unreasonable exclusion clause and that means they haven't had to use the more um shall we say inventive approaches to interpretation that they used to use 
to reach the result they wanted to reach. Because every judge, every tribunal wants to reach a fair decision. The second driver of the change is the recognition now that parties are free to make their own commercial decision. And that the court's task is to interpret that fairly, looking at context and the agreement as a whole. And the only limitation on that freedom of the parties to reach their own commercial allocation of risks will be that if you are changing commercial norms, do it clearly. We all know that in any business there are expectations, be they laws of tort, implied terms, basic commercial understandings of what is reasonable. If you are contracting out of that, be clear. Matter of common sense, the court says. People don't lightly give up their rights. So with those Thank two you. tools, we let parties get on with it. Now, I am talking business to business. If you're talking business to consumer, then there are whole other layers as well. That's our approach. Thank you. Um, considering that we don't have an unfair contracts act in India, um, Amit, what would you think that does Indian law follow the law, English law and exclusion clauses totally? Uh, okay, so I would actually answer this in two parts. Uh, uh, there's this whole issue of procedure unconscionability behind such exclusions and a substantive unconscionability. Uh, so, of course, uh, there is, we all know that there is a complete uh, statutory void, if I can use that phrase, in India with respect to such contracts, other than all of us know, year to year back in 2019, uh, following the UK Consumer Right Act of 2015, India enacted its own Consumer Act of 2019, with some of these uh, clauses being mandatorily being read down. But coming back to my initial point, so when there is a, a substantive unconscionability, answer is no. Uh, you cannot, I mean, in the sense, you cannot have exclusive clause unless it's uh, excluded by the Consumer Protection Act. But on the procedural unconscionability, yes, if there are uh, grounds where, you know, some of the cases like, you know, we know, uh, you know, uh, in this, this uh, case of Guru Goyevikar, which was in the issue context of the uh, you know, insurance act, uh, motor vehicle insurance act, and they say you can't contract it out. So unless and until parties have, and the Supreme Court has clearly said, even that celebrated case of SK Jain, that the doctrine of unequal bargaining power will not apply unless you can show you did not know, or that the terms are very vague, or that the there was no free will or it was undue influence. So India law, to my uh, understanding, is that uh, on the issue of procedural where you can show unconscionability, courts will read it down. But if there is a substantive unconscionability, they will not. And as I give an example, Consumer Protection Act of 2019 is the only law. But otherwise, you know, you can't go against the law and have this exclusive clause. It's not permitted. Thank you. Atul, what are your views on this? Yeah, Hiru, I am a people at the Indian jurisprudence. And Section 23 of the Contract Act has played the role which the Unfit Terms Act in UK would have played. Now, therefore, in the context of, if you, if you see the context of construction disputes substantially, uh, uh, in the construction had very clearly said that the when there is a provision in the contract for extension of time and liquidity damages, time being an essence of contract is an antithesis. So, in that background, the, the tenor of the judgments in the Indian Supreme Court and the High Court has been the exclusion clauses are looked down upon as being violative of the public policy for the reason that they deprive the affected party of a right to get compensated under 55, which is uh, of the of the Contract Act, as well as 73. So, to that extent, uh, and if you look at it, the amendment also to the Arbitration Act, Section 28.3, now that distinction as to whether a contract an award has to be decided in the in accordance with law or having regard to the provisions of the contract. Now, this amendment which removed the words in accordance 
uh, in accordance with the contract by by substituting it with the words having regard to in the 28.3, which was a fallout of the OTC judgment. I believe that the tribunal would also be free. And I think that is also a specific outcome of all the judicial precedents that it will could bind the parties, it will not bind the tribunal. Because the tribunal is governed by the provisions of the Contract Act and is free to award compensation under 73 and 55. And therefore, the whole gamut of clauses which will limit the right of an agreed party to get compensated on the grounds of exclusionary clauses would be looked down upon. So I think uh, in India, we, we don't need an unfair terms act like in UK. Section 23 is performing that duty. Because it's if the contract, if the term is contrary to public policy and defeats the whole provisions uh, which entitle a party to get compensated uh, would be looked down upon. Thank you, Atul. Having said that, now we are reaching towards the end of our segment. And this is now purely related to the pandemic, the issue of video conferencing. On, on that, I'm going to raise three issues and ask my fellow panelists their views. One is video conferencing in India, at least, whether be the courts and arbitration, has been a bit of an evolving process and has gone on and on. And we've all sort of got used to it. And that's how come we are at this webinar now tonight, this afternoon. Um, but the issues too arises. Do we in fact need a video conferencing protocol? And what purpose does it serve when the courts themselves are controlling it or the arbitrators themselves are controlling it? Do we in fact need a protocol for, for any reason? The second issue is that arises uh, personally for us in arbitrations, when we are cross-examining witnesses over the world, all over the globe, there is a larger issue of the witnesses being prompted. Um, personally, um, I don't see it as a very big issue because I've had a lot of experience in arbitration, but a lot of arbitrators and a lot of other counsel feel that one of the issues feels is that how do we ensure that the witnesses who are being cross-examined are being prompted or not, may not be highly relevant in the construction contract, which is very uh, based on documents, but on other contracts, which are more factually based, it can have a enormous relevance. And the third issue, which I want to raise for my panelists' consideration is, what if one party simply refuses as in, in an arbitration? In a court proceeding, he may not have a choice. But in arbitration, he simply refused to say, I have a right of personal hearing. And if you insist on video conferencing, I'm not going to attend. Uh, what are the view the courts are going to take? Has there been some breach of public policy when ex parte award is there? Or that go and have the hearing again, let the pandemic get over and then have a proper hearing? Um, these are questions up in the air. So let me ask Marin her views firstly on all the three issues. Question, do we need a protocol? My answer is yes. It won't cover the one thing that becomes important, but it at least gets the parties talking and thinking about it. Your next question was, what do we do with the prompting of witnesses? I am sanguine about that because I think the really interesting work that's being done now about the fallibility of memory is leading the way for all dispute resolvers to assess the weight to give to factual evidence. It's what's in the contemporaneous documents. I accept those you say, Hiru, there are some cases where it all turns on an oral conversation or where you don't have those uh, contemporaneous documents. There, uh, you can in fact deal with prompting. I have seen an all round camera so that the witness Actually, you watch the witness walk into a room and there is an all round camera on the witness throughout the process. It's like James Bond. It's all I can say. It's extraordinary. And the only other tip I would give to a witness is do please remember dress from the top to the bottom. 
you never know when you're going to have to stand up. And it could embarrass you to reveal your Bermuda shorts to the tribunal. Your third question was, what do we do if a party refuses? It's going to come. The feeling I'm getting from the reading I'm doing is that no one's got an example at the moment of a court saying you must. Um, well, sorry, let me put it the other way. I think tribunals and the uh, courts will support the tribunals in saying ultimately we have to go virtual. That is the way the world is moving for all sorts of good reasons, not least the cost. The whole cost of the evidentiary hearing is being driven down by the fact that we're doing it virtually. So those are my answers. Thank you. I thought, can we have your views? Yeah, uh, we do. I mean, uh, if we look at the Indian arbitration context, uh, technology, I mean, video conferencing, we want to agree that it's here to stay. And if it is going to stay, then obviously the tribunals and the parties have to get used to them. And technology, as Megan said, that will take care so far as the prompting part is concerned. I think the answer lies so far as if a party refuses to participate in a proceeding because in the, the party insists on a physical hearing, uh, there are two aspects to it. The Arbitration Act in India now provides for a timeline within which the award is to be given, right? So it, in that context, I think the tribunal will be fully justified in insisting upon uh, having virtual hearings and ensuring that they adhere to the timeline. And of course, the answer lies specifically from a statutory perspective in Section 19, where the parties are free to agree on a procedure, and if they don't have an agreed procedure, the tribunal can decide its own procedure, including the technology that it will adopt for the purpose of conducting the arbitration. So I believe that uh, uh, even the 360 degree is going to be a solution. And of course, as Marion said, that we are we have moved to a stage where you know the demeanor of the witnesses, particularly in the context of uh, disputes relating to uh, infrastructure and construction, demeanor would have very limited role to play. Of course, in other very specific disputes relating to fraud, etc., probably that could be relevant. But uh, otherwise, I think technology will take care of all these problems. Thank you, Adul. Uh, Amit, can we have your views on that? Uh, actually, picking again from where Atul stopped, although Section 19 does recognize a party autonomy and it says that parties are free in the Indian context to decide mutually the procedure for conducting the proceedings the question is uh, and which which we are waiting to actually see that if in a scenario as you said rightly you know, that a person proposes a video hearing and another person insists for a physical hearing and the tribunal decides to go will that be contradicting any of this provisions of the act and particularly can in context of 19.2, it may be saying that a tribunal has failed to provide a hearing to a party. Although I'm cognizant that section 24 of the Indian Arbitration Act only says that the uh, both parties have a right to seek an oral hearing, but whether that oral hearing tomorrow can be stretched to mean a in physical hearing is something I don't think can be tenable or should be tenable. Uh, this is a norm I think we'll have to all adopt to it. But it will be interesting to see. In fact, uh, uh, very uh, not, of course, it was never contemplated this whole virtual scenario. But if I have a liberty to slightly stretch the decision of the Supreme Court in this case of central trade minerals, which we all know, court in one of the paragraphs did mention that the arbitrator's refusal to adjourn the proceeding at the behest of one party cannot be said to be perverse. So in this case, I'm only wondering whether a party seeks a right to seek a physical hearing and seeks adjournment and a tribunal says no, I will go ahead with the virtual hearing. Uh, there seems to be some sort of a guidance and anyway the principles that it will, it will not be violating any public policy later on. But of course, um, that's I think all of us are, we'll have to adopt to this whole new scenario. Thank you, Amit. Niti, now can we have you as a, your institutional view on this? And how, what sort of protocol the 
MCIA follows and would they insist on a video hearing or do they have any powers to do so? Um, so I would say our rules still, Hero, of course, our rules came in five years ago and haven't amended our rules per se to uh, add in the words virtual hearing. But like any other arbitral institution, of course, the rules are very widely you know, uh, drafted in the sense that arbitrator exercises the maximum control on the proceeding. And he or she is literally the master of how the arbitration proceeding has to run. And we all know that documentary, um, you know, arbitration is also not something unheard of. So I think in, in both as an institution and my personal experience, cross-examination of witnesses and arbitration is just another topic widely spoken of. It is not really discrediting the witness if you're looking at an arbitration. It's not a criminal trial at the end of the day. It's a fact-finding process, like you said, so which can be taken care of by this 360-degree view cameras or a couple of cameras. Sometimes you have also seen with the, you know a neutral third-party representative in the room. That's worked fairly well, and it cut down the cost. I think the debate really remains with respect to the last part of if you were to one party was to say doesn't want to have is the debate between a due process and a delay. And I think if the reason given by any party to say, I do not want to be part of a virtual hearing is untenable, then I don't think the tribunal would not continue. They will go on and, and they will say that if a full opportunity is given to present the case, that is what is essential, right? Um, in a virtual hearing, yes, if a party says we don't have an equipment, a fair time was given to them to uh, take an equipment on and they still could not do it. Those could be little questions. In fact, I must say this, it was that one arbitration we got to know of, not an under NCIA administered, an ad hoc arbitration, where one party took this stand and said, that, sorry, I do not have a stable, I don't have a computer and a stable internet connection to help me. So one of the service providers made sure that a computer was delivered to them and the internet connection put up there so that the virtual hearing could go on. So they could not take a stand beyond that. So I think it's also going to be that why a party is refusing virtual hearing, that's going to be relevant as well. But it's here to stay. And I think protocols at least, or the guidelines at least help us um, to understand where or where not we should you know, be moving on. Thank you very much, uh, all my fellow panelists, for your very enlightening views. Thank you, Adarsh and CII, for having us as panelists. And uh, we hope we managed to answer most of your questions. Thank you very much, and over to you, Adarsh. Uh, uh, sir, can, uh, with your permission, can I ask uh, quickly one or two questions? Uh, uh, it was a very short question. Please do, please do. Yeah. So, sir, uh, being as an expert, uh, we would like to ask one question. So how do we, as experts, determine at pre-litigation stage which exclusion clauses to follow for asserting client claim while rendering our expert opinion to clients? Since sometimes court have held the ex exclusion clauses, limiting liability of the employer are not valid. This is the one question and question number two I would like to ask regarding the virtual protocol. Uh, uh, like I had an opportunity of being testified through the virtual mode. So is there any mandatory that representative of other party must present at the time of testimony in virtual mode or and also can witness give his testimony from whom? These are the two questions. Anybody I can ask that, the panelist. I think I'm going to ask answer the second question and leave the first question to my panelists. The question is whether you can insist on somebody being present to ensure there's no prompting. I don't think there's much doubt about that. Um, and most arbitral tribunals that I've experienced have said, yes, you can have somebody present. If you insist on doing it from your house, they can be present in your house if necessary. And most tribunals have, will not deny a request to ensure there's a neutral person present not to give evidence. On the other issue, I'm going to leave it to any of my panelists who would like to answer that question. Marin, you got your hand up, right on. I'm just going to say this. The other thing that you can get the uh, lay observer, the, the independent observer to do, is to tell the witness not to put his feet up onto the desk. Because I have had a witness giving evidence from home who was so relaxed feet up and he was about to light a cigarette <laughs> it's not the same relationship is it 
we are having to think about just how we control this. Don't worry, I stopped the cigarette being um, smoked. As for the exclusion clauses, I bow to local lawyers on that. <laughs> um, Amit or Atul, any views? Yeah, please, Amit, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, uh, uh, Atash, my view on that is that Indian courts, to the extent, uh, if at all this, uh, for in your context, the query you asked about expert, I think the Indian uh, view is very now similar to the uh, UK view, which is that a uh, slightly divergent though, which is that classical approach of giving precedence to the terms of the contract. So, as an expert, if you are faced with such a clause, I would say that considering, you know, there is a party autonomy, there is no prohibition in the Indian Contract Act, but at the same time, there is uh, uh, some set of unconscionability test which is applied, but in a very, very minimalistic version, unless, as I mentioned, unless there is a procedural unconscionability, I think the experts, the parties and the tribunals, to the extent that I am seeing, are relying on these exclusion clauses and they are giving the uh, decisions or awards, basis the, you know, watered down, which people haven't, the parties haven't entered into while entering contract. So I don't see a reason why experts should diverge or you know not honor this or go a little beyond this clauses in the contract. Uh, Atul, I, you, I think I think this uh, uh, others this intrusion into our arena would <laughs> a pinch of salt. Because uh, uh, I believe that as an expert, you your role is confined to coming out with the delay analysis. At the end of the day, whether that delay analysis fits into the scheme of the exclusion clauses or the exclusion clauses bar, such a claim would be a pure a question. Of and uh, I believe that uh, uh, the exclusion clauses because the larger question here is not whether a particular clause is going to bar a particular claim. The larger question here is whether a particular clause is in itself is legal or not, not legal. So that's that's the larger question. So I believe so far as you are concerned, you 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 probably can leave it to the lawyers to interpret uh, the elements <laughs> or impact of an liability exclusion clause. <laughs> No, 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 sir. I truly agree. In fact, we always refrain ourselves to leave any comment, even on uh, attributability of the delay also. We sometimes leave it to the tribunal to decide or counsel to decide. We only analyze the cause and effect of the delay. However, sometimes employers or even uh, uh, employers or even counsels wants us to analyze in that way contractual interpretation, whether it is attributable to employer or the contractor or whether it is a exclusion clause is applicable or not. So we, as very well suggested, we will try to refrain these things while we are doing uh, delay analysis or being a PR in an expert. Yeah. <laughs> Adish, thank you. And um, if we have no further questions, I know your conference has run a little over time. So over to yes. you to take over, please. No, sir. I, I really, we are running behind the schedule, but it was a very, very interesting topic. So I would like to thank Mr. Atul Sarma, Mr. Amit, uh, Mr. Hiru, Ms. Marian, and Ms. Niti for giving their time out. And, and, and there was another session, very, very interesting session, which is an ERP dispute, which is going to be handled by Mr. Arpinder, Mr. Uh, Satish, and Mr. Karisma, which is a very, very uh, interesting topic. And in most of the construction industry, uh, every now and then there are ERP disputes. So we thought it is a right time to include this topic in this construction dispute arbitration itself. So thank you all of you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, thank you sir. Thank you. So I would request uh, my colleague Vandana to quickly introduce all three panelists, uh, eminent panelists in this particular session. Vandana, are you there? Yes, Vandana. Can you quickly uh, introduce yeah. all, all three panelists and then we can start this session. Uh, yes, this is the final session of the day and I uh, quickly just introduce uh, the three panelists. Uh, Mr. Adbinder Singh, He's the global market and India leader for forensic and integrating service on Ernst and Young. Tarpinder Singh has significant experience spanning over 25 years in multi jurisdictional investigation, forensic accounting, and dispute advisory in India, USA, UK, and other regions. He has been consistently recognized as one, as one of the foremost practitioners in the Who's Who legal. 
He is a forensic accountant with significant knowledge of law and one of the few experts in India who was an internal auditor, statutory auditor, financial controller, and leads forensic investigations. Our second panelist is Mr. Satish Kumar. He is a senior vice president and group chief officer at Intellect Design Arena Limited. Mr. Satish is an award-winning seasoned legal professional with 25 years experience of legal experience. He is currently the senior vice president and group chief legal officer at Intellectual Design Arena and is a keynote speaker in various international platforms and authors. He has received many awards and coveted Legal Council of the Year 2008 by INBA. His long and legal strides include working in prestigious MNCs like Ramco, HCL, Technologies, Polaris, etc. Ms. Karishma Bora is a barrister at 39 SX Chamber in London. She has been in practice for about 14 years and has a busy cross-border practice focusing on high-value disputes before the commercial courts in London and DIFC court in Dubai. She specializes in technology, construction, private equity, and banking disputes. Mr. Karish, Karishma has the rare expertise of being dual qualified in India and England, making her an attractive choice for matters involving either or both jurisdictions. She is ranked in the Legal 500 list under Plan 1 and in Legal 500 UK as a leading individual for commercial dispute resolution. I welcome all the panelists. Over to you, Mr. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Vandana. Thank you, CII, for inviting us and also Adarsh for very tirelessly putting all of the speakers and the and the agenda for today together. Um, I realize that we're running quite out of time, so jumping straight in, uh, I think it would be useful to explain first off what ERP software solutions are. And I'd like to invite uh, Satish Ji, if, if, Satish, if you could uh, perhaps do the honors. Before you do, maybe I can just very simply explain that it's a software that automates processes and those processes can be either in the field of finance or human resources such as payroll and, and um, employee uh, processes or operations and logistics and ERP softwares can either be bespoke so customized for the client or they can be standard uh, and Sadiji, if you can tell us a bit about uh, the different types of ERP systems and uh, from your experience as work as a person and a an, uh, high ranking legal officer in a company that provided ERP software solutions, uh, whether you found that the clients cooperated in implementing the software. Yeah, uh, thanks, uh, Karima, uh, Karishma. And uh, uh, good morning and good afternoon to everyone. Uh, I hope I am audible, right, Karishma? Yes. Okay. Yes, sir. Uh, so, uh, yeah. So, Karishma, you have very nicely explained about uh, what a ERP uh, software is. The main theme of the ERP, uh, what you have to understand is there are various business processes in any organization. It can be accounting, it can be procurement, project management, risk and uh, even uh, very various uh, department supply chain management so it is a integrated management so the it is very critical it is a integrated management of all the departments in real time so one is various department another is integrated management in real time so these are the critical aspects so when we manage all the department uh, in real time that software is called as a, you know, ERP software. Uh, and uh, and coming to, you know, there are various ERP software, you have brought it very nicely, whether it can be a bespoke software, it can be a, uh, you know, it can be a already existing software, which you can license it, or which you can host it in cloud. So that could always be a conflict, where you have brought in the topic of the conflict. Uh, the conflict could be uh, because of sometimes overselling the ERP software. Sometimes, you know, uh, sometimes it can be for the scope creep that happens uh, in the software. You know, once we start implementing the software, ERP software, there could be a scenario where there can be multiple scope creep. You know, customer keeps on, you know, increasing the benchmark, keeps on increasing the benchmark. So once they increase the benchmark, 
or once they increase the scope of the work, you know, we uh, the the vendors, the software vendors also keep on you know uh, adopting to it. So you know there are various uh, uh, flash points between you know the customer and the vendor. So uh, so this is where you know usually a difference of opinion arises. So the, uh, the customer always states that, you know, this is part of the scope and the vendor's company always states that this is, a, uh, this is a scope creep or this is outside the scope and you need to enter into a change request or uh, yes, additional uh, purchase order has to be given. You know, so, so this is where various flash points or the disputes arise and there are also disputes of, oh, you know, over, uh, you know, licensing. So you give a license. Or X number. So there are various. I you know I leave for others to uh, speak. Maybe I'll come back and again explain because I have seen this in very close quarters. I have seen the ERP disputes in very close quarters. So I exactly know when to plug in the dispute, where the where the flash points are. So uh, Karishma, I leave for uh, you and Arpinder to take it forward, and then maybe. If, Time permits, I'll speak again. So, uh, just before we do that, would you like to give us? You have previously worked in a in a company that distributed uh, and licensed out HR software. So, if you can tell us, for example, what that software did, I think you also have experience of aviation ERP software. If you can tell us a little bit about that um, and, and uh, construction ERP software. Yeah. So, uh, so see. Uh, as uh, mentioned, the ERP software can be for the various industry. It can be for a construction industry. It can be for a HR software. When it is, we are talking of HR software, it is across all the industry. Whether it can be for the construction, it can be for the HR because you know you process payroll. So what happens? A global ERP company uh, usually licenses or maybe uh, gives it on a SaaS model. Uh, which is on the hosted cloud model to 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 a corporate uh, in various parts of the geo. So what happens in um, HR model is you need there are various statutory obligation when you uh, calculate a salary for an employee. Sometimes a tax a deduction has to happen. Um, the loans have to be deducted. Uh, advance has to be given. I know various calculation happens when uh, you are processing a HR software. So all this has, and it is all unique for each of the geo. In India, there is a TDS. In uh, other geography, there will be something else. So you know, as a HRP, as a ERP software, uh, or sometimes we you also call it as a HRP software. That is human resource professional. So as a ERP or a HRP software, this software has to uh, encompass or to identify all the requests requirement in a particular geography so as to you know uh, encapsulate and give out the correct uh, calculation and share it with the employer so that he can run the payroll and uh, you know pay the salary and all this remember all this has to happen in real time live in a very short duration it's not that you will have a luxury of time 15 days to process the salary no it has to happen. Usually the details are sent to you or sent for processing on the last two, three days. And this all this has to happen in a, uh, in, a in in maybe in 24 hours. There is no time uh, frame that, you know, you work within only eight hours, 10 hours. It has to happen within say 24 hours so that the, uh, the end results can be given to the employer. So that, Thank that, you. yeah, yeah, Karishma, maybe you can uh, take it forward. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Satishi. I think um, Arpinder, just before I call on you, uh, it, it would be useful to give from an English law perspective what the duty to cooperate between the parties are. Now, in a case um, before the High Court in London in, in 2000, so you know about 21 years ago, um, His Honor Judge Tomlin said that there is an implied duty to cooperate between the supplier of the ERP or HRP system, as, as Satish has just put out. Uh, and the client, and and this is because, um, first of all, the the client needs to say what exactly their needs are. The supplier has to say whether those needs can be met, and and perhaps Arpinder will come in to say what happens when uh, a software provider overpitches and says yes, yes, we can meet these needs, but perhaps they can't. 
the next step that that the judge laid out was that the supplier then has to take after successfully installing the ERP software, the supplier has to take steps to train the the client and the client also has to be willing to accept the training has to deploy the personnel has to make the time for this training and so on so there's a there's a great deal of cooperation that is required and i think an analogy can also be drawn with a pure construction law principle which is the prevention principle um, very simply if for example uh, a landowner does not make a piece of land available a developer cannot construct on it and there is an implied duty which goes back in English law to 1881 in the case of McKay and Dick, that if a contract requires parties to do something that requires them to do it together, there is an implied term on both parts uh, that, that this must be done. So with that duty to cooperate in mind, uh, Arpinder, if I may call on you perhaps to you know, take us through your experiences. Uh, of ERP disputes, starting perhaps with misrepresentation claims. Sure. Thanks, Karishma, and thank you CI for inviting me. Uh, so I'll just uh, start with some of the misrepresentations I've personally seen and been a part of as an expert. So one of the top ones is CVs, you know, as basic as that. So I'll make it a little bit more simple for everyone to understand. The biggest issues I see are CVs. You, uh, you pitch for a big implementation, whether it's in India or outside India, uh, you're a big IT company, uh, and then you say these people are going to be helping you implement the particular ERP. Because actually, sometimes the issue is not with the ERP, but it's with the implementation of the ERP, as mentioned by Satish. The question is, uh, you say, oh, I've got these fantastic certifications, you oversell yourself, uh, and then the project doesn't go as well. Then everyone, it's always about looking back, right? Whenever there's a dispute. So when you look back, you realize, oh, all the CVs were made up, they were overstated, the people didn't have those credentials. Uh, they were not fully trained automatically that becomes the center of the dispute it's as basic as that and i've seen many many disputes uh happen uh around just cvs uh and that's a good excuse for the company to say you know you misrepresented to us and that is why our whole implementation has failed the erp is not working for us sometimes these uh the impacts can be quite material if you look up there are many global companies which have lost eight to ten percent of their share value uh just because you know they couldn't invoice for five days or they couldn't pay payrolls for a week. Uh, you know, it's as basic as that, you know, and you know, the ERP fails and then you start doing the uh, whole uh, dispute uh, management around that. A second thing which I want to see as a dispute or misrepresentation is timelines. You commit to certain timelines and then you don't track it properly. There is very little communication between you and the client. Uh, the timelines get exceeded. The company again loses revenue or efficiency. Let's say the, as Pradesh correctly said, there's a lot of ERPs. One could be around supply chain, which could lead to cost reductions. Now, if that's a, that ERP is not in place, they could say, hey, we lost you know, two years of cost reduction because of the delay in implementing that particular ERP. Now, the question comes back to what was committed at the beginning, who led to the delay, all the communication, as you know, best, uh, Karishma. Unfortunately, what I've seen in actual disputes, the communication is so poor. Uh, so I think that's one thing at least I can recommend. Uh, I see it much better outside India where they document everything. You know, there's more trust basis. When a, a ERP uh, company or an implementation partner engages with a customer, they have uh, they have proper documentation. This is what we agreed. It's very detailed. Every time there's a slight delay on either side, it's documented. Unfortunately, when I've seen it in India, it's all trust based, and that's where the disputes further end up. You know, some the CIO knows the implementation partner well, everything is rosy till things blow up. Uh, when the CEO, CEO is really upset and the revenues got missed, ERP implementation has not been done on time, then they come back and all the trust basis goes down and you're stuck with the communication which is not there. You know who said what, and that leads to further issues. Another thing is deliverables. Uh, you know, you, you sell the moon. You know, this is going to save costs, it's going to increase your profitability. You need to get rid of 100 people because the ERP is going to make it so efficient. Uh, you're going to raise the voices in two seconds. Your supply chain gets updated in five minutes. Your inventory is fully updated. All sorts of things I've seen in real life. And unfortunately, you're overselling. And that's a big fundamental mistake because that's again all documented and becomes a part of a dispute at a later date. Because even if the ERP is working, maybe uh, the CEO or the owner of a company wants the moon and you're kind of giving him like basic stuff, which may be working, but it's not what you sold. 
at the beginning. Mm. Another issue is trainings, like was mentioned. The biggest issue we see with uh, most ERPs is the training is not proper. So another two years takes in understanding the system, understanding the different functionalities. Whenever frauds, I'm a forensic practitioner, the biggest issue we find is audit logs are never turned on. Then the company after two years says, who didn't tell you to put on the audit log? They say, oh, the ERP company never told us to put the audit logs in. But we don't have audit logs now. We don't know who's done the fraud. And that's all through the ERP now. Who should be blamed for it? Um, nowadays, you have fintech companies, right? So ERP becomes even more critical because fintech companies actually financial transactions. So that is a different type of ERP, right? Because so you're actually doing financial transactions for it. And banks have very large core banking solutions. But the new fintech companies are all based on ERPs and different disjointed systems. And there the discrepancy add up further. Uh, uh, and I think they will add up further in the future. Uh, one, one more area I would say, which we see a lot of disputes is cost. You know, you come in, you want to win the pitch, you're competing with five players, you give a cost which is 10, uh, and your actual cost ends up at 100, and you do cost change orders. And that again becomes an issue because you oversold yourself. when actually, the, the uh, you know, the actual project should have been significantly bigger. So I can continue, you know, I, I don't want to take all the time, Karishma, but there are hundreds of scenarios, ERP, I think in the future, considering everyone has pivoted towards ERP systems, I think, uh, this will be something uh, we need to keep our eye out from a dispute perspective. Happy to talk about remediation and how evidence is collected, but uh, if you would like to add something before I continue on that. Sure, maybe uh, Satish, I can bring you in uh, to give your experience on, on excess usage. I think from what Arpinder says, three main areas of dispute have emerged. The first is overselling. So that's that's misrepresentation. I mean, one uh, the, the software provider makes a representation, it's incorrect, and therefore they can be pulled up. Uh, the second is excess usage and licensing, and I think Satish, you have a lot of experience with that. So if you can, you know, come in on that. And the third is basically just delay um, or, or a defect in the system. So these are the three heads that that uh, Arpinder has very kindly sort of put out there. And and Satish, if you can expand a little bit, and we can go back. Um, to our evidence. Yeah, yeah, very nicely put in the uh, Arpinder, uh, um, uh, Karishma. So uh, I can I can uh, talk about uh, uh, you know the second one that you brought about uh, the licensing or uh, where you where usually the, uh, the revenue leakage happens for the vendor. Uh, so uh, it has to be very carefully seen that when you uh, when a license is given by say vendor company. Uh, and then, uh, uh, when in construction industry, you take license from the uh, vendors, you have to be very careful exactly about how much licenses you are opting for. So, for instance, um, you know, most of the vendor companies, they are smart enough not to put a cap. So, in other words, when, what I mean is in the document, in the contracts, it will be mentioned that about, say, 1 lakh users, but actually, um, uh, usually, uh, we uh, as say, say users of this software, we will say that you know once we reach the threshold limit of one lakh, there should be a cap. I should not be able to use more than one lakh. But you know the, the but uh, you now it's very you have to be very careful that you know the vendors usually they do not cap it at one lakh. So you will be able to use it even more than one lakh, but they will be maintaining the count. So if at any point of time, the total number of users exceeds 1 lakh, so that is it, you know. So uh, because here in this case, you are given uh, a 1 lakh cap, and this was agreed in the document, if in any part of during the term of the agreement or contract term, so it exceeds that limit, then it's a revenue leakage for the vendor company. So you had to be very careful while you draft uh, the contract saying that the vendor should not allow you. The vendor should not allow you to use more than one lakh. See, that is something that you have to be very careful while you drop the contract so that this dispute area is plugged. This excess revenue usage is plugged. Or to be safer, you take an enterprise-wide license. Of course, if it is commercially feasible, you can opt for an enterprise-wide license where there is no restriction on the number of uh, users. So, uh, so in terms of licensing deal or in terms of SaaS model, when it is hosted in the cloud, you have to be very careful that when uh, you are negotiating with the client, the number of users are very upfront, um, uh, you know, finalized. And the, 
uh, yeah, different very clearly, and the vendor should not allow you to use more than that. This is something that you know, as a construction industry, you should take care. And the third one that I would like to talk about is about uh, the implementation milestones. You know, there are various milestones and payments attached to it. So, when we opt for any of this software from the vendors, we should ensure that there is a very clear cut definition of what a milestone is and how much payment will be released. Mind it on acceptance of milestone, on UAT acceptance of milestone, user acceptance test that is defined as UAT, user acceptance test of the milestone. It should not happen that. You know, the vendor claims that he has completed the UAT and he will charge you for that milestone and you don't pay the amount because you feel that uh, the milestone has not been achieved. A flash point is here. So that is where the dispute arises. You have to be very careful. Implementation stage is usually for a period of nine months or 10 months or, you know, whatever you agree up front. Any, any LD that you agree has to be very clearly defined. And, uh, you know, so that if there is any overshot of the timeline, you will be able to charge the LD to the vendor. So all these are some of the areas that, you know, that should be very carefully crafted, I will say, in the agreement. So I will use the word crafted. That is very critical. That is what you need to do. Karishma. Thank you. Thank you, Satish. I think there are, uh, I think Adarsh, I hope you're sitting there thinking that there are a lot of analogies to be drawn between an ERP dispute and a, and a pure construction dispute. And um, I think I'd like to also just uh, recall what uh, Vishal Narula said earlier today, which is that there's just no getting away from technology and therefore uh, this session has been included in, in a, con you know, in a pure construction uh, disputes conference. But right. taking forward, Satish, what um, sorry, Adarsh, come in. No, no, sorry, go ahead. I'll ask my questions. Two questions at very last once yeah. you're finished. Adarsh is known for that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, yeah. so just uh, coming back or, or rather taking forward from what uh, Satish said, um, it, I think it emerges basically there is a need to define the number or type of users. And there can be... Um, you know, concurrent users, for example, one lakh users concurrently, or they can be one lakh individual named users. And in a, uh, again, in a in a high court case in 2017, which is a which is a rather famous case of the famous software uh, system SAP. So in SAP and Diageo, what had happened is that there was a named user defined ERP system, and then a few years on, Diageo decided to give its customers access to an app where they could then manage and place their own orders uh, rather than going through the named users uh, of the ERP software that Diageo had bought from SAP. Uh, what happened with this? SAP came in and said, no, 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 hang on. We had named users, look at the agreement, and only these named users can use the ERP software. If you are allowing your customers to access it, even if it's through an app, that's a breach that is excess usage and therefore you need to pay us 54 million pounds, no less. Uh, and the English High Court actually upheld that. And, and the English High Court says, well, yes, there was excess usage because of the definition that it was the definition of the users that were named users. Now, had they been concurrent users, for example, just 50,000 users or something like that, maybe Diageo would not have found themselves in, in a situation um, that they did find themselves in. So, so excess usage and, and excess licensing is certainly something that, uh, you know, that one needs to be careful about and look out for when drafting their agreements. And Arpinder, if I may, you know, come to you on, on evidence and gathering evidence, since um, you and Adarsh are both um, expert, um, you know, forensic experts, and maybe, you know, you can draw on your experience of providing evidence or gathering evidence in ERP disputes. Sure. Thanks, Karim. So I think uh, I'll start with the construction ERP system. So we were doing a dispute once, which was an all primary actually. So you know, it decides the timelines. You can manage your projects, timelines, and a lot of you online would know about that being a construction dispute seminar. Uh, but the fact is that what was the issue was it was an incident, and the fact that uh, the question was on actually the instance of Primavera. So for instance, that was the basis of the dispute. 
that means what was the time you committed to at the beginning of the period as mentioned in the contract to link to the prime aware of it said these are the timelines this is what is agreed then the tracking was done the customer was given access to the system and the actual dispute ended up being, is this the right version of the Prime Aveda? That means, have they actually done a fraud and there are two versions of the Prime Aveda? One which the customer was seeing and then there was another version which the company was handling. So, it became as technical as that around Prime Aveda. So, I would say on construction disputes, we should also be careful, not just on licensing, but also the usage of an ERP system to deliver a construction contract. Because when you're using an ERP system to deliver a construction contract, the data in the ERP system and the evidence in the ERP system also becomes critical. So I am just wanted to highlight that for the purpose of the fact that this is a construction dispute. That is a very interesting case. I think going forward, most disputes and fraud cases will have versions of ERP and data of ERP being presented as discovery as a part of an arbitration. That may become a, a different aspect, which is going to go become something mm -hmm. of the future. That's one. Number two, coming to your issue about licenses. That's very critical and very technical. The point about, uh, you know, it's a, it's a common dispute with ERP companies where someone's using an app, it doesn't have a named user, and you know, you have thousands and thousands of customers and millions of customers, as you said, in millions of dollars. That is again something which, as Satish said, you have to really be crafty in the way you look at your contract, stand the standard contract with a software provider or an ERP provider because you will go into a hole. You have to read it very properly. You have to have a very good experienced ERP lawyer who can actually understand the terms because it's very technical about number of users, even concurrent users, which is a little different, which talks about actually parallel users. You know, that means you have actually, uh, you know, five users, five people using the same user ID. It's as basic as that. So, uh, and which is different from people approaching from an app and getting access to an ERP. So I think there are different models of dispute and from an evidence perspective, what we do is actually, we actually get a full mapping of the users. We send technical people into a company. We go directly into a company server. We pull data directly from a company server to make sure which logins are there, which user IDs are there. It leads to many disputes. Actually, I remember in my previous firm, I was actually sued also. Uh, because we entered a company, they gave us access, and then subsequently they said we had forced ourselves in. Uh, you know, so this this becomes a very contentious uh, environment to collect evidence. So you have to make sure the ERP company has to make sure the agreement has a very strong right to audit clause. I'm sure Satish will be aware of that working for a IT company. The right to audit clause is extremely important because that's the only way you can collect evidence. Uh, uh, you can't if you don't have that evidence, then it's just hearsay. You know. I'll give a very simple example. Long time back, there was an issue that this company has 10,000 employees, but they've only bought two licenses. How the hell they can they buy two licenses for sending emails when they have 10,000 emails that they talk about all the time? So <laughs> that was a very famous case. But I'm just saying that is also very, it's another way of checking, right? The ERP that you have, uh, you know, 100 users, but actually you have 10,000. Then the company's biggest defense is, oh, we only had 10 people using it. Uh, we didn't have our 10,000 people uh, using it because different types of ERPs may different people would have access. So the only way to collect evidence is have direct access to a server because getting supplementary information and relying on it for a court proceeding or even an arbitration proceeding, I don't think will pass muster because chain of custody, collecting evidence in a strong ERP dispute is extremely critical. The second part I like to talk about, this is on the license part. Even people use PAC software. So every ERP system, sometimes people actually buy pirated software. So you can actually buy pirated software. You may have genuine software in 10 machines and have non-genuine software in another 10 machines. I'm not talking about the big software companies. I'm talking about smaller ERP systems, the mid-sized companies, the smaller size companies. That becomes a big issue. How do you, how do you detect this piracy? So with the cloud, I think it's all reduced uh, because I think the cloud has helped reduce some bit of this piracy and some bit of the basic license abuse. But it still happens in smaller companies, maybe not in the larger and mid-sized uh, companies out there. So I think evidence is really, extremely uh, important, Krishma. If I can just, uh, I'll come back. I had five or six recommendations for companies on what they should be careful of to avoid disputes and make sure that they have the right information so that tomorrow, if there is a dispute, you have enough evidence. That's extremely critical. And for some reason, I still find companies don't keep proper audit trails, what's happened during the process of implementation. It would really help them to do that. But back to your Krishna in the interest of time and have to add more. 
Um, Arpindar, why don't you take that forward because we're nearing a close. So if you can. Yeah. So in, in closure for me, uh, you know, I think what is very important is I mentioned earlier trust. I think there is nothing called trust. As Satish said, the contract which is signed initially has to be very well thought of. He used the word drafty. I really liked it. I mean, it has to be very well documented. You have to have an engineer, lawyer looking at the contract to understand user IDs, name users, concurrent users. He should also, he or she should be very aware of what they are signing up for, timelines, costs, uh, the communication with the party. There should not be any side deals. All of that should be properly captured in the contract. That's number one. After you have a very smart contract in place, any smart ERP company or a client on the other side has to track all communication. If there is a delay, you have to document it. Letters, emails, there has to be more. The more evidence you have, the better it is. I always feel. Uh, because that helps in a dispute to the end to show intent. It shows that the company had right intent. It was sharing an issue. There was a delay potentially from the company side or it was a delay from the ERP side or they could be any third angle of the communication partner. So that's very important. Third is, uh, uh, I think the fact is you shouldn't lie. Uh, so, you know, you shouldn't oversell yourself. I think it, if you have certain people, uh, if you have certain timelines, if you have a certain cost estimate, ERP projects are always going to go over. I have never seen an ERP project stay within budget, to be very honest. They are always change orders. Yeah, I'm sure there are exceptions, but you have to be very realistic upfront, especially in today's day, which I find is more litigious around ERP than it used to be in the past. So over to you, Karishma. Thanks, thanks, Arpinder. And um, before Adarsh, I come back to you, just one point arising out of what Arpinder has said is the integrity of the um, of the evidence and the need to have, you know, solid evidence on servers, on clouds, etc. But Arpinder, there are there are also there are, as there always are, you know, uh, gaps and and tracks that one can fall within. So there was one particular construction arbitration actually that I did and. Um, if it were maybe 20 years ago, it would purely be a, a dispute about the shortage of steel that was provided and um, and why there was a shortage of steel, etc. Um, but it didn't it didn't revolve around that. In fact, it boiled down to when there was a changeover between Oracle to SAP, were the num the users of the ERP system able to manipulate the data that was being changed over from Oracle to SAP? I mean, it was and an evidence became so crucial. But in that, um, you know, the evidence unfortunately was no longer, uh, you know, the evidence that was on the servers or on the ERP systems. And and this was a you know, mega Indian conglomerate. But it was much more about the integrity of the individuals who were changing the um, changing the system over. So there are you know there are all sorts. But um, you know the the point is very well taken that there needs to be a proper documentation, um, and there needs to be you know data in with integrity that one can rely upon and look back upon. Um, Adarsh, with that um, we're happy to conclude. Although I think. We can expect a couple of questions from you in uh, as you have done for previous sessions. Right, right. So thanks, Karisma. So just I want to ask uh, one quick question from Mr. Arpinda. He has already spoken about the version control. There was a dispute related to the version of uh, uh, I mean software. So we largely use the technology and the software both. Uh, I mean SAP and uh, SAP we use less, but uh, we use mostly a project scheduling software like Primavera and Microsoft Project, which is a help uh, helping in delay analysis. So in particular contract, it is not written that which version you, you have to use. It is only written that the analysis to be done in a Primavera or a program has to be submitted in the Primavera. So in that case, from the legal perspective, I would like to ask you as well as Mr. Arpinder also, is there any such kind of dispute? Uh, uh, have you ever uh, came across uh, whether a dispute has been arisen because of the version control of the Primavera? Something like that? Yeah. yeah. If it is not a part of the contracts, yes, exclusively not written in the contract. So, so Adarsh, uh, I'll add uh, one thing. When I said version, I mean there were two copies of the Primavera. There was a copy which had certain data with certain timelines, and then there was another version of the same Primavera. I wasn't talking about different point 1.0, 2.0. I wasn't referring to that. I was referring to two copies. One had different data. One had different data to the point which Karishma was saying. 
where somebody had given a version of uh, Primavera which had data and certain timelines. It wasn't a different model or a different uh, version of the software. So sorry for the misunderstanding, but it was a different no, topic. Adarsh, uh, maybe you know, I would like to add uh, to your uh, query. See, basically, there are two uh, things uh, in a contract uh, when um, uh, when uh, now I started using the word crafting. Uh, when I uh, when you craft a contract, especially it is updates and upgrades, uh, others. So, right. so if uh, if the uh, the customers are in the support services or in the AMC, then uh, usually the uh, you know the uh, vendors usually give the updates free of cost. Uh, in the in the um, uh, when you are in the support services, but the vendors are very careful that you know they don't give you an upgrade. So if you are in 1.02 version and um, and there is a version change or uh, because there is a upgrade to the next level, say 2.02 version or something of that sort, then it is not part of the contract. It is not part of the contract. The vendors are very you know they are more well versed in the ERP contract because they have decades of experience in it. So they exactly know where the disputes arise. So they are very careful to ensure that, uh, you know, the upgrades are not given without any cost. But we as customers should ensure that we take appropriate help from ERP uh, lawyers who are very well experienced from ERP, at, uh, you know, uh, crafting of the contracts so that they they can equally you know uh, negotiate uh, with the vendors so we should ensure that when we are negotiating the contract we should also get the upgrades because we are in the support service and we paid say for example 20 percent of the license fee so when we are paying 20 percent of the license fee we should also get the upgrades that is if you are in 1.02 you should get 2.02 and if from 2.02 to 3.02, as long as you are in the support services. So this is very, very critical when you are, uh, you know, crafting the contract, Adesh. I hope I have answered your query. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Satish. And one very quick question. Uh, actually, I do not have, uh, I mean, I have not handled too many ERP disputes uh, in construction industries. As we understood that there are various types of ERP software is being used in, for example, like uh, uh, BAM, uh, SAP, Oracle, ETC. So is there any particular data or analysis that are particular software platform having more issues? That, that is the question number one and question number two uh, just i want to ask uh, uh, being an, an expert we use erp software and uh, scheduling software like primavera microsoft projects and sometimes uh, it requires integration integration of the both the software because the man material management issue is dealt by the uh, erp software and the scheduling is dealt by the primavera software so do you feel that there is a more possibility of emerging disputes because of the nitty-gritty of technical integration issues I, 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 I will I will answer your second part uh, quickly because that is uh, that is the easier one, and I leave the first part uh, because that is tough one to uh, you know Arpinder. So, <laughs> so so answering to the second part, there should always be a integration as as a customer. You should always ensure that there is a integration between the legacy system and the new ERP software that you are buying. If the legacy system is Microsoft scheduling or project and you are you are buying a new software or a new ERP software, there should be integration between this should be part of your implementation plan. This is a very highly disputable area. I have I, I can I can quote in number of instances where halfway through the line, you know, as Arpinder said, no ERP contracts has ever been completed in the scheduled timeline. If the timeline is nine months and there is already 12 months over, 15 months over, and there are instances because there are no integration or because of multiple reasons, the, uh, the, you know, the customer would prefer to go back to the legacy system. So they will, you know, they had invested so much huge amount in the ERP software. But despite that, they would rather go back to the legacy system because that is easier for them. And there could be a change in the you know, management which will prefer to go back to the ERP. So there could be multiple reasons uh, where, where, you know, if because if integration doesn't happen between the legacy system and the new ERP system, then, uh, you know, you would uh, like to go back to the uh, legacy system. And uh, this is a dispute arises. 
and uh, to answer the first question which is a better software uh, like sap barn or uh, i'll leave uh, our uh, learned friend uh, pinder to answer to that actually i would i would get sued as most of them are clients <laughs> so, so that's a tough question for that to answer which one is better uh, maybe if he takes me out for coffee i'll tell him uh, but not on the live video but i'd like to just add one thing to what sadish ji said uh you know i find uh, adarsh you raised a very good question that uh, about material management in a construction dispute that does come up very often you know because of the fact that how much material was issued on the site how is steel karishma mentioned as an example is being tracked so that that all through an erp system does become an issue you know where is the staff why is there inventory shortage where is the capex for instance how how is the movement of it being done Uh, and then linking it back to Primavera or Microsoft projects, so which is more processing uh, using is very essential to make sure it stays on line. So I think going forward, as people are using technology even more, as Krishna started this question, I think this ERP world will become more critical for construction. And the very last question I would like to ask uh, Krishna. Thank you, Arpinder, and thank you, Mr. Satish. Uh, it's a very last question. because most of the people are thinking that erp dispute is totally related to the software dispute in fact we were earlier not introduced this topic in this particular theme construction and infrastructure dispute when karishma emphasized that ki no it is a very important topic and it should be introduced in this particular theme itself so just i want to understand that uh, how you have come across that so many erp dispute in the especially in the construction industries like we have a large um, epc contractors like lnt tata projects kc these are our clients so how we can uh, help them uh, to mitigate the uh, this kind of erp dispute also and what are the suggestions for our uh, epc contractors client so karishma over to you so as sitish and arpinder have said it starts from the drafting stage and and invariably because an erp dispute uh, erp software provider is likely to have more experience in this uh it's it's necessary for the client to have you know a, a, a trained pair of eyes for erp disputes to go through the contract in the contract there are a number of depending on of course what their needs are but there are a number of things that can be done i'll just say one or two for example an exclusion clause can be uh, can be uh, introduced into the contract or a limitation clause can be introduced there's also a concept which is called um uh, uh Uh, it's a clause which which basically says that all of the negotiations are embodied in the contract so if someone has had oral negotiations or, or representations that have been made those are discarded because the contract will say that the the contract is a whole and anything outside of the four corners of the contract should be discarded so there are there are a lot of um, you know options or or, or possibilities to to sort of uh, from a provider's perspective uh reduce their liability and of course it's the reverse uh when when one is a client so uh, others when you're thinking about you know from an llnt or you know etc perspective it's the reverse so you don't want to include these kind of clauses into the contract because you want to be able to rely on various representations and you know presentations etc that would have been made to the client so um i mean that's just a that's a, a sort of very basic uh, answer to your question but it would depend on on what their needs are uh, and and then the contract would have to be customized around that thanks thanks karishma so we are running behind the schedule so it's it was a wonderful session and insight insightful sessions and really thank you, uh, thanks to you so the last minute you request requested us to introduce this topic and i'm sure that uh, all the party uh, participants has got benefit uh, by this uh, introducing this topic and thank thanks to all of you mr arpinder ms karishma and mr satish for giving your time out here and uh, last i would like to just concluding i think uh, it's uh, late so no one is from cii to give a concluding remark earlier we were planning so just i would like to thank all speakers and delegates to participate in this wonderful event a special thanks to cii teams and it teams for managing even in uh, last minute changes and uh, behind the schedule thing thank you all of you thanks thank you thanks